Christian faith healer, and a few who were hanging out with various gurus. Whatever context the first A&P event happens in, that context will tend to hold a special place in that person's heart from then on. For me, it happened on my own, by my own meditation efforts and without a tradition, and so I have always associated my own practice with progress. My friend who had it happen with the Christian faith healer became the most hardcore Christian you could find, and many people who have had born-again experiences have just crossed the A&P. Another friend had it happen while on mescaline and has since held a special place in her heart for shamanism. Those who had it happen with gurus tend to follow those gurus for some period of time, associating it with the guru's presence. Some others who had it happen in apparently random context usually had no idea what it was or what it had done to them. But most have realized that something was different and most, though not all, remember it with an uncanny clarity as somehow standing out from ordinary experiences. Once one has attained this event, it is fairly likely that one will be able to attain the first stage of awakening sooner or later if one can navigate the dark night skillfully, meaning simply keep practicing. Thus, a good first goal in insight meditation is to cross the A&P event at one's earliest possible convenience, with caveats given later in the section on the dark night. The A&P event can happen in three basic ways, corresponding to the three characteristics, just as can the entrance to insight stage 15, fruition, and the two are easily confused for this and other reasons. There is great variation in the specifics of what we are seeing and feeling when we cross this profound and intense event, but certain aspects of these events will be common to all practitioners. This event tends to manifest in a way that can mirror the three doors, described below, at about the middle of the outbreath, leading to an unknown event, followed by a few exceedingly clearer and more distinct moments imparting some deep understanding of the three characteristics before a second knowing event at the end of the breath. It is not uncommon for the A and P event to occur during a particularly lucid dream or at least in the middle of the night. Now, it should be noted here that it is unlikely that these extreme moments for the sense of the breath to be particularly clear, but this is how things happen regardless. In these moments, most, but not all, of the meditator's sensate universe strobes in and out of reality, arises and passes. The subtle background and sense of an observer still seems to stay stable. In contrast to this, the entrance to stage 15, fruition, is through one of the three doors, involves the complete sensate universe, which is background, time, space and all, happens at the end of the outbreath and does not involve too closely related unknowing events. The usefulness of this information may become apparent later on. Those who have crossed the A&P event have stood on the ragged edge of reality and the mind for just an instant, and they may know that awakening is possible. They typically have great faith, may want to tell everyone to practice, and are generally evangelical, or excited about spirituality, religion, and or philosophy for a while. They will have an increased ability to understand Dharma teachings due to their direct and non-conceptual experience of the three characteristics. Philosophy that deals with the fundamental paradoxes of duality will be less problematic for them in some way, and they may find this fascinating for a time. Those with strong philosophical bent will find that they can now philosophize rings around those who have not attained to this stage of insight. They may also incorrectly think that they are enlightened, as what they have seen was completely spectacular and profound. In fact, this is common, and they may stop practicing when they have actually only really begun. This is a common time for people to write inspired Dharma books, poetry, spiritual songs, and that sort of thing. This is also the stage when people are more likely to join monasteries or to go on great spiritual quests. It is also worth noting that this stage can look an awful lot like a manic episode. The rapture and intensity of this stage can be basically off the scale, the absolute peak on the path of insight, but it doesn't last. Soon the meditator will learn what is meant by the phrase, better not to begin, once begun, better to finish as they are now too far into this to ever really go back. 
until they complete this progress of insight they are on the ride and may begin to feel that the dharma is now doing them rather than the other way around as they will progress inevitably and relatively quickly usually within days into stages five to ten which as you will shortly see are not always pretty the rapture and all the bells and whistles die down quickly and the meditator may even be left raw as if hung over after a wild night of partying the clarity fades somewhat and the endings of objects become predominant as they progress to the knowledge of five dissolution entrance to the dark night thus begins what are called the knowledges of suffering or the dark night of the soul to use st john of the cross's terminology i consider this the entrance to the third vipassana jhana though upandita considers this the entrance to the fourth vipassana jhana i'll give my arguments for this later in the chapter that deals more directly with the vipassana jhanas the dark night spans stages five through ten in this map namely dissolution fear misery disgust desire for deliverance and reobservation stages five through nine tend to come as a package with one leading fairly quickly and naturally to the others stage ten reobservation tends to stand out as its own distinct and often formidable entity it should be noted that some pass through the dark night quickly and some slowly some barely notice it and for some it is a huge deal regardless of the speed at which one moves through these stages some may get run over by it on one retreat fall back and then pass through it with no great difficulties some time later others may struggle for years to learn its lessons i am going to describe the dark night largely in extreme terms but realize that this is just to give a heads up to what is possible not what is necessary or guaranteed as before on retreat these things are likely to be more intense and clear though those on retreat who are able to keep practicing are likely to make much faster progress as well on the other hand practice in daily life can become powerful and sometimes very speedy these things are strangely unpredictable enough disclaimers once someone has crossed the arising and passing event one will enter the dark night regardless of whether one wants to or not it doesn't matter if you practice from this point on once you cross the a and p you are in the dark night to some degree until you figure out how to get through it and if you do get through it without getting to the first stage of enlightenment you will have to go through it again and again until you do i mean this in the most absolute terms the dark night typically begins with just about all of the profound clarity mindfulness concentration focus equanimity and bliss of the previous stage dropping away so also ends the cause and effect like phenomena of the breath or walking shaking or jerking up and down in a way related to attention and noting as well as all of the fine vibrations and vortex like raptures early on the frequency of vibrations disconnect from the cycle of the breath remaining largely stable at whatever frequency is going on at that stage once they can be perceived again in late dissolution or fear whereas one might have felt that one's attention had finally attained the one-pointed focus that is so highly valued in most ideals of meditation during the arising and passing away during the dark night one will have to deal with the fact that one's attention is actually quite wide and its contents unstable further the center of one's attention becomes the very least clear area of experience and the periphery becomes predominant this is normal and even expected by those who know this territory however most meditators are not expecting this at all and so get blindsided and wage a futile battle to make their attention do something that in this part of the path it simply won't do if one has ever been meditating in a place with lots of mosquitoes buzzing in one's ears in a way that made it very hard to concentrate on the primary object one can get a sense of what one's attention will be like in the dark night rather than fighting against this and ignoring the metaphorical mosquitoes one should try to understand what it feels like to have one's attention be however it is just like listening to discordant chromatic jazz with lots of jarring harmonies and instruments playing more at odds with each other than together takes some getting used to 
the quality of attention in the dark night is an acquired taste and the sensations that arise tend to be very rich complex broad and unsettling those that fixate on staying one pointed will suffer more than those who learn to stay with what is going on regardless of whether or not it feels like good meditation in that same vein those who are using some other object as a focus will notice the same phenomena of the width of attention being wider and the basic sense of that attention seems to sort of be out of phase with phenomena those doing visualizations may notice that they see a black spot in the center of their attention with some sort of patterns or visions around the edge of it spreading wider and wider into the periphery those using a mantra may feel that the mantra is out of phase with attention wide and complex and yet hard to stay with and may acquire more complex harmonics and harmonies if it is in any way musical like listening to a large ghost chorus that is off to the sides of you whereas before the mantra may have felt centered in the stereo field of attention. There will be individual variation in some aspects of these things, depending on the object, focus, ability, and each person's particular proclivities, but some basic aspects will be universal, and I will talk more about these aspects in the later chapter on the Vipassana Jhanas. There are two basic patterns of vibrations in the dark night, and they are actually the dark night's defining characteristics. One may get overwhelmed by the descriptions of emotional difficulties, but keep these patterns in mind and try to stay on that level. One is fairly slow, somewhat regular and clunky, at perhaps five to seven hertz, with not much else going on. It's an early dark night thing, and it tends to feel like a shamanic drum. The later pattern is fairly fast, perhaps ten to eighteen or more hertz a bit more irregular and has faster and slower harmonics in the background and around the periphery of our attention it tends to make us feel very buzzy and edgy the fact that the background is beginning to shake is a good sign of progress as this needs to happen for the cycle to be completed on the other hand it is exactly the fact that the background has begun to shake and crumble that can cause people to freak out things were all fun and games when the primary object was shaking but when the sense of the observer starts to shake, that can be creepy. Simply pay careful attention to exactly what is happening, staying with each pulse of each vibration as clearly as you can, trying to see each from its beginning to its end. Chances are you'll be just fine. There are two basic things that happen during the dark night, one emotional, the other perceptual. Our dark stuff tends to come bubbling up to the surface with a volume and intensity that we may never have known before. Remembering what is good in our life can be difficult in the face of this, and our reactivity in the face of our dark stuff can cause us staggering amounts of needless suffering. On top of this, we also begin to experience directly the fundamental suffering of duality, a suffering that has always been with us, but which we have never known with this level of intensity or ever clearly understood. We face a profound and fundamental crisis of identity as our insight into the three characteristics begins to demolish part of the basic illusion of there being a separate or permanent us. This suffering is a kind of suffering that has nothing to do with what happens in our life, and everything to do with a basic misunderstanding of all of it. Dealing with either of these two issues, such as our dark stuff and our fundamental crisis of identity, would be a difficult undertaking, but trying to deal with them both at the same time is at least twice as difficult, and can sometimes be overwhelming. It goes without saying that we tend not to be at our best when we are overwhelmed in this way. The knee-jerk response often is to try to make our minds and our world change so as to try to stop the suffering we experience. However, when we are deeply into the dark night, we could be living in paradise and not be able to appreciate this at all, and so this solution is guaranteed to fail. Thus, my strong advice is to work on finishing up this cycle of insight and then work on your stuff from a place of insight and balance, rather than trying to do it in the reactive and disorienting stages of the dark night. I cannot make this point strongly enough. As a close friend of mine with a ton of experience in insight practices and a gift for precise language and teaching so aptly put it, the dark night can really fuck up your life. 
However, I will give you two hard-won pieces of advice that I have found have made the difference in the face of these stages. First, make the time to do basic insight practices. Do your very best to get sufficient insight into the three characteristics so as to get past this stage. Make time for retreats or alone time and don't get stuck in the dark night. You and everyone around you will be happy that you did so. The second piece of advice is to have a no-bleed-through policy when you suspect you are in the dark night. Simply refuse to let your negativity bleed out onto everyone and everything around you. Failure to do so can be disastrous, as your profound lack of perspective, fixation on negativity, and the suffering from your fundamental crisis of identity can easily get projected out onto things and people that simply did not cause that suffering. No one appreciates this at all and it does no good whatsoever. Combining these two pieces of important advice resolve thus. I have recently crossed the A&P event, and I know this by the many obvious signs of that stage. Now I am feeling strangely reactive and negative about things that ordinarily I am able to handle with more balance and clarity, and I know that a good part of this is due to the inevitable dark night that follows the A&P, I realize that I am in a less than ideal position to skillfully deal with the personal issues that are driving me crazy, as I am likely to project the suffering from the illusion of duality and the odd side effects of the dark night onto these issues. I have been warned that this is an extremely bad idea from those who have successfully navigated in this territory, and I have faith that they know what they are talking about. Even if these issues are real and valid, I am likely to blow them way out of proportion and not be able to bring balance and kindness to them. By contracting into my own reactive darkness and confusion, I could easily hurt others and myself. Thus I resolve to keep my darkness to myself, tell only those who are skilled in navigating in dark territory, or at least share it with others in a way that does not project it out on my world and them and so will spare those around me needless suffering which they do not deserve. In short, I will use the meditation map theory to keep the reins of my dark stuff and to deal with it in ways that are known to help rather than harm. I will make time for insight practices and retreats, during which time I will simply see the true nature of the sensations of whatever arises, however horrible or compelling, and not indulge in the content of my stuff for one skinny instant, if this is within the limits of my strength and power. In this way, I will be able to navigate this territory skillfully and not damage my daily life. Should I fail, I will actively seek help from those who are skilled in helping people keep a healthy perspective in the face of dark issues until such time as I can face the dark night as recommended. When I have attained the first stage of awakening, that will be a great time to see how much of my negativity was really valid and how much was just due to my own lack of clarity on the side effects of the dark night. From that place of clarity, I will be much more likely to fix those things in my life that really need fixing and attention, and be able to dismiss easily those paper tigers that I have created for myself. By not trying to take on all of this at once, that is, by gaining deep insights before tackling the personal issues, I am more likely to lead the happy and wise life I wish for myself. I will attain to both liberating insights and insights into my issues, and this will be of great benefit to myself and all beings. One of the primary reasons that I wrote this book was to write this important resolution. I have suffered needlessly and sometimes profoundly from the failure of myself and those I love to follow this resolution. They have suffered also. Were you watching me say these things to you rather than simply hearing them, you would see tears in my eyes and hear my voice cracking with sorrow as I recall those past events and even reflect on what is happening around me as I write this. I beg you, for the sake of all that is good in this world, do not fail to heed this advice. Unfortunately, not everyone seems to be able to do this. In fact, not everyone is even willing to attempt to follow this advice particularly those who buy into the dangerous paradigm that whatever I feel right is now real, in the sense that their feelings at the moment must be the only possible valid perspective on their current situation and are thus completely justified along with their reactions to those feelings. There are those who simply don't believe that such a wondrous and holy thing as insight practices 
could produce such profound difficulties. There are also those who do not believe in the maps, or that the maps could possibly apply to their own very special and unique life. Lastly, there are a few whose pride and insecurity issues will not allow them to admit that they might be affected by the dark night in this way. I would warn such people to stay out of the dark night until they come to a place where they might be able to approximate at least some aspects of the above-mentioned resolution or apply the basics of the theory behind it. That means that if you're not willing to at least try to make and live by some version of my recommended resolution, you should not do insight practices and should not cross the A&P event. I am a big fan of fast sports cars, but I wouldn't give one to a six-year-old kid. Just so, I am a big fan of insight practices, obviously, but I have come to the conclusion that those who are not willing to use them responsibly and intelligently should not use them, as it's too dangerous. They cause too much trouble in the world to be of little of any benefit. This is not likely to be a popular view, but I have experienced too much of what can go wrong when people fail to try to live up to such a resolution to come to any other conclusion. The problem is that many people cross into the dark night without doing formal insight practices. Surprisingly, it is fairly common. I did when I was about fifteen and had no idea what was going on. I have no idea how to reach these people, but they tend to come wandering into spiritual communities soon enough. I hope they find people there who help them sort out what has happened to them and can give them the above advice. In my naive dreams, I imagine that one day there will be training on the maps and basic spiritual development in some generic, non-sectarian way in elementary school, just as we learned about biology and mathematics. And so this would become just another ordinary, accepted, standard part of human education. And so everyone would know about these things as if they were the ordinary, natural things they are. Until then, hopefully the few who run into this technology will help spread it around and help people who have crossed the A&P event to recognize it and handle it properly. This resolution and the spirit implied by it are an aspect of training in morality. And this sort of morality is one of our best friends in the dark night. When we adopt the spirit of this resolution, we do our conscious best to craft our way of being so as to be kind and compassionate. Many people have commented that insight training is a monistic practice. If we are able to build our own virtual monastery through skillful speech and skillful action, then we do not need a monastery to protect us and the world from the potential side effects of our practices. We can live skillfully in the ordinary world and still make progress in insight. However, there are those who are willing to buy the theory and spirit inherent in the above resolution, but are so swamped by their personal issues that they simply cannot follow the above advice after they get into the dark night, despite their kind and skillful intention to do so. My advice to them is to diligently and quickly seek professional help in the form of psychotherapists and their ilk until such time as they are able to follow something like the above-mentioned resolution. Realize that this is not an optimal way to go, as the inherent lack of perspective of the dark night makes aspects of the therapeutic process more difficult, but for some there will be no other option, and this solution is better than simply floundering. On the other hand, at least such people have tons of stuff bubbling loudly up for them to deal with, making some aspects of the therapeutic process easier. However, I would try to do just enough healing so that you can push into the first stage of awakening with minimal bleed-through and then finish whatever therapeutic process you begin in the dark night after you are out of it. There's another seemingly positive way of looking at the dark night, or the knowledges of suffering, one that doesn't really fit well with our mainstream ideals of how life should be. It is the view of the renunciate, which basically says, Ah, now I see your pain of your materialistic life, of your cravings that will never bring you happiness, of your worldly attachments, and that house of cards you call a life. Far better to give it all up and take up the way of the Dharma. While I have generally advised doing completely otherwise, I can completely understand why one would do this. However, the problem comes when we have things like debt, children, aging parents, and the like. 
and sorting out the ethics of these conflicts is complex. Regardless, the dark night does teach important lessons, and learning them is essential to moving to what comes next. These lessons do not require specific lifestyle choices for mastery. Instead, it is a question of clear perception of, you guessed it, the three characteristics of the sensations that occur during those stages. As I mentioned in Part 1, each training has a specific kind of renunciation associated with it, and they couldn't be more different. It is time to get back to describing dissolution. As the stage of arising and passing away ends, the meditator may be left feeling raw and incompetent, despite the fact that they are continuing to make valuable progress into deeper and deeper levels of profound insight. This feeling that something is wrong when things are actually getting better and better can cause all sorts of problems during the dark night, especially to those not familiar with the standard maps. On the other hand, having come through the A&P territory can be quite a relief, and so sometimes dissolution can seem quite welcome. Some will stop practicing here, as they feel they have released the kundalini, and so are done for the time being. Dissolution feels like a very natural place to stop practicing, the only problem being that the later stages, fear and the rest, tend to follow it soon enough even if one stops, though less intense practice leads to less intense if often prolonged dark night. However, those who wish to keep doing formal practice may find dissolution frustrating, whereas just one stage ago they could sit for hours and perceive the finest vibrations of reality in exquisite detail. Now reality appears to be slipping away, vague, and hard to get a handle on. Whereas we may have had stellar posture in the previous stage, now we go back to being ordinary mortals. Images of the body may even seem to completely disappear, similar to that which happens in formless realms, but without the clarity. Practice is likely to be more difficult, and we may experience pain from sitting that was completely absent during the previous stage. This can be extremely frustrating for those who do not know that this is normal, and the desire to retain a fading past can greatly interfere with being present. In the face of these difficulties, I highly recommend noting practice. It may seem like a step back to some who abandoned it during the glory of the A&P, but the spiritual path is not a linear one. In the face of dissolution and the stages that follow, noting practice can be very useful and powerful. In short, if the meditator is able to keep practicing, familiar theme yet, and adjust to having to actually work to perceive things clearly again, they will begin to make further progress. This time, the effort will have to be with a lighter and wider touch. Note well, if they give up in the stages of the dark night, or any time after the A&P event, the qualities of the dark night will almost certainly continue to haunt them in their daily life, sapping their strength and motivation, and perhaps even causing feelings of unease, perhaps depression, even paranoia. Thus, the wise meditator is very, very highly encouraged to try to maintain their practice, despite the potential difficulties, so as to avoid getting stuck in these stages. Think of dissolution as the couch potato stage, though it can also have a sense of sensual languor to it. A hallmark of dissolution is that it is suddenly hard to avoid getting lost in thought and fantasy when meditating. We may feel somehow disconnected from our life. Another effect that can be very noticeable at this stage is that actions just don't happen easily. For instance, you might be going to lift your hand to turn off your alarm clock, but your hand just doesn't move. You could move your hand, but somehow things just tend to stop with the intention and get nowhere. Eventually, you move your hand, but it might have been just a bit tiring to do so. That's what dissolution feels like. Meditation can be the same way, and until one breaks out of this, things can get a bit mired down in the overstuffed cushions of dissolution. However, when the perception of things ending becomes clearer again, there arises fear. Section 12. 6. Fear. The clarity and intensity begin to return, but now this stage can involve all sorts of frightening distortions of perception when sitting, 
accompanied by great feelings of unease, paranoia, fearfulness, and or the willies. It can even sometimes seem that our body is falling in tatters through the floor, or that we are rotting away. If we have strong concentration tendencies, we may see horrifying or disconcerting visions. Vibrations from here on out should no longer change frequency with the phase of the breath as they did in stage four, and for the next few stages tend to be slower than those in that previous stage. Strangely, fear can also be just a bit rapturous in the way that a horror movie can be, or in the way that riding a roller coaster at night can be simultaneously scary and exciting. However, the nice side of this stage tends to be greatly overshadowed by the dark side. We are being asked to accept the full range of life here as it is. Acceptance and clear, precise awareness of the true nature of the actual sensations that make up all of this are the key in all of the dark night stages as before. On the mild side, this stage might manifest as just slightly heightened sense of nonspecific anxiety. As fear passes and our reality continues to strobe in and out and fall away, we are left feeling... 7. Misery. This stage can be characterized by the great feelings of sadness and loss. Again, there can almost be something nice about the heartfelt depth of those feelings, but this tends to be greatly overshadowed by the dark side of them. We are having our whole concept of self and the world as being permanent, able to satisfy, and even being us, or separate from us, torn down, and violated by now the undeniable truth of the three characteristics. There can be a lot of grieving in this process. This is hard to accept, and our resistance to this process causes us misery. Becoming lost in content of these situations and being unable to see their true nature is a somewhat common cause of failure to progress and failure to live healthily. On the mild side, we may just feel a bit like we do after we have been crying. Misery is the transition point between the drum-like 5 to 8 hertz part of the dark night and the very complex, irritating frequencies that follow. Attention continues to get wider and the center more blind. As things continue to fall apart, clearly demonstrate their unsatisfactoriness and their selflessness. This can cause 8. Disgust We become disgusted with the whole thing. This is where the buzzy 10 to 18 or more hertz chaotic vibrations around the periphery really begin to get strong. Through this section of the dark night, our ability to see objects in the center of our attention is poor, and it may feel like our minds are being stretched wide and yet contracting at the same time. We begin to feel completely tormented by our noisy and repetitious minds, a classic sign of this stage, by a body that is full of suffering and unpleasant sensations, and by a world that is falling apart. Perceiving thoughts as thoughts get harder and harder, and thus getting caught by our stuff gets increasingly easier. On the mild side, one might just feel subtly revolted and disappointed with reality in general, or perhaps have the slightly creepy feeling of crawling skin. On the strong side, we see nothing to cling to, no self to be found, and we begin to wish the whole edgy thing would just end. Also called... 9 desire for deliverance at this stage we are fed up with the whole thing but at a level that transcends mere suicidal thoughts thus it is actually beneficial though it seems otherwise no longer do we look forward to anything but the complete ending of all sensations which is the first taste of nirvana we just wish the noise in our minds would stop cold but we are unable to will this to happen we wish the vibrations which can be quite intense, harsh, and irritating by this stage, would all go away forever. If we fail to associate the pain ending with deep insights, but instead falsely associate it with changing something in our ordinary life, we are likely to wander far and wide until we come to realize the limitations of ordinary solutions. This is the stage when people are most likely to quit their jobs or schooling out of frustration, and go on a long retreat or spiritual quest. Fascination with celibacy as somehow being a higher spiritual path can arise. Our renunciation trip can be very disoriented to partners, particularly if we were going to the opposite extreme of intense sexuality during the stage of the arising and passing away. 
which probably occurred relatively recently, so try to be sensitive to their needs if you can. Somewhere in there, there can arise the tendency to try and get one's life and finances in order, so that one can leave the world behind for a time and have something to come back to without having to worry about such things for a while. A profound resolution to push onward can arise at this stage, driven by our powerful frustration and the powerful compassion in it. We make the last push for freedom and push against the seemingly impenetrable wall of 10. Reobservation This stage may not sound like much of a problem, as it has such a boring-sounding name, but this stage is often, though not always, like a brick wall, particularly the first few times we run into it. It can be as if all the stages of the dark night converge again for one last important lesson, the lesson of reobservation. We must perceive the true nature of the sensations that make up all of our ideas of perfection, all of the ideals we cling to, all images of how the world should be and shouldn't be, all desire for anything to be other than the way it is, as well as all desire for enlightenment that is anything other than this. It may seem impossible to sit for even a minute, as the levels of restlessness and aversion to meditation and all experiences can get quite high. This stage, and part of stage three, the three characteristics, can share some common features, but this should be seen as a strong warning to those who are prone to being overly certain about where they are. I get a reasonable number of emails from people who claim that they are in reobservation, and shortly thereafter they are describing A and P territory, meaning that they have just been in the three characteristics territory, not reobservation. Continuing to investigate the true nature of these sorts of sensations and our map theories is often difficult, and this is a common cause of failure to progress. Now, I am about to describe all sorts of emotional or psychological manifestations that can sometimes happen at this stage. The more extreme is the description of a possible side effect of this stage, the rarer that side effect is likely to be, particularly those that sound like descriptions of mental illness. For someone who is staying at the level of bare sensate experience, as I strongly recommend, the only difficult manifestations that seem to be quite common are a strong sense of aversion to formal meditation and experience, and a deep sense of primal frustration, though these tend to fall quickly in the face of good practice, and if our concentration is strong enough and our other factors are in balance, we may move through this stage with no problem at all. The aversion to meditation and experience are due to the fact that the vibrations by this point can be quite fast and harsh, and the noise in a repetitive minds quite irritating. Some of my own descriptions of this stage while on retreat have included such phrases as the mind storm, and bracing for work in D minor for six sense doors, hailstorm, and stuttering banshee. If we are very powerful meditators, it can literally feel as if we will be torn apart by these vibrations. This is exactly what we are trying to accomplish. Even if the other odd manifestations do arise, if we are practicing well, they should not last very long at all, at best minutes, at worst hours or days. All of that said, and before I go on, those who are crossing this territory with strong concentration abilities and using some very rarefied object, such as a complex visualization on sacred geometry as one of many possible examples, may, if they are very good, pass through this stage with little or no difficulty at all, and all they may notice is that the thing gets wider and wider, the patterns get more complex and attain to wider, more spherical dimensions and perhaps manifold symmetries, and that it comes around to encompass basically the whole field of experience, kind of like watching an IMAX movie of a moving technicolor spirograph in the front row or some similar thing. I use this example partly due to my own experiments and partly to illustrate general points. Different objects will produce different specifics, such as colors, images, etc., while some universal aspects of what happens during this stage will remain basically the same. You see, reobservation is actually all fluff and no substance, but if you confuse fluff for substance, the effect will be the same as if it actually had substance. It is like a toothless dog with a ferocious bark. 
if you run screaming or faint from fear when the dog barks then it needed no teeth to prevent your progress the primary sign that the negative side effects that may occur in the dark night are actually not associated with insight stages but instead are due to other processes is that they do not change much in the face of strong and accepting investigation or stopping practice entirely that said this stage is sometimes called the rolling up the mat stage and is when many who joined monasteries in the stage of the arising and passing away now give up and disrobe people on retreats tend to need lots of reassurance and often leave right then even with good guidance and encouragement there can be the distinct feeling that it is impossible to go forward and useless to go back which is exactly the lesson they should learn the acceptance of right here and right now is required even if it seems that this mind and this body are quite unacceptable and unworthy of investigation no sensations are unworthy of investigation one of the hallmarks of the early part of this stage is that we may begin to see clearly exactly what our minds do all day long with a great clarity how the illusion of a dualistic split is even created in the first place sensation by sensation moment to moment but somehow there is not yet enough spaciousness of perspective and equanimity to make good use of this information this can be very frustrating as we wonder how many times we have to learn these lessons before they stick great feelings of frustration and disenchantment with life relationships sex jobs moral codes and worldly responsibilities may sometimes emerge at this stage in ways that can cause all sorts of disruption and angst these aspects of one's life can temporarily be bland and pointless at this stage though it may seem that this will always be the way one feels about them this stage can mimic or perhaps manifest as some degree of clinical depression beware of making radical life changes that cannot easily be undone such as divorce or firing off angry emails to your boss based on the temporary feelings that may arise during this stage for those that recognize that they are in this stage some sort of active mental compensation for these potential effects can be helpful so as to keep one's life functioning it can help one appear more together than one feels and thus maintain relationships jobs studies etc at some sort of functional level this can be very skillful if it is also combined with practice that allows the experiences of this stage to be acknowledged and understood well layers of unhelpful and previously hidden expectation pressure and anxiety can show their true uselessness though this beneficial process can be very confusing and difficult we may get the sense that we have never had such a strong feeling life and until we get used to this new awareness of our previously subtle emotions this stage can be quite overwhelming occasionally people can also have what can seem like full psychotic breaks during this stage though if these are truly a side effect of insight practices they should pass quickly the big trick here is to continue to acknowledge and accept the content but also continue to see the true nature of the sensations that make up these natural phenomena this can be extremely hard to do especially if people have chanced upon this stage without the benefit of the guidance of a well-developed insight tradition and teachers who can recognize this territory those who do not know what to do with this stage or who get overwhelmed by the mind states can get so lost in the content that they begin to lose it this is the far extreme of what can happen in this stage fear is frightening misery is miserable and seemingly psychotic episodes are very confusing and destabilizing in the face of such experiences we may swing to the opposite extreme clinging desperately to grandiose images of ourselves these things can easily perpetuate themselves and this can become a blatantly destructive mental habit if people persist in wallowing in these dark emotions and their deep and unresolved issues for too long it can be like cognitive restructuring from hell if the content continues to be bought without the ability to see its true nature then the mind can spiral down and down into madness and despair when people mention touching their own madness on the spiritual path they are often talking about this stage this stage can make people feel claustrophobic and tight if they push to make progress they can feel that they are just getting wound up tighter and tighter 
If they do nothing, then they are still suffering anyway. The advice here is, stick with it, but don't try to force it. Pay attention to balancing effort and acceptance. Remember that discretion is the better part of valor. Practice in moderation as well as maintaining a long-term view can be helpful. Think of practice as a lifelong endeavor, but do just what you can each day. Stay present-oriented. Walks in nature or places with large, expansive views can help, as can exercise. This stage has the power to profoundly purify us, given sufficient commitment to just trying to sit with it. Be clear, precise, and accept all of this despite the pain and anguish, both physical and mental, that it can bring. If on retreat, sit and walk according to the schedule. Apply the technique as prescribed every second, if humanly possible, and do not leave early. This stage is actually a profound opportunity to see clearly the pain of the dualistic aspect of our attachments, aversions, desires, hopes, fears, and ideals, as all this has been amplified to an unprecedented level. It is this stage that makes possible the path of heroic effort, diligent investigation of this moment based upon the powerful desire for enlightenment, as at this stage all of the skillful aspects of this desire are beaten out of the meditator with a force equivalent to the suffering caused by them. You can actually get very far on highly imbalanced and goal-oriented practice, and it can be given sufficient momentum and meditation skills so that, should you get your ass kicked in this stage, one continues making progress quickly anyway. Again, if the meditator stops practicing here, they can get stuck and haunted by this stage in the whole of their life until they complete this first progress of insight. Their lack of practice will deprive them of the primary benefits of this stage, such as the increased perceptual abilities that allowed them to get this much insight in the first place, and reduce their chances of getting beyond it, and yet the emotional consequences can remain long after the skills in meditation have faded. They can become chronic dark night yogis, meditators that somehow just don't figure out how to get past this stage for very long periods of time. You would be surprised by how many of these people there are out there. Their failure to unstick themselves may be due to their own psychological makeup, poor instruction, imagining that the spiritual life is all about bliss and wonderful emotions, believing in absurd models of spirituality that do not allow for the full range of the emotional and mental life, or chancing upon the stage outside of a well-developed insight tradition, which is what happened to me at about age fifteen. I was a chronic dark night yogi for ten years, without having any idea what the hell was happening to me, so I can speak on this topic with some authority. Further, I have gone through numerous other dark nights at the higher stages of awakening and come across the same issues again and again. Being stuck in the dark night can manifest as anything from chronic mild depression and free-floating anxiety to serious delusional paranoia and other classic mental illnesses, such as narcissism and delusions of grandeur, my personal favorites. Dark night yogis may act with a strange mixture of dedicated spirituality and darkness. I mentioned that the A&P event could impart a bit of the inspirational, radical, religious leader quality to those prone to such things. For these same individuals, stage 10 can sometimes have a bit of the paranoid, apocalyptic cult leader quality to it, a confused whirlwind of powerful inspiration and despair. Just because someone has borderline or antisocial personality disorder doesn't mean they can't make progress in insight, and when they hit these stages, it can be pretty wild. We may all have our own particular neurotic tendencies that come out when we are under stress, but if you feel that you are really losing it, get help, particularly from those who know this territory firsthand and are willing to talk honestly about it. Don't be a macho meditator and get stuck. And don't imagine that spiritual practice can't cause some wild and sometimes unpleasant side effects. One of the best things about working with a thoroughly qualified and realized insight meditation teacher before we get into this sort of trouble is that they will have some idea of our baseline level of sanity and balance, and thus know what we are capable of. That said, I suspect that both the mushroom factor and the Dharma jet set culture of teachers popping in and out with little chance for students to have meaningful contact with them off retreat, 
contributes to the non-trivial number of dark night yogis out there. I suspect that there are fewer problems with chronic dark night yogis in traditions where the maps of what can happen in this territory are well known, and in which there are teachers who are very accessible and honest about their humanity and the possible range of the spiritual terrain. On the other hand, sometimes genuine mental illness or unrelated emotional or psychological difficulties can show up in people's lives. Blaming it all on the dark night may not always be accurate or helpful, though if you have recently crossed the A&P event and not completed an insight cycle or gotten into the next stage, equanimity, there is going to be some dark night component mixed in with whatever else is going on. Meditation traditions tend to attract what can seem like more than their fair share of the spiritual, emotional, and mental equivalents of the walking wounded. Sorting out what is what can sometimes get murky and may require the help of those who know this insight territory and those who deal with routine mental illness and emotional and psychological difficulties. The best combination would be someone who knows both. I have a highly enlightened friend who has found it very useful to take medication to treat his bipolar disorder. There is something very down-to-earth and realistic about that. These practices won't save us from our biology. They merely reveal something in the relationship to it. On the other hand, there are those that are so deeply indoctrinated by the models of working through our dark stuff that whenever it comes up, they turn to psychotherapy or a whole host of other ways of getting their issues to resolve or go away. This view implies false solidity and an exaggerated importance to these things that can make it very hard to see the true nature of the sensations that make them up. The trap here is that we turn to basic crisis of fundamental identity into a witch hunt for the specific things in our life that we imagine are making us this dissatisfied with our basic experience. If someone has got to this level of practice, no amount of tinkering with the specifics of our life will ever solve the fundamental issue. That doesn't mean that some of the dissatisfactions with specific aspects of our life may not be valid, and in fact they often are quite valid. However, these relative issues get mixed in with a far deeper issue, that of who we really are and aren't. And, until this progress of insight has been completed, this mixture tends to greatly exaggerate our specific criticisms of those things in our life that could actually stand improvement and work. Learning this lesson can be very hard for some people, and the dark irony is that they may wreck their relationships, careers, and finances, as well as emotional and physical health, trying to get away from their own high level of insight into the true nature of reality. It can also make them have strong reactions to their meditation teachers and Dharma friends, either being very dissatisfied with them or being very demanding that they somehow save them or more likely both. Until they are willing to work on a more direct, sensei level, there is no limit to the amount of angst and negativity they can project into their world. I have seen this play out again and again in myself and in the lives of my Dharma companions. It can be a very ugly business. My advice for such situations is this. If, after careful analysis of your insight practice, leads you to the conclusion that you are in reobservation, Resolve that you will not wreck your life through excessive negativity. Resolve this strongly and often. Follow your heart as best you can, but try to spare yourself and the world from as much needless pain as possible. Through sheer force of will, keep it together until such time as you are willing to face your sensate world directly and without anesthesia or armor. I have seen what happens when people do otherwise, and have come to the conclusion that, in general, Things go badly if people do not follow this advice, though some unexpected good can always come from such situations. The framework of the three trainings and the three types of suffering that is found within each of their scopes can be helpful here as well. Since people are generally not used to facing fundamental crises of identity, such as the basic issue in reobservation, they are not familiar with the pain of fundamental suffering. Being unfamiliar with the pain of fundamental suffering, they are likely to imagine that it is actually suffering produced by the specifics of their ordinary world. However, if you have gotten to reobservation, 
in short if you have found these techniques to be effective have faith that the remaining advice may be of value and try to fulfill this part of the experiment that is if you are in reobservation the task that confronts you is to disassociate the fundamental suffering you now know all too well from the specifics of your life in an ordinary sense following this advice may sound dangerous heartless or bizarre to some people it is a valid criticism in an ideal world we would not have to go around second-guessing ourselves and the sources of our suffering in the specific way that i advocate here in an ideal world we would really have our psychological trip together and be able to stay with the practice during these stages and thus cross quickly through the dark night and finish this practice cycle it definitely can be done however we are not always ideal practitioners and thus the dark night often causes the problems mentioned above that need to be dealt with somehow my solution to what happens when we cannot or will not do insight practices in the face of the dark night are also not ideal however the outcomes are likely to be much healthier in the short and long term than those that come from simply allowing unrestrained dark night bleed through strangely i have come to the conclusion that simply practicing is often much easier than trying to stop dark night bleed through if we are willing to just try it though it can easily seem otherwise the old kindergarten evaluation follows instructions plays well with others is still a valuable standard in the dark night not restraining one's negativity and reactivity in the dark night is a bit like getting stinking drunk and then driving in heavy traffic rather than just sitting down and waiting to sober up not continuing to do insight practices in this stage is like going into surgery opening up an incision making some repairs and then freaking out because the patient now has a big bleeding incision and running away from the operating table leaving them there to suffer you could think of many ways to make the patient happy and try them all but until you close up that wound they're going to be pissed unfortunately in this case you are both the surgeon and the patient face the wound and close it up you obviously have the necessary skills as you have gotten this far use them the operation is nearly over there are also those who try to investigate the true nature of their psychological demons and life issues but get so fixated on using insight to make them go away that they fail to hold these things in a wider more realistic and appropriate perspective this subtle corruption of insight practices turns them into another form of denial rather than a path to awakening drawing from the agendas of training in morality in which there is concern for the specific thoughts and feelings that make up our experience they fail to make progress in insight whose agenda is simply to see the true nature of all sensations as they are both important but it is a question of timing i have come to the conclusion that with very rare and fleeting exceptions ninety-five per cent of the sensations that make up our experience are really no problem at all even in the hard stages but seeing this clearly is not always easy we tend to fixate on strong sensations when they arise those that are very painful or very pleasant and in these times we can miss the fact that most of our reality is made up of sensations that are no big deal thus missing many great opportunities for easy insights further the dark night can bring up all sorts of unfamiliar feelings that we rarely if ever have experienced with such clarity and intensity until we get used to these feelings they can frighten us and make us reactive because of our unfamiliarity with them even if they are not actually that strongly unpleasant i highly recommend using physical sensations such as those of the breath as the objects of inquiry during the dark night whenever possible as plunging into emotional content even with the intention of investigating it can sometimes be a very hard way to go remember whether we gain insight through investigating physical or mental objects is completely irrelevant insight is insight choose objects for investigation by which you don't get caught whenever possible the best thing about reality particularly in the dark night is that you only have to deal with one little flickering sensation at a time staying on that level when doing insight practices is an unusually good idea pay attention to what is right in front of you but keep your attention open 
All of that scary stuff said, there are people who breeze straight from the arising and passing away on through the whole of dark night in as little as a few easy minutes or hours and hardly notice it at all. So don't let my descriptions of what can sometimes happen script you into imagining that the dark night has to be a gigantic problem. It absolutely doesn't. These descriptions of what can sometimes happen are merely there to help those who do encounter these sorts of problems to realize that these things can happen, and so to be more able to deal with them skillfully. There is no medal awarded for having a tough time in the dark night, or for staying in it for longer than necessary, much to my dismay. One of the more bizarre potholes we can fall into in the dark night is to become identified and fascinated with the role of the great spiritual basket case. I am so spiritual that my life is a non-stop catastrophe of uncontrollable insights, disabling and freakish raptures, and constant emotional crisis in the most profound nature. If my spiritual abilities are proven and verified by what a mess I'm making of my life, how brave I am to screw up my life in this way! Oh, what a glorious and holy wreck I am! Both my sympathy and intolerance for those caught in this trap is directly related to the amount of time I have spent in that trap, being just like them. Whereas we should not try to pretend that the dark night hasn't made us a basket case if it has done so, we should neither revel in being a basket case nor use the dark night as an excuse for not being as kind and functional as we possibly can. One way or the other, when we finally give up and rest in things as they are without trying to change them or be them, such as be very accepting of our actual humanity as well as clear about the three characteristics of mental and physical phenomena, there arises. Number 11. Equanimity. Finally, we really begin to understand and surrender to the truth of things. We accept the truth of our actual human lives as they are at a deep level. All of the stuff that the dark night may have brought up may still be going on, but somehow it has lost its ability to cause real trouble. Equanimity is much more about something in the relationship to phenomena than anything specific about the phenomena themselves. Equanimity can have a sort of a rough start, strangely enough, as well as some mildly painful and irritating sensations, but the meditator feels that some barrier has finally broken, a weight has been lifted, and practice can continue. However, this stage can be such a relief after reobservation that it is very tempting to solidify it into the fourth Samanthajana, either because doing so is so nice, or because of fear of falling back to reobservation, which can easily occur. However, as I continue to mention, not investigating the qualities of this stage, such as peace, ease, and a panoramic perspective, causes failure to progress and makes falling back to reobservation more likely. The first vipassana jhana is about building up the basic skills of what is a physical sensation, what is a mental sensation, how they relate and what the three characteristics feel like in practice. The arising and passing away is about seeing this very clearly and profoundly for the object of meditation. The dark night is about these insights when coming around to the background and seeing more complex emotional and psychological constructs of mental and physical sensations as they are. The fourth vipassana jhana, meaning this stage, is about seeing the true nature of even more complex, inclusive, subtle and fundamental things, like space, awareness, investigation, wonder, expectation, anticipation, peace, ease, questioning, and all those sorts of things in ways that cut through the center and include the whole background and foreground as well. This early stage can feel very familiar and normal, like we have remembered something simple and good from our childhood. If we felt weary of the world in the dark night, we may suddenly find that the world is just fine, and may even be more engaged with it and excited about it than before. Again, these potentially radical mood swings can be very disorienting to those with whom we have close relationships. Try to be sensitive to this and their feelings. Confidence returns, but whereas there may have been a ramble-like quality to it during stage four, the arising and passing away, now there is more of the cool, charming confidence of James Bond, 
sorry about the purely masculine images here somewhere in there can arise a tendency to see the world and those in it in very strange and unusual ways i will give one example from my own experience but realize that tremendous variation is possible here so don't take this too seriously it is meant to try to convey a very general concept i remember looking around me at all the people on retreat and even all the chickens birds and puppies in the monastery and seeing them all simultaneously as little mush demons little squat greenish creatures with big sad mouths and eyes and fully enlightened buddhas at the same time they were both in fact we were both we were deluded and small yet transcendent and luminous i could see in some very strange way exactly how each of them including me was caught in the world of form and confusion trying to find happiness and yet doing so from such a small and frightened place and yet all of this was vast buddha nature all of this was the natural luminous and compassionate dance of god such strange perspectives that try to resolve paradoxical insights do not always occur but this is included here in case they do and perhaps to provoke knowing laughter from those with their own unique stories from this part of the path more sexual and stylized versions of these experiences can also explain where some of the more exotic tantric teachings come from though a sexual component is more characteristic of the a and p sometimes the early part of stage eleven can produce a real sense of freedom in the conventional sense freedom from cares worries and even responsibilities and social conventions one may sometimes feel that one is simply beyond everything and it must be admitted that this is a wonderful feeling it tends to fade quickly enough on its own but it might be possible to get caught by it if one stopped practicing entirely those who became spiritual fanatics or freaks after the a and p and during the dark night may now begin to act much more like their old selves with their spiritual path being less of a big holy deal about damn time visions of bright lights may arise once more but they are really more associated with stage four the arising and passing away again as with the earlier stages the meditator is able to sit for longer and longer periods of time and begins to clearly perceive the three characteristics with spaciousness and breadth the big difference is that the a n p is more about the object of meditation and equanimity is much more about the whole sensate universe there is less rapture and more equanimity than in the stage of the arising and passing away there are rarely if ever the spontaneous physical motions and odd breathing patterns that come with that earlier stage unfortunately just to make things confusing there is often a single double dip shift in the manner of a and p territory with one being halfway down the breath and the other at the end of that breath very soon after the shift from reobservation to equanimity in the early part of this stage reality may appear a bit clunky for a while the practice may seem quite possible but may seem to require steady but sustainable work if one is tired one may begin having dropouts that are similar to what occurred in dissolution but more extreme it may be hard to read and pay attention hard to listen to people and hear hard to notice where one is and what one is doing the arising of some sort of fear of madness and death is not uncommon at this stage but usually does not cause too much trouble and even may seem comical or welcome a related and common feeling in the early part of this stage is the general sense that something big is about to happen though this feeling is also common before the a and p event these feelings are worthy of sensate investigation in a wide and inclusive way reality can now be perceived with great breath precision and clarity and soon with no special effort this is called high equanimity for those with strong concentration and technique vibrations may become predominant and reality may become nothing but vibrations vibrating formless realms may even arise with no discernible image of the body being present at all it may feel like reality is trying to synchronize with itself and that is exactly correct gently investigate this feeling and any subtle tensions in it phenomena may even begin to lose the sense that they are of a particular sense door 
and mental and physical phenomena may appear nearly indistinguishably just as vibrations of suchness sometimes referred to as formations i put off writing about formations for a long time as they are a conceptually difficult topic further the classical definition of formations is perhaps not so clear-cut so i wondered about imposing my own functional and experiential definitions on the term however as the topic of formations has arisen in so many conversations recently i thought that it would be worth taking on despite the difficulties i am going to define formations as the primary experience of insight meditation when one is solidly in the fourth vipassana jhana the eleventh jhana high equanimity whose formal title is actually knowledge of equanimity concerning formations for those of you who find this circular definition completely unhelpful formations have the following qualities when clearly experienced they contain all the six sense doors in them including thought in a way that does not split them up sequentially in time or positionally in space if you could take a 3d moving photograph that also captured smell taste touch sound and thought all woven into each other seamlessly and containing a sense of flux this would approximate the experience of one formation from a fourth vipassana jhana point of view and from a very high dharma point of view formations are always what occur and if they are not clearly perceived then we experience reality the way that we normally do they contain not only a complete set of aspects of all six sense doors within them but include the perception of space or volume and even of time movement when the fourth vipassana jhana is first attained subtle mental sensations mind again split off from this side much as in the way of the knowledge of the mind and body but with the three characteristics of phenomena and the space they are a part of being breathtakingly clear until mental and physical sensations fully synchronize on that side there can be a bit of a triality in which there is the sense of the observer on this side and nearly the whole of body and mind as two fluxing entities over there as mental phenomena and physical phenomena gradually integrate with the sense of luminous space this experientially begs the question what is observing formations at a level that is way beyond just talking about it for you kabbalah correspondence fans these insights correspond to the three points of Bina, the two points of Chakma, and finally the single point of Kether. Formations are so inclusive that they viscerally demonstrate what is pointed out to the concept of no self in a way that no other mode of experiencing reality can. As formations become predominant, we are faced first with the question of which side of the dualistic split we are on and then with the question of what is watching what earlier appeared to be on both sides just keep investigating in a natural and matter-of-fact way let this profound dance unfold if you have gotten to this point you are extraordinarily close and need to do very little but relax and be gently curious about your experience when experienced at very high levels of concentration formations lose the sense that they were even formed of experiences from distinguishable sense doors this is hard to describe but one might try such a nebulous phrase as waves of suchness or primal undifferentiated experience this is largely an artifact of experiencing formations high up in the by-products of the fourth vipassana jhana such as the first three formless realms this aspect of how formations may be experienced is not necessary for the discussions below it is the highly inclusive quality of formations that is the most interesting and this leads to the most practical application of discussing formations it is because they are so inclusive that they are the gateway to the three doors to stage fifteen fruition they reveal a way out of the paradox of duality the maddening sense that this is observing controlling subject to separated from etc of that by containing all or nearly all of the sensations comprising one moment in a very integrated way they contain the necessary clarity to see through the fundamental illusions one of the primary ways that the illusion of duality is maintained is that the mind partially blinks out for a part of each formation the part it wants to section off to appear separate 
In this way there is insufficient clarity to see the interconnectedness and true nature of that part of reality, and a sense of a self is maintained. When the experience of formations arises, it comes out of a level of clarity that is so complete that this blinking can no longer easily occur. Thus, when formations become the dominant experience, even for short periods of time, very profound and liberating insight is close at hand. That is why there are systematic practices that train us to be very skilled in being aware of our whole mental and physical existence. The more we practice being aware of what happens, the less opportunities there are for blinking. During the first three insight stages, we gain the ability to notice that mental and physical sensations made up our world, how they interacted, and then begin to see the truth of them. We applied these skills to an object, perhaps not of our choice, but an object nonetheless, and saw it as it actually was, with a high degree of clarity in the A and P. By this point, these skills in perceiving clearly have become so much a part of who we are, that they begin to apply themselves to the background, space, and everything that seemed to be a reference point or separate, permanent self, as we entered the dark night. However, our objects may have been quite vague or too disconcerting to have been perceived clearly. Finally, we get to equanimity and put it all together. We can see the truth of our objects and of the whole background and are okay with this, and the result is perception of formations. Formations contain within them the seeming gap between this and that, as well as sensations of effort, intimacy, resistance, acceptance, and all other such aspects of sensations from which a sense of self is more easily inferred. Thus, these aspects begin to be seen in their proper place, their proper context, such as an interdependent part of reality and not split off for a self. Further, the level of clarity out of which formations arise also allows one to see formations from the time they arise to the time they disappear, thus hitting directly at the sense of a self or sensate universe continuing coherently in time. In the first part of the path, the beginning of objects was predominant. In the A&P, we got a great sense of the middle of objects, but missed subtle aspects of the beginning and end. In the dark night, the endings are about all we could really perceive clearly. Formations once again put all of this work we have done together in a very natural and complete way. Formations also explain some odd teachings that you might hear about, stopping thought. There are three basic ways we might think about this dangerous ideal. We might imagine a world in which the ordinary aspects of our world, which we call thought, simply do not arise a world of experience without those aspects of manifestation. You can get very close to this in very strong concentration states, particularly the eighth Samitha Jhana. We might also think of stopping experience entirely, as happens in fruition, and this obviously includes thought. Formations point to yet another possible interpretation of the common wish to stop thought, as do very high levels of realization. The seeming duality of mental and physical sensation is gone by the time we are perceiving formations well. Thoughts appear as one luminous aspect of the phenomenal world. In fact, I challenge anyone to describe the bare experience of thinking or mental sensations in terms beyond those of the five physical sense doors. Thus, in the face of experience formations, it seems crude to speak in terms of thought as separate from those of visual, tactile, auditory, gustatory, and olfactory qualities, or even to speak in terms of these being separate entities. When perceived clearly, what we usually call thoughts are seen to be just aspects of the manifesting sensate world that we artificially select out and label as thought, just as it would be odd to imagine that an ocean with many shades of blue is really many little bits of ocean. In times of high clarity, it is obvious that there is manifesting reality, and it is absolutely inclusive. Look at the space between you and your MP3 player. We don't go around selecting out little bits of space and labeling them as separate. In the face of formations, the same applies to experience, and experience obviously includes the sensations we call thought. Separating the early stages of equanimity from its mature stage, there tends to be a near-miss moment when we get very close to the fruit of the path, 
which serves to really chill one out, as it were. From this point, enlightenment is likely to be attained quickly, as long as the meditator continues to simply practice, and gently fine-tune their awareness and precision, paying gentle attention to things like thoughts of progress and satisfaction with equanimity. At some point, even this becomes boring, and a certain cool apathy and even forgetfulness arises. Around this part of equanimity there can arise the feeling that we are not really there, or that somehow we are completely out of phase with reality. Conducting ordinary business may be difficult in this phase, if we are out in the world rather than on the cushion, but it tends to only last tens of minutes at most. The sense that one is practicing or trying to get anywhere just vanishes, and yet this may hardly be noticeable at all. We sort of come back with luminosity again growing predominant. Then we get lost in thoughts about something, some strangely clear reverie, vision object, or flight of fancy. By really buying in, we get set up to check out. When understanding is completely in conformity with the way things are, this is called conformity. Section 13. 12. Conformity. This is why understanding things just as they are is so important. This stage lasts only one moment and never arises again until one attains the next stage of enlightenment. The same is true of the next two stages. Stages 12 to 14. Conformity, change of lineage, and path also share the fact that they represent the three moments of the first entrance to transcendent ultimate reality, stage 15, fruition, through one of the three doors. In subsequent attainments of fruition at that path during the stage of review, the three moments before fruition are not called conformity, change of lineage and path. These three stages will get extensive treatment in the chapter on the three doors. 13. Change of Lineage Having understood things just as they are, this next stage, which also lasts for just a moment, does the damage, as a friend of mine joyfully put it. It permanently changes the minds of the meditators in ways that I will discuss in just a bit. They leave the ranks of the unenlightened and join the ranks of those that are. While the social designation of formal lineage transmission is a very useful thing to have received, the results of this stage are, in fact, what that symbolic act is all about. They have done it, and thus attain 14. Path. This stage also lasts just a moment, and after the first completed progress of insight, it marks the first moment of the newly awakened being's awakened life. The first time around, this is called stream entry, or first path in the Theravada, the fourth stage of the second path, or the first bhumni in the Tibetan tradition, and many names in Zen that are purposefully ambiguous. After a subsequent, new progress of insight, it marks the attainment of the next level of awakening, and there are lots of names for those that will be discussed shortly. It is directly followed by 15. Fruition This is the fruit of all the meditator's hard work, the first attainment of ultimate reality, emptiness, nirvana, God, or whatever you wish to call it. In this non-state, there is absolutely no time, no space, no reference point, no experience, no mind, no consciousness, no nothingness, no somethingness, no body, no this, no that, no unity, no duality, and no anything else. Reality stops cold and then reappears. Thus, this is impossible to comprehend, as it goes completely and utterly beyond the rational mind and the sensate universe. To external time, if someone were observing the meditator from the outside, this lasts only an instant. It is like an utter discontinuity of the space-time continuum, with nothing in the unfindable gap. The initial aftershocks, however, can go on for days, and may be mild or spectacular, fun or unsettling, or some mixture of these. There are times when it is fun to show off, and this is one of those times. Aftershocks I have noticed after paths include, but are not limited to, 
the visceral feeling that sensory reality is so intense that the nerve in one's forehead and upper neck may not be able to handle the strain the feeling that one has become diffused into the atmosphere without a center purpose function sense of direction or even of will a feeling of joy and gratitude beyond what is normally possible welling through one's being the sense of discovery of that which one has most needed the profound sense of coming home a quiet awe like the stillness after a great storm and rapturous transcendent highs that make anything that happened after the a and p seem like dry toast remember how i said in the section on the psychic powers that strong concentration and intent make magical things happen just after the attainment of a path particularly the first path is the time when formal resolutions have an outrageous amount of power the buddha said that the greatest of all powers is to understand and then teach the dharma meaning to attain to full realization however you define it and then to help others do the same i have been advised to use this unique period in my practice as well and i resolved to attain full enlightenment for the benefit of all beings as quickly as was reasonably possible despite all the complex consequences of having done so i do not regret my decision in the least and highly recommend that you do the same on subsequent passes through fruition of that path the mind tends to be refreshed bright quiet and clear for a while the milder forms of the above listed phenomena may occur it is as though someone hit the reset button and cleared out all the junk for a little while there is a nice bliss wave that tends to follow and may take a few seconds to develop if you have not learned the concentration state yet doing so in the afterglow of a fruition can make them much easier to attain and master sixteen review in this stage the meditator just keeps practicing largely as before in this way they will learn to master the stages of insight as they must pass through them again each time they wish to reattain fruition the first few times through the cycle after the path has been obtained can sometimes be quite intense and even very disturbing as the mind tends to be exceedingly powerful for a few days after a path has been gained and yet is navigating in territory that is not yet mastered one is advised to be somewhat careful and perhaps very restrained in what one says and does during the few days and perhaps weeks after attaining a path or something that one thinks may be a path however it also sometimes happens that realizations are hardly noticed at all or if they are noticed there is simply the sense well i guess that's done powerful cycles and the sense that things have been completed are not sure signs that a progress of insight has been completed that said when a progress of insight is completed one may notice the mind simply not doing lots of useless things it used to do and it may seem impossible that it even was able to do them however it may take some time to figure out what the permanent implications of the path are and what is just a product of its lingering and transient afterglow it is likely to take quite a while to really integrate the understandings that come from a path into one's way of being in the world mixed in with the sense of what is different is also a growing sense of what hasn't been changed at all what aspects of reality are still basically unenlightened and poorly perceived after attaining the early paths what has remained untouched by that level of understanding is usually fairly obvious however one of the difficulties with attaining higher levels of enlightenment is that the sense of what is left to do can become more and more vague and subtle again give things time be patient it can sometimes take a while perhaps weeks months or even years to clearly see which understandings hold up under the pressure of the world and which fade you might not get a clear sense of the limits of this path until you are well on your way to the next one speaking of the world review is a great time to re-engage with the specifics of our life it is an unfortunate but true fact that one of the possible side effects of the restless focus on the three characteristics that produces these spectacular insights is the habit of not paying much attention to the specifics of our life the specifics of our life are obviously very very important and so now is a great time to pay a lot of attention to them those around us may have noticed the side effects of the dark night or some of the other stages 
and be worried about us, or even mad at us for how we behaved if we allowed too much to bleed through. It is not always possible to make up for that sort of damage, but now is a good time to try. Take the time to heal the old wounds you have discovered in yourself or created in your life while you were in the dark night. Also, go out and have some fun. Enjoy the richness of friendship, exercise, leisure, work, entertainment, service, and life in general. In short, do your best to make your life a great one in the conventional sense. You should have been trying to do that all along, but try to forgive yourself and learn from your mistakes if you are not able to do so. Remember, the kind of renunciation that brings insights is the true nature of things. If you can see the true nature of the sensations that make up a fun and healthy life, there is no need for any other type of renunciation. In fact, buying in to a strong renunciation trip is well known for making people quite neurotic. And then the challenge is to see the true nature of the sensations that make up the renunciation-induced neurosis. I'm not convinced that this is an easier way to go. After attaining a path, particularly the early ones, the feeling that one is particularly special is common, and from a certain point of view it is true and understandable. However, what is truer is that something in the understanding of the relationship to ordinary things is now special, or at least somewhat unusual. The attainment of stream entry or a new stage of awakening should be a cause for joy and celebration. Unfortunately, people who have never attained these things tend to react oddly or even poorly to such disclosures and sentiments. Strangely, many people are very excited about the idea of people getting enlightened, but not the idea of you getting enlightened. Those with higher levels of understanding than yours will know where you are coming from, but will also know how much farther there is to go from their own experience, and their tendency to focus on that can be frustrating. One's teachers and more advanced companions may find it amusing to be reminded of what it was like to be caught up in the fascination with low levels of realization, but they know that eventually even that has to be seen in some other way. One of my favorite Chagyam Trungpa lines is, You will never be decorated by your guru. Even if you are, I doubt if it will be of any great benefit to you. Thus, two ironies of the spiritual life that one can encounter here are that success can cause feelings of isolation and that the spiritual path can be a very lonely one indeed. Sometimes writing can help as can finding those few people who seem simultaneously to be interested in hearing the details of what you are going through without reinforcing your fascination with these in ways that make it harder to see successes in their proper proportion. It is also not uncommon to feel that what one has experienced is just so staggeringly profound that no one is likely to have ever really seen such amazing things, perhaps including one's teachers. However, if they are the real deal and qualified to teach you, they are very likely to have their own extensive list of spectacular and profound experiences and realizations. However, as such things are so rarely discussed openly, one may have a hard time believing this. As I have had to learn the hard way, those who are particularly prone to extroversion and immoderate speech in the face of recent insights can easily get themselves into somewhat embarrassing and humbling situations. On the other hand, eventually you may begin to outgrow or surpass your current teachers in understanding and ability. This in and of itself can be confusing and frustrating, causing role reversals that not everyone handles well. You might be astounded at how easy it is to bruise the egos in the conventional psychological sense of those who have seen through the illusion of the ego in the high Dharma sense. As review continues, one gets very familiar with the territory of one's current path and its stages, and they may pass by more and more quickly and easily. It can begin to seem that the only way to move through the review stages of insight is not to investigate reality too closely. At some point, fruition will no longer be as attractive, and one will feel that one really should be practicing more clearly and precisely. This is a strong sign that the next set of stages is ready to arise. That said, 
There may be times when one simply doesn't want to make progress as one can't afford to risk another dark night at that point in one's life. Strong resolutions to stay in review, a lack of really precise investigation and lots of indulgence in concentration states can help one stay until one is ready to move onward. However, progress of some kind can only be postponed for so long, and the Dharma has a relentless way of pushing us onward. THE VIPASSANA JANUS The Vipassana Janus are a way of describing the stages of insight that is a bit more broad than the map that breaks the stages down into the sixteen jnanas. They are two descriptions of the same territory, and both have their uses. The Vipassana Janus differ from the concentration Janus, Samitha Janus, in that they include the perception of the three characteristics, rather than the pure Samitha Janus that require ignoring the three characteristics to get them to appear stable and clean. However, the two may share many qualities, including very similar widths of attention and other aspects. There are eight Vipassana Janus, the first four that are formed and the last four that are formless, with the odd exception of the fact that the eighth Vipassana Jhana, neither perception nor yet non-perception, cannot be easily investigated, as it is generally too subtle to clearly reveal the three characteristics. Thus calling it a Vipassana Jhana is a bit problematic. However, it is part of the standard pattern of progress, so is worthy of inclusion, and helps to explain some of the material found in the old texts. Remember how I mentioned in the chapter called Concentration versus Insight that the original texts used the same four or eight jhanas to delineate the states of concentration and the stages of insight? Remember how I said that the delineation of the stages of insight didn't occur until the later commentaries? In the second half of the twentieth century, considerable work was done to try to resolve these maps. As with most terminological issues in the spiritual life, there is some disagreement about just how the jhanas and the stages of insight line up, and I will touch on these in this chapter. The practical application of delineating the vipassana jhanas is that the traps that awaited us in the samitha jhanas can arise during the progress of insight, and so being able to apply the body of advice that deals with these occurrences can be very helpful. For instance, we may be going along in the progress of insight, but get stuck when we stop investigating rapture, which is a part of the early jhanas and also some of the early insight stages. Thus realizing that there are some relationships between Samitha and Vipassana jhanas can keep us on the lookout for aspects of our experience that we may be missing or artificially solidifying, as it is so attempting to do so. Going the other way, if we have some mastery of a set of insight stages, we can use these stages to learn to get into Samitha Janus by concentrating on solidifying their predominant positive qualities. There are also those that say the Jahanas and stages of insight do not line up at all, but this is too doctrinal, not in accord with what one experiences on the cushion or in some other posture and doesn't help resolve the problems created in the original texts of the Pali Canon. For those who are still die-hard traditionalists and believe that the Jahana terminology only applies to pure concentration practices, I offer the following quotation from the Buddha found in my favorite Sutta 111, one by one as they occurred, in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, as translated by Bhikkhu Nyanamoli and Bhikkhu Bodhi, and the states in the first jhana, the applied thought, the sustained thought, the rapture, the pleasure, the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition and mind, the zeal, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred, known to him they arose, known to him they were present, known to him they disappeared. He understood thus. So indeed these states not having been, come into being, having been, they vanish. Those with traditional views can squirm and pontificate any way they like, but this guy is clearly maintaining an extremely fast, consistent, and precise investigation of impermanence, and is thus clearly doing insight practices. 
to digress for just a moment into another rant the guy the buddha is talking about here is none other than my hero sariputta who incidentally is often the whipping boy of much ridiculous and degrading mahayana propaganda don't get me wrong the mahayana has done some great things in its day but ragging on someone with this level of skill and insight is just hypocritical and arrogant beyond reason the buddha says that sariputta goes on to do very precise and powerful insight practices high up into the formless realms and attains to very liberating insights i often hear novu tibetan buddhists making comments that clearly indicate that they feel themselves to be quite qualified to denigrate his practice and don't seem to notice how ironic this is as if they are almost always those whose own spiritual progress doesn't qualify them to lick the muddy sandals of someone with a fraction of sariputta's talents when one in a thousand of the meditators i meet who make these absurd and insulting statements about sariputta can do what he could do or understand what he understood i'll eat this book you have no idea how good it feels to write paragraphs like this one. Back to business. All of this map stuff is only helpful if it keeps you practicing clearly and in a way that brings results. I will discuss more of the pros and cons of maps soon enough. Bill Hamilton's Model The Vipassana Jhana model I like the most because it is the one that most clearly fits with my extensive investigation of the Vipassana Jhanas is the one that was used by the late great bill hamilton he was also quite a mighty meditator in his own right if a highly underappreciated one true he was a quirky old bat on a good day but he also died an arhat and a mighty scholar who had complete mastery of the formless realms there was nothing particularly spectacular about bill's life other than his understanding of it and he died in poverty and obscurity in basic denial of the severity of his pancreatic cancer i never met any one who had given the question of the vipassana jhanas more consideration and his fascination with complex models was remarkable a quick digression here about bill as i dedicated this book to his memory bill hamilton was not only a meditation master he was also a rogue teacher and basically felt like an outcast from the modern international vipassana community the guy was basically too smart, too uncompromising, too scholarly, and too dedicated to non-watered-down dharma and to absolute mastery to be a popular mainstream teacher. He didn't teach to make people feel good about themselves, win friends, or attain to power, fame, or money. His obscurity was a tragic loss for the many people who didn't know about him. However, for me and a few others who knew about him and were willing to put up with the fact that he was basically a strange, suspicious, perhaps paranoid, and fairly quirky dude, Bill Hamilton was just what we were looking for. Bill seemed to live for the sole purpose of sharing his dharma, rather than for flying around the world, making money, or being popular. Unlike the few other Western dharma teachers with his level of mastery, you could call Bill on the phone and talk for hours about this stuff and then you could do it again. His very unpopularity made him a true and accessible teacher. The other nice things about Bill were that he would talk about actual mastery, though you had to drag it out of him, and also had incredibly high standards that I found quite refreshing. Bill also taught in a very interesting way. His style was basically to seem extremely skeptical that any of your descriptions of any experiences could really have anything to do with the attainment of anything. This was basically quite irritating, but it made his students question deeply whether or not they were actually experiencing what they thought they were, and so look more deeply at the truth of each moment. It also served as a helpful counterbalance to his interest in models and specifically named levels of attainment. His teaching style didn't win him any friends, but it was powerful and served his ends. Part of my fantasy is that a bit of his edge, uncompromising attitude, and deep understanding may have come through in his work, though it must be stated explicitly that Bill never let on that he was particularly impressed with anything I ever described in my own practice. Back to discussing Bill's Vipassana Jhana model. This table explains which jhanas fall into which jhanas, and is a rearrangement of the table at the beginning of the chapter on progress of insight. The first vipassana jhana, the nanyas are 
one through three, mind and body, cause and effect, three characteristics. The second vipassana jhana, nanyas four, the arising and passing away. Third vipassana jhana, the nanyas is five through ten, the dark night. Fourth through the eighth vipassana jhana, the nanyas are eleven through fourteen, equanimity, conformity, change of lineage, path. Thus, when in each of those jhanas one can learn something from its jhana aspect, and when in each of the jhanas one can notice what insight territory is available there. Further, as the division between Samitha and Vipassana is not actually not nearly so straightforward as some would make it out to be, there can be a lot of natural movement back and forth that can occur between Vipassana jhanas and Samitha jhanas, even when trying to keep to just one side. As the three characteristics are always presenting themselves, even in seemingly created, blissful, stable Samitha territory, those with strong mindfulness and concentration may have to work to avoid perceiving them. Also, those doing strong insight practice may again and again chance into territory that has a more Samitha feel, and if they are expecting things to be purely by the Jnana descriptions, they may get lost or confused by this. Lastly, those who have attained at least stream entry are constantly cycling through the jnanas from the fourth to the eleventh and then to fruition. So even if they try to do pure samitha practice, the pull towards each next jnana vipassana jhana is strong, and they basically are always from then on doing some fusion of the two even when they try to keep things purely on the samitha side. I will illustrate the Vipassana Janus with a description of some candle flame meditation I did when on retreat and playing around with the Samitha Janus by using Cassinus. Cassinus are various traditional practices that involve using physical objects as colored discs, candles, etc., as a starting point to attain Samitha Janus powers and the like. They are described in the standard references I list in the chapter on the concentration states. The retreat, when I first really nailed down the details of the Vipassana Janus, was a 17-day retreat that I went on when I was an anagami, the third stage of awakening in one of the models of awakening to be discussed shortly. I didn't begin playing with this territory until around the second week of the retreat, and by that point my concentration was very strong and flexible. It didn't take me more than a day before I could go through the following cycle— Initially, I would stare at a candle flame until I really could stay with it. Then there would be a natural shift. I would close my eyes and I would see the visual purple phenomena where the after image of the flame was burned onto my retina. This would fade in a few seconds to be replaced by a red dot in the center of my visual field. The red dot was clear, very round, pure, bright, and seemingly stable. However, within a minute or so, it would begin to shake, roll off to one side, and I would notice all sorts of things about how intention and observation messed with the position, stability, and clarity of the dot. First seeing the dot is the first Samitha jhana, and in this case is the equivalent of mind and body, where mental phenomena became clear external objects. Noticing things about intention, influence in the position, and stability of the dot is cause and effect. Shortly thereafter, this would become irritating, and the dot would begin to shake, shudder, split up, spin off to one side or the other, and generally seem to misbehave quite on its own. This was the entrance to the three characteristics. After a while of this, this practice would shift, become naturally stronger, and this slightly larger red dot would appear in the center again, that stayed there largely on its own, but it had a gold-spinning star in its center that would spin on its own, with the speed and direction that varied with the phase of the breath, which I noticed when I broke my focus enough. This addition of motion, the image happening on its own, and somewhat wider attention, wider dot, not to mention bliss when I broke my concentration a bit and focused on my body, is the entrance to the second Vipassana jhana. The red dot with the spinning gold star would gradually acquire purple, green, and blue rings around its outside, and then there would be a sudden shift where the red dot would vanish and be replaced by a slightly larger black dot. The black dot initially would seem to be a good focus, 
but quickly the area around the black dot got more interesting with many very complex multipoint stars all circling slowly around it getting wider and wider with the interference patterns between them getting more and more complex while the black dot faded somewhat but to what was unclear this addition of a problem perceiving the center but with complex patterns of experience with multiple frequencies going out to the periphery marks the early and middle phases of the third vipassana jhana further as the thing got wider there was this slightly disconcerting feeling that attention was out of phase with the visuals as the complex patterns around the outside began to become more spherical as the edges wrapped around towards me, they began to be made out of lines that had more of a rainbow quality to them, with many complex motions and manifold symmetry. This was harder to pay attention to, and simultaneously comprehend it all, marking the mature third Vipassana Jhana and the later stages of the Dark Night. Note, as this was being done with almost no fixation on psychological content and with very strong concentration, I did not have any of the typical feelings that sometimes accompany this territory when it cycles through with less concentration. Instead, it stayed at the level of geometry, image and light, except when I widened my attention somewhat to notice other aspects. This complex sphere on which was unfolding more and more complex patterns would then shift to something far more inclusive of space and the center of attention, thus becoming much more three-dimensional. At this point, things seemed to happen on their own, but in a silent, clear, all-encompassing way that was way beyond the second jhana, and this marks the entrance to the fourth vipassana jhana. As things would organize, there would arise all sorts of images, from Buddhas to black holes, from brilliantly formed tantric images, to complex, abstract, three-dimensional designs that included the whole field of attention, all made of rainbow lines, luminous, living, and very clear. I could end the cycle with essentially any image I wished, with an ease I had never previously achieved. If I had not previously determined an image to end with, the surprises were just as good as anything I came up with, and sometimes better. The point is that if you get your concentration strong enough, you can do these things also. Shortly after the clear image would arise, attention would shift to include the fundamental characteristics of the whole thing at a level that was perfectly inclusive of what ordinarily would be called subject and object, and fruition would arise as the whole thing vanished through one of the three doors, but with a clarity that is rare. Then I would open my eyes, stare at the flame, and do it all again. Each cycle took about ten to fifteen minutes, but I could linger in each stage for longer if I consciously resisted the pull to move onward. While obviously this example involves very clean submitha like images, very strong concentration, and was done by an advanced practitioner under relatively special conditions, this candle flame technique can be very interesting, and in classes I have taught, some were able to quickly get to the later jhanas without too much time or effort. Some people just seem to have a natural ability to visualize or focus on a mantra or some other object, and it makes a lot of sense to draw on these natural tendencies. It can also be fun to develop these fronts even if this is not your strong suit, as it helps expand the range of your practice. Thus, consider playing around with using other objects and focuses at times, as they can bring different perspectives. To give another example, using a different object, if one is using a mantra, one may notice that at some point one shifts to being able to stay with mantra clearly and perceive it as an object, which is the first jhana, starting with mind and body. Once the mantra is clear, one may notice all sorts of things about the process mentally, creating the mantra, such as the stream of intentions being followed shortly behind the string of the mantra itself, in turn followed slightly behind by the mental echo of the perception of the mantra, making what appear to be three separate streams of the mantra. This is direct insight into cause and effect, and as the three characteristics of each of these streams become clear, the first jhana matures. Then the mantra will shift to presenting itself, and will become very clear, as if it is reciting itself. This is obviously the second jhana, and one may experience A&P-like phenomena around here. 
As the practitioner shifts into the third jhana, the mantra gets wide in the stereo field, complex with interesting harmonies if one is so inclined, and yet it may seem to be out of phase with attention, or it may seem distorted, annoying, like something that was once beautiful but has become noisy. One may experience dark night-related phenomena in this phase. As the shift to the fourth jhana comes, the mantra may become part of a very wide, more quiet background, as attention becomes inclusive. Other fourth jhana-like or high equanimity-like phenomena may occur around here. Thus the vipassana jhana model can really help people line up experiences across objects, traditions, and practitioners, as they get to the common ground of spiritual terrain in a more fundamental way than the jhanas may as those with strong concentration abilities may dodge a lot of the emotional side effects that are emphasized by that map, and those using different objects may experience that same fundamental territory in ways that are quite different from my descriptions. However, now that you know the Vipassana Janus, if you practice well or ask good questions of those you speak with, you should have a much easier time of lining things up and making sense of things. Another thing that can help is noticing that each jhana has its smaller aspects that can be classified in a manner different from the jhanas, and here I refer to what Bill labeled the sub-jhanas. As I mentioned in the section on the Samitha jhanas, each jhana, vipassana or otherwise, has its sub-phases. Initially, the jhana is new, fresh, clear, but perhaps a bit unsteady as the mind gets used to it first sub jhana then it really comes into its own the second sub jhana then the flaws and limits of the jhana are perceived which is the third sub jhana then there is some sort of balanced synthesis of these that at once allows the flaw and begins to incorporate the pull towards that which comes next the fourth sub jhana in this way it is possible to see models within models within models and if you practice long and clearly enough with the models in mind, you will run into this aspect of things. The warnings about the problems with the models go ten times or more for the sub models and deeper fractal theories of meditation terrain. These are a largely endless subject whose usefulness is debatable and whose perils are well known. Consider yourself duly warned. Fractals Unfortunately, I somehow am not able to keep myself from presenting just a few of the basics of fractal theory here, particularly as it relates to Bill's model. There is also something exceedingly universal about the pattern that I am about to present, and resonances of it are found back as far as his recorded human history, religion, and art. If you consider the first 360 degrees of a sine wave, like a rounded capital italic N, that has been tilted just a bit to the right, you will notice that it starts at zero, goes up in a hill-like way, peaks, descends below where it started in a valley-like way, bottoms out, and then returns to the same level at which it began, but yet further along. Were one walking on this curve, one would have to make effort to climb up the hill. One would then have a spectacular view and a great sense of accomplishment. One might then try to keep walking up to get more of this, but end up sliding down the other side of the hill, farther down, in fact, than where one began. And yet, this is still progress, and could even be somewhat thrilling and even effortless with the right attitude. Just when one gets to the very bottom, trapped in the darkest part of the pit, by finally coming to rest at the absolute bottom, the upward motion begins to happen naturally and one returns to where one was, ground zero, and yet farther on at the same time. A cycle is complete and yet begins again endlessly. This easily correlates with the first four vipassana jhanas, as well as many other obvious cycles, such as those of the sun and seasons, etc. For those trying to correlate the maps of the progress of insight with those of the Tantra's five Buddha families, or those of any number of pagan and nature-based traditions, this should prove most helpful. The first vipassana jhana is climbing up the hill, eager beginnings, hard work, dawn, spring, east, etc. The second vipassana jhana is the giddy high of accomplishment at the top of the hill, high noon, summer, south, etc. 
the third vipassana jhana is the exhilarating and yet scary fall far down the other side into a cool shadowy valley dusk and nightfall autumn west etc the fourth vipassana jhana is coming to rest regardless of where one is and returning to one's origin naturally the cool of the dead of night and early morning winter is the promise of springtime the coming of the new year at the end of the old a time of rest completion and renewal north the correlations with the stages of insight are thus obvious one may also correlate this with some of the models of awakening particularly the four-path model and the simple model of awakening both of which will be explained later interestingly one may begin to see a full cycle of each of these stages in each of the four vipassana jhanas as well with each peak and valley adding or subtracting from the position of the greater wave it is in aspect of for all you incurable model geeks try plotting y equals sine times x plus point two five times sine times four x from x equals zero to two pi on a graphing program you have my sympathy the x-axis is the jhanas and sub-jhanas from one point one to four point four or one point one point one to four point four point four if you want to go into sub sub jhanas unfortunately what goes on the y-axis would be the subject of a book larger than this one and would read like the most difficult works of alistair crawley in short the possible complexity of this model is endless and it is no substitute for practice try not to become an arrogant wit like i did when i was trying to figure out all this stuff esoteric map theory won't win you any friends i have spent way too much time thinking about the fractals and modeling in my own practice in my insecure moments i have considered showing off and writing a book that detailed the hundreds of little parallel patterns that i have noticed over the years how this tiny little stage of some vipassana sub jhana mirrored or was an inversion of another aspect of some other little stage of some other sub sub jhana but i could not come up with any practical use for it at all if you do the technique you will see all of this and more if not reading about it won't help you it's just another content trap but a seductive one for us pseudo intellectuals on the other hand Kabbalah seems to have made related permutations into meditation itself, and those who are particularly inclined to this sort of analysis might want to try taking it as a vehicle for going beyond it. Also, guess where the complex geometric Tibetan mandalas that are supposed to be pictures of the mind or the universe come from? Bingo! Upandita's Model Upandita, one of the greatest modern masters of meditation in the Burmese Theravada tradition, see his work in this very life, doesn't quite agree with Bill and I about how the Jnanas and Jahanas line up, and so I thought that in the interest of fairness I would present his model. In his model, as in Bill's model, the first three stages of mind and body, cause and effect, and the three characteristics all fall within the first Vipassana Jhana. However, he divides the arising and passing away into two Johannes, with the immature phase, when the meditator is still in the grip of the ten corruptions of insight, corresponding to the second Johanna, and the mature phase, when the meditator sees the true nature of the ten corruptions of insight, and crosses the A and P event, as the third Johanna. Everything from dissolution to equanimity then falls into the fourth Johanna in his model, this does accommodate the vague formless experiences that can happen in dissolution as the formless realms come out of the fourth jhana the problem with this map is similar to the problem with the other maps namely that some of the stages of insight tend to suck and the samitha or pure concentration jhanas are always a good time or peaceful thus to say that the dark night stages such as disgust are part of the fourth jhana just rubs the wrong way somehow as it does saying that the three characteristics, which also tend to suck a bit, is part of the enjoyable first jhana. The point is, no matter how you slice it, the correlations are not quite perfect, and insight practice is rarely as pleasant as good old concentration practices. That said, there is something to these models anyway, 
and if you master insight and concentration practices and know a bit of theory, you will see for yourself what they're trying to get at, so get to it. Inklings of One More Model The last model is one that is hinted in at a line in the Visuddha Magga, which states that desire for deliverance, reobservation, and equanimity are one. This cryptic phase may mean many things. One of them is that the content of these three stages is likely to be largely the same, while the relationship to it may change dramatically. It could also be used as justification for a third model that put these three together in the fourth jhana. Further, as the fourth vipassana jhana is about equanimity concerning formations, one might presume that one would have had to perceive formations at an earlier stage such as the previous two, in order to have had the necessary time and experience to come to equanimity concerning them. Go see for yourself and consider which of these three models presented here fits your actual experience, or throw this book and all of its models out the window and investigate the three characteristics precisely regardless of what happens. Actually, such decisions might be better made after reading the next chapter. Section 14. How the Maps Help Now that I have presented the maps of progress of insight, I will reiterate just a bit about how they help and why I went to all of that trouble. I will try to do this in chronological sequence and tie it in with what has been said in Part 1. The maps tell you clearly what you are looking for and explain exactly and precisely why you are looking for it, how that insight helps, and how insight provides the ground for what follows. The same thing could be said of the concentration state maps. If the stages of insight didn't tend to bring up all sorts of unusual raptures and produce such a wide range of potentially destabilizing emotional side effects, there would not be so much need for the maps. You could simply tell people to increase their perceptual abilities until they got enlightened, and they would likely have few difficulties in doing so by properly applying the techniques. However, the insight stages do tend to cause these sort of effects, so the maps are very useful for keeping people on track in the face of them. Remember long ago in the chapter called The Seven Factors of Enlightenment, when I mentioned that the first factor was mindfulness and that this was really good for sorting out what is mind and what is body, and when each is and isn't there? That is because the first insight you are looking for the one that gets you in a position to see more deeply is stage one, mind and body. Get it? This stuff is not random or arbitrary. It is all clearly laid out in a way that helps and fits with reality. Remember how I said in that chapter that one should try to experience the intentions that precede actions and thoughts, as well as the mental impression or consciousness that follows all sensations? That is the understanding in stage two, cause and effect. Thus mindfulness is the first factor of enlightenment because it leads directly to the first two classic insights into the truth of what is actually going on. If you want insight into something, then looking into that aspect of things is precisely the best way to acquire that insight. Once one has directly experienced these two insights, then the three characteristics begin to become obvious in stage three, the three characteristics which is exactly why the next factor of enlightenment is called investigation of the truth, as in the three characteristics. Both the seven factors of enlightenment and the insight maps tell you exactly what you are trying to understand and why. Their order is not arbitrary in the least. You will not be able to understand the three characteristics directly without sorting out what is mind and what is body and the relationships between them. Without understanding the three characteristics, regardless of what you call them, you will not be able to go further and will not be able to get enlightened. The Buddha laid it all out step by step. While this may seem unromantic and perhaps even dry, it is also exceedingly practical and without a doubt the clearest presentation of exactly how to wake up that I have ever seen presented in any spiritual system. Just so my biases are made perfectly clear. In short, these maps and techniques can be profoundly empowering. Once the three characteristics begin to come clear, 
the mind naturally speeds up and becomes more powerful. This is because it finally begins to draw on its tremendous power to see things directly without processing them through thought. Anyone who has driven a car, played a video game, or done just about anything else for that matter, knows that you just have to do it. But if you tried to think about every little thing you were doing, it would be impossible. This increase in mental power, due to non-conceptual and direct experience, is related to the third factor of enlightenment, energy. Energy may now even be blazing up and down one spinal cord. The mind gets bright and alert, and soon energy is flowing naturally as one begins to enter the early part of stage four, the arising and passing away. Remember how this correlates with the second Samitha jhana, where applied and sustained attention or effort are no longer needed? They just happen on their own to a large extent, and energy is naturally present. Thus, it all ties together. The next factor of enlightenment is rapture, which comes to predominate the second vipassana jhana, and the arising and passing away, just as it does in the second samitha jhana. Thus, all of the important advice about rapture given earlier applies to the insight maps in part three. One is generally advised to avoid becoming a rapture or kundalini junkie at that stage, although I suppose if that is your primary reason for meditating, it is certainly right to do so. Just be wary of the inevitable crash. During the mature arising and passing away, as well as in dissolution, tranquility becomes important and more pronounced, but then becomes too strong in late dissolution. Thus it becomes important to build the sixth factor of enlightenment, concentration. Finally, when the dark night really kicks in, as it will once can again find one's objects and stay with them, fear through reobservation, then equanimity in the face of all experience becomes vital for progress, as stated in Part 1. Thus, equanimity can arise and that path can be attained. As mentioned before, the maps fill in the seemingly huge, frustrating, and nebulous gap from doing something like sitting on a cushion, paying attention to the sensations of your breath, and finally getting enlightened. The maps also tell you exactly what the common errors of each stage are. They warn people about not getting stuck in mind and body by solidifying it into a jahannic state, which it closely resembles. They provide comfort and explanation when things might get jerky, unpleasant, or even downright painful in Stage 3, the three characteristics. They admonish people not to get too fascinated with how much of a mighty meditator they might feel in Stage 4, arising and passing away, and to even examine the sensations that make up the seemingly wondrous and tantalizing corruptions of insight, such as equanimity and rapture. They warn of the possibility of thinking that one is enlightened when going through that stage, as well as saying that it is normal for wild and sometimes explosive experiences to occur. I spoke with a friend who basically wanted me to help him rationalize that his recent A&P experiences occasionally allowed him to touch high equanimity. My advice was that a much more helpful form of inquiry would be to notice the sensations of fascinations with this issue, and the sensations of the rest of his sensate universe coming and going moment to moment. If he couldn't manage this, he should be putting his time into trying to figure out how to get together enough vacation time and money to do another long retreat, and or how to increase his daily practice time and the thoroughness of his investigation. The maps clearly state that the process is not a particularly linear one, and that after the highs of the arising and passing away, there usually follow times of difficulty, when all of the spectacular power of the mind and the enjoyment of meditation gained in the arising and passing away is likely to fade dramatically. They warn of the numerous difficulties that may or may not be faced in the dark night, as well as provide lots of information about how to deal with them. The most common mistake is failing to investigate the truth of sensations deemed undesirable. It is hard to get on more intimate terms with reality when we feel a bit too emotional, vulnerable, open-hearted or shaken, and so progress in the dark night is not always easy. While I do generally wish to avoid biting the hands that have fed me, I must say that not telling practitioners about this territory from the beginning so as to give them a heads up to what happens is so extremely irresponsible and negligent 
that I just want to spit and scream at those who perpetuate this warped culture of secrecy, while many teachers may not want to do so because they don't think people will ever get this far. That in and of itself is a scary assumption that should cause some serious questioning of their teaching methods, techniques, and perhaps even motivations. Imagine that there is a meditation medication called Damodol that is used to treat some form of suffering. Perhaps it is a pain medicine or an antidepressant. However, in a subset of patients, its long-term use is known to cause pronounced anxiety, paranoia, depression, apathy, micropsychotic episodes, a pervasive sense of primal frustration, pronounced lack of perspective on relationships, reduced libido, feelings of dissatisfaction with worldly affairs, and exacerbation of personality disorders, all of which can lead to markedly reduced social and occupational function. Imagine that these side effects are known to persist sometimes months and even years after someone stops taking the medication, with occasional flare-ups and relapses, with the only permanently effective treatment being to increase the dose, along with supportive care and counseling, and hope that these side effects pass quickly with little damage. Now imagine that you are living in the dark days of paternalistic medicine, during which doctors are prescribing this stuff without fully disclosing the potential side effects, despite the fact that they are fully aware of them. Imagine that drug companies are not forced to disclose known side effects. Does anything in this scenario make you a bit uncomfortable? I should hope so. Let's say for the sake of argument that I'm a fanatic who is blowing this thing way out of proportion. Let's assume that Damatol only causes these effects in one out of every 10,000 patients. Would you have these side effects included on the little piece of paper that comes in the bottle? Let's say it's one in a hundred. At what point does it become absurd for those doctors and drug companies are being allowed to get away with this? Unfortunately, I must admit that I do not know the exact odds of these side effects happening to you. I do know firsthand that they happen, and that if you cross the A and P event, you are fairly likely to run into at least some of them. These side effects are no fantasy. When they show up, they are as real and powerful as if some drug had seriously skewed your neurochemistry, and I often wonder if that might be something like what happens. Thus, it becomes only fair to have the same standards that we apply with such pronounced zeal and fervent litigation to drug companies and doctors, also applied to meditation teachers and dharma books. For reasons unknown to me, this book is the first one I know of to spell out all of these things explicitly in language that everyone should be able to understand, so that you can go into meditation having been fully informed of the risks and benefits and thus make informed decisions about your own practice. In the spirit of professionalism, I call on others who promote the Dharma to adopt a similarly high standard for their own work. Maps point out that people might get stuck for a little while in equanimity if they do not investigate the sensations that make up even equanimity, peace, relief, space, ease, clarity, expectation, confidence, etc., the models also go into great detail about what actually happens in each stage of enlightenment and what does not happen, presented later, though this aspect of the maps is much more controversial than the maps of the progress of insight. Thus the maps at their best tell the meditator in clear and systematic ways exactly what to do, what to look for, why, and exactly how not to screw up at each stage. They are no substitute for clear practice and investigation of the sensations that make up one's experience, and they are poor aids to those who refuse to heed them and follow their advice. As I continue to mention, they can also be used as a basis for useless and even harmful competition between gung-ho meditators with insecurity issues. It can, and has been argued convincingly, that one certainly doesn't need to know all these maps at all so long as one practices well. Despite the dangers of competition and over-intellectualization, the maps still have tremendous value when used as they are meant to be. One very valid criticism of the maps, as I mentioned before, is that people are often very susceptible to suggestion, often called scripting. Describing these stages can cause people to have something that resembles these experiences, 
just because they have been told that they are expected. The part of the maps that deal with the emotional side effects is notorious for causing this particular kind of mimicry. For example, it is basically impossible to sort out what is just fear and what is insight at stage six, which is fear, based upon the presence of fear alone. The aspect of the maps that deals with unusual raptures, both physical and mental, is less suggestible and is a more reliable indicator of the stage of practice. However, the fundamental increases and shifts in perceptual thresholds are extremely hard to fake, particularly if you have access to a map that goes into the extensive details presented here. Shifts in perceptual thresholds are the most reliable markers on the path of insight, the gold standard by which these stages are defined. For example, if you recently saw very fine vibrations that changed frequency with the breath, then had a big zap through spaced out for a while and now feel paranoid with some steady five to seven hertz stuff that quickly leads to chaotic edgy vibrations with complex harmonics that's very likely the insight stage fear thus increasing one's perceptual thresholds in terms of speed consistency and inclusiveness should always be the focus of one's insight practices Skilled teachers who use and are very good with these maps will take into account all three, emotions, raptures, and perceptual abilities, along with the pattern of these that has unfolded previously, and use them to come up with an educated guess as to what is going on with the student. With years of experience, we may eventually get good at doing this for ourselves. I have found that my guesses about my own practice are usually more accurate after I have had a year or two to reflect on what has occurred. The best, most consistent practice I ever did was during a two-week Mahasi Sayadaw-style retreat in Malaysia. This was my third retreat ever, and I knew nothing whatsoever of the maps of the progress of insight, very little theory, and had done almost no reading of the old texts. I was simply doing noting practice. I had been told by a friend that if I noted quickly and accurately all day long, from the time I got up until the time I went to sleep without breaks, then good things would happen. Well, from my point of view, all sorts of strange and largely irritating things happened. However, I just kept noting quickly all day long regardless. Things were getting pretty wild, then things calmed down a bit, and finally I hit a wall. I could barely practice at all. I would sit down and try to note and be walking away from my cushion within a minute and before I realized what was happening. My mind was so tight, irritated, and buzzy that I felt I would soon explode. It was immensely frustrating. That night the abbot played a scratchy old tape of a Burmese monk with a thick accent describing the stages of insight. It blew my mind as he described exactly what I had gone through in the previous thirteen days. I could clearly see how the stages he was describing had unfolded, exactly where I was and what I had to do. I was so astounded that the path could be so reproducible and straightforward that I could just follow moronically simple instructions and have it all happen. Those who want to get lost in the reaction, no, it isn't so simple. Awakening is a great, irretractable mystery. You are lying. It mustn't be so should take a few moments to seriously question exactly how this disempowering and inaccurate view helps them feel good about themselves. They should then take a few moments to find another, more empowering view that helps them feel good about themselves, step up to the plate and hit a home run. With a very high level of faith in the technique and despite the extremely irritating restlessness that arose the moment I sat down, I resolved to sit on the cushion until I had passed re-observation. It was horrible. I noted like crazy anyway. Within five minutes it broke, everything opened up, and fundamental formations arose. Thus, knowledge of these maps is absolutely not necessary for progress, but it may be helpful if it keeps one practicing and helps one realize that what is happening may be perfectly normal. Unfortunately, the story continues on a dark note. I did not know these maps well at the time. I didn't really appreciate what was happening, how close I was to a real breakthrough, and the possible implications of not doing so. The retreat ended one hour later, 
and I had very little time for practice when my rigorous travels resumed. I fell back, back into the dark night, and it began to really screw up my life. I won't go into details, but I will say that I wish I had had access to a friend with a solid understanding of these maps to help me keep what I was going through in perspective. As it was, I was largely blindsided. Since then, I have met numerous people in similar unfortunate situations. The wish to help others avoid such difficult situations was one of my primary motivations for writing this book. It was another six months before I went on retreat again, and luckily, by that point, I wanted nothing in the world more than release. In the month before I arrived, I was lucky enough to have a friend clearly explain the importance of noticing impermanence at a very fine level, and show me some of the finer points of the maps. I hit the retreat determined to practice to the very best of my ability, or die trying. I powered up above the arising and passing away again on day three. I hit dark night on day four, faltered for a few hours, and then simply noted. I knew I was beaten, but I noted. I was weary, tight, and yet volatile, and I noted. I felt I was cracking at the seams, but I noted. I stayed with what was happening, clearly perceiving and reluctantly accepting the sensations that made up my world. The weight lifted, and then the little mush demon Buddha thing showed up. Soon thereafter, I soared effortlessly in realms of pure vibrating suchness, free from the ordinary cares of the world. Soon this became boring, and then I just sat and walked. On day six of my fourth retreat, I got the first taste of what I was looking for, stream entry. There is no way to explain the waves of gratitude that washed over me, except that one small ripple of them was the other part of the motivation for writing this book. As promised, the spiritual path is not a linear one. During the next few days I swung wide from the greatest spiritual highs to the extremes of what can happen during re-observation. My mind was powerful beyond reason, and yet I was a complete novice at this new territory. I was a bit like a sixteen-year-old who has just been given a Ferrari with no brakes and a pair of night-vision goggles. I simultaneously saw myself being staggeringly wise, and also a complete basket case. For the remainder of the retreat, I worked to stabilize, ground, and regroup, so that when the retreat ended, I wouldn't make a complete mess of things. I was only moderately successful. For the next few weeks, I the great stream and her, managed to alienate most of the people who had the misfortune to speak with me for any length of time. Worse, within four weeks I began experiencing the difficult physical raptures of the next set of early insight stages. New territory was showing up, probably because I was still practicing hard, three or four more hours a day, and it was kicking my gung-ho butt. My neck went so stiff in the next third insight stage that I could barely move my head for nine days, and the pain was excruciating. Again, I had no idea what was happening. Many years later, I have come to the conclusion that the best thing to do after attaining the path is to chill out for a while. I did have a senior teacher tell me that much, but he didn't tell me why. Further, I had been advised by a good friend to do otherwise. Lord help us when meditation teachers give us blatantly contradictory instructions— particularly in intensive practice situations. No one had told me that the beginning of a new progress of insight would arise so quickly, or inform me of what it would be like to be trapped in the odd in-between stages by pushing too hard. Again, I wished I had the advantage of knowing someone who was willing to talk about these things honestly. However, despite my continued contact with senior meditation teachers, no one was willing to lay out the practical information that I present here. I had to figure it out the hard way. Was I bitter? You bet I was. Was I simultaneously very grateful to even have these things to be bitter about? Absolutely. Finally, someone gave me the excellent advice. Nail down what you've got. Within a few weeks of relaxing and letting things settle, I was able to backslide to mastery of the previous stages and get on with my life. Despite these rough beginnings and a rough journey beyond them, do I have any major regrets? No. It has been so very beneficial that I cannot possibly explain it. 
I wouldn't be going on and on about these things if they weren't worth it. However, I am a firm believer that if there is enough good information out there, then it doesn't have to be so hard for those that follow. Thus, I present these maps with the hope that they will help people at least have some framework to help them understand the many and varied parts of the path. Further, as absurd as this may sound to some, the maps allow you to plan your spiritual path to some degree. True, there are ultimate points of view that would make this perspective seem quite ridiculous, but indulge me. A sample plan might be this. 1. Go on a three-week retreat and really power the mindfulness and investigation all day long, consistently stretching your perceptual threshold and speed of investigation to its limits to maximize the chances of crossing the A and P event. It is not that hard to cross the A and P with fairly imbalanced effort, so don't worry about that. Remember not to be freaked out by the strange raptures around the A and P. Note, a two- or three-month retreat would give you a great shot at stream entry if you are ready to really practice, so if you are at that level, go for it. 2. Once you have crossed the A and P, dark night stuff will come bubbling up soon enough, and the choice to deal with this on or off retreat will depend on how much time you can devote to retreats and how much intensity you can stand. My vote tends to be for on retreat if you can take the heat. But not everyone can the first time around, and not everyone can easily spare the time. On the other hand, that dark night might just be a cakewalk. Give it a go and find out. In the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition, they typically think that two or three months of diligent noting practice on intensive retreat is enough to get many people to stream entry. But perhaps you do not have the time or dedication to step to that level yet. 3. If you decide to deal with the dark night off retreat, realize that you will likely fall back, but keep practicing an hour or two each day. Do your very best to realize that any of the odd feelings that you may experience are probably just dark night side effects. Try to imitate normal life as best you can, and avoid rash decisions such as sudden and permanent renunciations of things you will want later on. Try to be nice to people and do your very best to keep your stuff from bleeding onto those around you. Find ways to honor and deal with your stuff that don't involve projecting it out onto other people or making a mess of your life. 4. If on retreat, or the next time you can go on retreat, just keep practicing as consistently and accurately as you can and avoid indulging in the content of your stuff at all costs. Put worldly concerns behind you for that period of time and investigate bare sensations with acceptance and bravery. 5. Attain to equanimity regarding whatever arises, but be wary of indifference. This is not always as easy as it sounds, but it could be strangely easy nonetheless. Once the weight lifts, just keep sitting or walking or whatever, with no sense of special effort but keep up gentle, ordinary, and consistent attention to the open field of awareness, with gentle emphasis on the three characteristics. After really getting into high equanimity, stream entry should arise soon enough. If it doesn't, repeat the above cycles until it does. 6. From this point, you are in there, and progress of some kind is now inevitable. This first finger hold on ultimate reality is extremely important as without it you can wander far and wide and yet get nowhere. Advice for what to do next is given later on. 7. It should be noted that in this way of thinking about things, there are only about five stages, and they are relatively simple to identify. The first is before you get any strong concentration, and the advice is to get your concentration stronger through good technique. The second is the first vipassana jhana which involves staying with your objects, getting faster and more direct, and working through basic hindrances. The third is when things get cooking, the A and P, the second Vipassana Jahana, which is usually obvious. The fourth is the dark night, which is usually obvious. The fifth is equanimity, which is usually obvious, though it can be confused with the A and P. The instructions basically are to continue practicing with some awareness of the standard traps of each stage, and let your attention get wider as each new jhana requires. Memorize this basic five-stage framework and the standard advice for each basic stage, 
and you will be a stronger, more independent, competent, and empowered practitioner. One more thing I should mention, and that is what I call the standard pattern. This is the typical way that people progress through these stages, realizing that there is a great range of variation. Typically, people are into meditation because they have already had some sort of experience that has started them on the path, though they may not remember that experience. It was typically at least mind and body, some Samitha Jahana, or more often, they got all the way to the A&P and are now a dark night yogi without realizing it. Others have gotten into meditation for some other reason, such as a difficult emotional event or intellectual curiosity, and then did some sits and or went on retreat, and now they are dark night yogis. While not hard science, I will claim that few that are really interested in the material in this book are not at least dark night yogis. Once one has crossed the A&P in any context, one is likely to cross it again, even if one doesn't practice, though it may be years between events. Thus, they cross the A&P, get all excited about all sorts of things, and then they enter the dark night, and cause all sorts of trouble, may be interested in retreats and practice, may be hard to be around or live with, etc. Unless on retreat, the chances of them getting to equanimity with enough strength of practice to get to stream entry are low, and even on retreat many will get lost in their stuff and stop practicing effectively. Thus they will end the retreat often worse than they began, but not always. Off retreat, these effects fade, the pressures of the world reassert themselves, and people reintegrate to some degree, at least until they cross the A and P again. Typically, this goes on for some number of cycles and years. Some will get on to get stream entry, and those that do tend to do well so long as they realize that they must face the whole thing again and again at each new level of mind beyond that and compensate for those effects. Some will actually have a pretty hard time as the dark nights that follow at the higher paths blindside them. Overall, those who have good instruction have their morality trip together and practice well will do better than those who don't. One last bit of advice for those coming off retreat who are dark nighting hard. Stop practicing for a while and do things to ground down, such as sleep more, eat heavy foods, go to movies. Do hard physical work or exercise, and the like, if you need to function in the real world. It will help the dark night fade more quickly. There is not much useful to be gained for doing just enough practice to stay caught halfway in and halfway out, as that's a tough place to be. Sometimes letting go of letting go is okay. Another concept that helps make the maps make sense is that of shifting baseline. This is easier to see on retreat though it can be noticed in daily life as well, albeit more gradually. While the standard maps say that a practitioner below steam entry must, on each sit or meditation session, begin by attaining access concentration, then work up to mind and body, cause and effect, etc., in a linear fashion, getting as high as they can go on that sit and then falling back, what actually happens is somewhat different. The initial stages of practice those of finding the breath, feet, or other object typically go on for a while until suddenly mind and body arises, which is pretty cool the first time it happens, but it quickly fades in intensity and profundity in subsequent practice periods. Then, while the practitioner may have to build up again to it again and again, they may notice it less and less as their baseline shifts to the next stage, in this case, cause and effect, which will then predominate in sits and situations until they gradually move on from there. In this way, their baseline, meaning the dominant place where they are in the inside cycles, will move forward, sometimes with rapid jumps, other times with long pauses in one area. The predominant emotional, energetic, and perceptual experiences will take on the quality of the meditator's current baseline, jnana, Thus, by the time one is in the A and P, one may barely notice the shifts through the earlier stages, and when one gets into the dark night, the bliss, focus, and clarity of the A and P may feel far away. The equanimity, even though one in theory has to go through all the stages each time one sits, one may barely notice any of them, as equanimity may become the dominant experience of things. 
others on retreat may find that they can power up through the a and p and into the dark night day after day only to flounder when they hit the dark night and the next day they start again even they will gradually notice a shifting baseline as the earlier stages fade and the later ones show more and more of themselves however once one leaves retreat things tend to rapidly regress though the effects of whatever stage one ended on will tend to linger for a while and those who have crossed the a and p who did not manage to get stream entry or the next path will tend to have some dark night element in there somewhere until that fades and they cross the a and p again which as i said can happen off retreat all of this changes on stream entry and is one of the marks of it suddenly rather than a generally upward going baseline with regressions when one leaves retreat the thing cycles with great clarity and rapidity all the way from a and p territory to fruition through one of the three doors and then round again thus this would be a good time to discuss the three doors the three doors insight practice is all about understanding the three characteristics so that when we deeply understand them we may see beyond the three illusions and enter ultimate reality through one of the three doors stages twelve to fourteen and subsequent attainments of fruition at that level of awakening present as radical and complete understandings of the three characteristics at the level of formations at the level of the whole sensate universe lasting three or four moments of one tenth to one quarter of a second each as unpalatable as the three characteristics can seem in the end they are the source and substance of our complete salvation there are three basic ways the doors may present themselves which i will describe shortly at least two of which are combined to produce the experience of entering ultimate reality the third characteristic is considered inferred from the way the other two present but sometimes aspects of that third characteristic will be experienced directly regardless of the way that door manifests there are some common characteristics of doors that point to something beyond all of this they reveal something completely extraordinary about the relationship between the watcher and the watched that it would take a very warped view of the universe to explain though i will try shortly one way or another these fleeting experiences cannot be explained in terms of our normal four-dimensional experience of space and time or within our ordinary experience of a subject and object one way to sort out a door to ultimate reality from an a and p event is that the three doors involve the whole experiential space-time continuum as well as the object of investigation as these become the same thing an integrated whole this does not hold absolutely for a and p events if we are being honest with ourselves as the subtle background of sensations that provide reference points is not completely included further a and p events tend to be very rich and thick whereas there is always a sort of silent luminous transparency to the way the three doors present as stated earlier the a and p event occurs very much as the three doors is then followed by an unknowing event but then there are a few moments usually about three or four as the breath drops all the way to the bottom followed by another unknowing event and a state shift without doubt the clearest and most illuminating experiences of the three doors come from attaining fruition in the formless realms or in the realms of the psychic powers though these are not necessary just very interesting memorable and educational another perspective would say that the three doors always happen at the level of psychic powers but this is a matter of semantics the strength of one's concentration practice and recent continuity of practice will also help determine how clear these experiences are i had to go through them hundreds of times with an eye to exactly how they presented before i was able to write a chapter such as this one the entrance to fruition through one of these doors is always completely unexpected i will explain the aspect that each characteristic lends to each door and then combine these to explain what actually happens when particularly clear experiences of the three quick moments of the three doors occur they can provide fundamental clues that can be used for further debunking of the three illusions as well as explaining where so many of the teachings that try to describe the true nature of things come from for instance 
the impermanence door aspect has to do with mind moments the particle model arising and passing vibrations understanding that from which all this arises and that to which all this returns understanding the source of all reality the universe strobing in and out of existence and that sort of thing when the tibetans talk of non-existence they refer to the fact that all experience is utterly transient the wave model and thus abides or exists not at all but is constantly in absolute flux and ephemeral the impermanence door aspect relates to realizing what is between the frames of the sensate universe or formations and it tends to have a dat that gone quality to it the suffering door aspect has to do with the fundamental attachment dropping attachment like a hot coal that one finally realized one was holding really letting go compassion ultimate bodhicitta the true love of god being purged in the flames renunciation relinquishment feeling the fundamental queasy tension in the illusion of duality for just a bit longer than one ever would normally and that sort of thing the suffering door relates to the mind releasing its fixated hold on the whole of relative reality and allowing it to fall away leaving awareness to discover itself remember these words do not refer to fixed phenomena or experiences it can also feel like the sum total of existence is suddenly ripped away from us the suffering door aspect tends to be the most unsettling or wrenching of the three doors the most death-like the no self or emptiness door aspect has to do with the teachings on the mirror-like nature of the mind the spirit of god moving upon the face of the waters and oh so mystical and overlooked line from genesis god making man in his image merging with a tantric image of a buddha seeing one's original face thinking of who created thought and that sort of thing it relates to directly observing the collapse of the illusion of duality the collapse of awareness into the intelligence or cognition of the perceived it is a bit like staring back at yourself or something intelligent regardless of whether or not it looks like you with no one on this side to be stared at and then collapsing into that image the emptiness door aspect tends to be the most pleasant easy and visually interesting of the three each of these doors has to do with complete understanding of the ultimate aspect of relative reality and thus realizing the ultimate nature of ultimate reality each door also relates in some way to completely countering one of the three fundamental defilements the impermanence door relates to countering fundamental ignorance the suffering door relates to countering fundamental attachment the emptiness door relates to countering fundamental aversion from a true self point of view the impermanence door relates to the permanence of ultimate reality the suffering door relates to the compassionate nature of ultimate reality or the ultimate bodhicitta and the emptiness door relates to the fact that the void is what we truly are in true self parlance at least when i use the word fundamental i always mean something to do with basic illusions of duality or the gradual or sudden elimination thereof thus i use the word fundamental when what i am talking about has nothing to do with specific content emotions physical sensations mind states psychological manifestations or understandings or any other specific and limited categories of sensations i will now try to describe six possible combinations of these three aspects that create the actual experience of the three doors while there can be a lot of variation in the specifics of how these three doors present they will always fall into one of these basic patterns as i stated earlier these events are so brief and sometimes so unclear that persons who have been through them many times may not understand that they present in the way i describe them here when the impermanence aspect predominates and is combined with the emptiness aspect then the whole universe strobes three times quickly with something staring back at us as a minor aspect of that universe and then it seems that awareness collapses into the space after the third gap perhaps turning slightly towards the thing that was staring back when the impermanence aspect predominates and is combined with the suffering aspect 
then the three strobing moments feel wretching and the plunge into the gap feels fundamentally violating like exactly the wrong thing to do when the emptiness aspect predominates and is combined with the impermanence door there are three clear and discreet moments of moving towards or sideways to or perhaps focusing on an intelligent seen image staring back at us except that there is nothing on this side after the third moment the illusion collapses in a very natural and pleasant way the emptiness door predominates with suffering as its second aspect then a very strange thing happens there is an image on one side staring back and then the universe becomes a toroid or doughnut and the image on this side of the toroid changes place as the toroid universe spins the spinning includes the whole background of space in all directions fruition occurs when the two have changed places and the whole thing vanishes when the suffering aspect predominates and is combined with the emptiness aspect again the toroid thing happens except that it can be quite distorted or cone-like the universe can rotate up or down and away from us so that the primary experience is that of an image falling from this side though with the hint that it might be coming back around to this side when the suffering door aspect predominates with impermanence present then the three moments in which the universe is ripped away from us are distinct when the suffering door predominates the experience is always a bit creepy for those working on the higher paths reflecting on the ways that the few moments before fruition have presented themselves can be very interesting and helpful for those working on the last stage of awakening i offer the following advice the special ways that doors can present can seem to imply the following that there is a link between some special and intelligent spot on that side and some transcendent this that is unfindable this is implied by the definable qualities of that spot and certain subtle sensations implying space that there is some space around space some transcendent superspace around the universe that we may try to rest in or imagine is here this is implied by sensations with definable qualities that there is some void-like potential that creates all of this and to which all of this returns this is implied by sensations with specific and definable qualities seeing that these qualities that seem to imply something very special are actually just more qualities that we have misinterpreted as being a potential refuge reveals the refugeless refuge reflecting and investigating in this way the last illusions may fall away and we may attain to the complete elimination of all fundamental illusions or at least the next level of the fractal section fifteen was that emptiness welcome to the world of models states stages and visions of goals to attain the curse and blessing of knowing all of this terminology in theory is that there is a natural tendency to begin to try to apply it to our own experiences and those of others and wonder what was what beyond that not only have i just provided enough information for a few of you to become master posers on the spiritual path i have just given some of you enough information to start obsessing way too much about where you are on the path however this is a trivial danger and why senior dharma teachers do not ever seem to put the important details about sorting out what is what into their books is completely beyond me that it should be left to a young and cocky upstart like myself to fill in this gap is less than ideal note when i use the word emptiness in the title of this chapter i am using it specifically to refer to a fruition and in this case generally to mean stream entry and not any other meaning emptiness has many other meanings but this is the specific one i care about at this moment there are all sorts of pitfalls that can occur but perhaps the most significant of them all is calling experiences emptiness fruition stream entry or nirvana that simply weren't it is a mistake that we are all likely to make more than once if we practice fairly well know these models and care about them in the least 
and even very enlightened beings with years of practice will sometimes wonder, was that emptiness? Meaning, was that my hit? Or was that the next stage of awakening? Some of us will be particularly prone to blowing this on a regular basis, even if we are actually somewhat enlightened. Take heart. Failure can be a great teacher. The first and perhaps most important point is that from a certain point of view, it is not an important question. If you have actually gotten enlightened to some degree or attained a fruition, the permanent benefits of that have occurred regardless of whether or not you are certain about it. On the other hand, if you haven't gotten enlightened but think that you have, it is worth being able to come back to reality. The range of clarity with which the three doors to fruition present themselves can be quite wide. Sometimes, even if it was actually the attainment of fruition, there may not have been enough clarity at the time for one's memory of the way that particular door presented, and of the depth of the discontinuity to be clear enough to satisfactorily answer the question. There are also a large number of possible momentary unknowing experiences that can present in ways that seem convincingly like the attainment of fruition, even for meditators with years of experience with these issues. I will mention some of the most common events that can be mistaken for fruition here, though this is far from being a complete list. Momentary experiences of the formless realms that arise in Insight Stage 11, equanimity, particularly nothingness, and neither perception nor yet non-perception, are common culprits. However, if one is this close, the real thing is very likely to occur sooner or later. Formless experiences arising from pure concentration practices have fooled people for millennia into thinking they were fruitions. As mentioned earlier, in Sight Stage 4, the arising and passing away, particularly the arising and passing away event itself, is a pernicious trickster and has fooled countless practitioners throughout the ages into thinking it was fruition or the attainment of a path. This may even fool somewhat enlightened beings who are working on the next path. Note, the A and P event typically shows up once per path unless a long period of time goes by without practice after it, whereas fruition is likely to be repeated naturally. Unusually heavy experiences of insight, stage 5, dissolution can be formless and murky enough to fool some meditators on occasion, as can any really dramatic shift between any of the Vipassana or Samitha Johannes, as these involve three or four impulsions or mind moments, followed by a momentary unknowing experience. Even the first shift into insight stage one, mind and body, can fool some novices if it happens dramatically enough, and they get fascinated with how unitive, pleasant, and clear the stage can be after the first shift into it. Often, it is not possible to make a clear call about what was what, even if it was actually fruition. While what follows is routinely considered to be dangerous information, I am happy to go to the far extreme of telling largely taboo secrets if it helps to balance the pervasive mushroom culture. These are some basic guidelines that may be used when trying to answer the question, was that emptiness? If there was any sense of an experience, even of nothingness or something that seemed incomprehensible, particularly anything involving the vaguest hint of the passage of time during it, write it off as something other than emptiness. This is an absolute rule. Similarly, if there was any sense of a this observing a that, or a self of any sort that was actually present for whatever happened, write it off as something other than emptiness. If you were there, that wasn't it. If there was not a complete sense of discontinuity, and if it makes any sense to think of time, space, perspective, or memory continuing across the gap, write it off immediately as something other than emptiness. On the other hand, if the only way to remember what happened involves remembering just forward to the end of the particular door that presented, and then remembering back to when reality reappeared, well, keep reading. If on continued repetition of the unknowing event over days or weeks, it fails the above tests, write it off as something other than emptiness. 
if continued repetition of that particular kind of unknowing event over days or weeks fails to give any clear experiences of the three doors or to reveal something very paradoxical and profound about the nature of subject and object be skeptical if there was a double dip into unknowing events with a few profound moments of clarity and altered experience between them as is characteristic of the a and p event with one shift happening halfway down the outbreath and a second shift at the end of that outbreath write it off immediately as more likely having been that or maybe the early stages of equanimity if the event cannot be repeated write it off those who have attained a path will attain more fruitions naturally maybe one to many per day as they basically can't help but cycle if there is not a rather predictable pattern of stages and perspective shifts that begins to become clear, specifically following the course of the progress of insight listed above in some way, particularly as regards shifts in perceptual thresholds, write it off as something other than emptiness. This brings me to the cardinal rule when trying to sort out what all experience or attainments actually were. Try to repeat it again and again, and be honest with yourself. It literally took me thousands of times through these cycles and experiences at many levels and over many years to get to the point where I could even begin to think about writing a book like this one. I am still quite cautious about hanging my hat on interpretations of my experiences, or what seem to be non-experiences, until I have attained them fifty, a hundred, or even more times. If you don't have the necessary level of clarity and mastery to repeat the experience of interest again and again, either do enough clear and diligent practice to attain the required mastery, or don't ask the question. Studying theory can only be so useful for this. In the end, and always, it is practice and continued direct experience that reveals and clarifies. While it is somewhat true that with clarity comes mystery, this maxim can easily be used as a cop-out. A related question is, am I enlightened? I have met a number of people recently who have exhibited a common but unhealthy fascination with this question, toying with the possibility that they were enlightened in past lives, whatever, were enlightened in earlier life and repressed it, not, were enlightened by interesting experiences that were bound up in time and space, whoops, such as A and P events formless realm experiences, visions of beings, unusual raptures, etc. For these sorts of people, as well as those working on higher paths who are stuck in the in-between stages, I offer the following. The first thing one must know about enlightened beings is that fruition occurs for them, and they do so naturally and fairly often. True, there may be sometimes an initial period after first attaining a path when they might not happen so often, the range being from once every day to once every week or so at the very longest. However, fruitions are largely unavoidable. It would take a lot of consistent work to keep them from happening, and if one lets one's guard down, they would show up again quickly enough. In fact, the longer one goes without a fruition, the more the pull towards that which is not any of this intensifies. Even those who are working on the next path will typically have reoccurring fruitions from the current path sneak in, even if they don't want them to. This is one way to distinguish A and P events from fruitions, as A and P events quickly diminish in intensity, fade quickly as the focus of one's practice, and fail to provide the consistent sense of release, ease, and sense of well-being that attaining a fruition does. Before enlightenment, the meditator always had to develop access concentration, attaining mind and body, and working from there every time they meditated, unless practicing very strongly, often, and well, when one may be able to keep up enough momentum to avoid falling back to the beginning. After attaining the path, one begins at the level of the arising and passing away, and proceeds with much more skill and confidence. Simply reflecting on reality, even slightly, will result in a nearly instantaneous shift to a mind and body-like state. At a whim, one can begin meditating at the level of the A and P, beginning with the double-dip state shift at the middle and then end of the outbreath that is the hallmark of that stage. Thus enlightened beings can perceive vibrating phenomena at a whim. 
In that same vein, the cycles of insight from stages 4 to 11 and then 15 always influence the conscious life of those who are enlightened. They are inescapable. They cycle endlessly in one's waking hours and even when dreaming. They subtly or overtly color one's mood, energy level, and perception of the world. As soon as a fruition is attained, the cycle starts again and proceeds, though the timing and obviousness of this fact may be somewhat variable depending on how much one is practicing, what is going on in one's life, and how good one is at noticing the qualities of these stages. Even when doing concentration practices, these cycles are in the background somewhere. It is possible to ignore them to a large degree for a while, when in deep Samitha Johannes, though it takes work to do so. I remember lying down to take a nap after lunch when on retreat in India a few days after my first fruition. Before I knew it, meditation was occurring. The cycles were showing themselves in order without any effort or even invitation. They had their individual qualities as much as I have explained above, though they moved fairly quickly from one to the other, and about forty-five minutes later fruition occurred. Soon thereafter it was obvious that the cycle had started again. Do you cycle naturally through the cycles of insight from stage four to stage eleven and then attain fruition? If you just sat down on a cushion and did nothing special, would you move through these stages as easily as falling down a hill? Do fruitions arise after such cycles in a way that fairly consistently leaves you with the staggering impression that was it? If not, I would avoid harboring any notions that you are enlightened, have been enlightened sometime in the past, etc., as you are almost certainly in error. Such notions are not helpful most of the time anyway, and tend to be bound up in a sense of solidity and imagined continuity of self that is simply unrealistic. I have a friend who erroneously thinks he is enlightened, and once said, Oh, yes, I went through those stages once many years ago, but now I am beyond them. Toast. Those who are enlightened go through these stages hundreds, if not thousands, of times each year. There is absolutely no getting around them, barring deep sleep, severe brain damage, strong sedation, or death. However, it is fair to mention that some enlightened people simply don't think about things in this way, have never noticed that they cycled, never picked up on the patterns, were never exposed to the maps, don't have particularly strong concentration, don't realize how they got there, are not particularly intellectual, or, if they are, never applied their intellect to these aspects of where theory meets practice, never really paid attention to the way things unfold, and couldn't care less. Thus, if someone is enlightened, I brazenly assert they cycle like this, but that doesn't mean they realize they do, and if their practice unfolded gently or slowly, or without very intense concentration and a map-oriented focus, they may have no idea about most of the things I am discussing here, and yet they apply to them anyway. I poured massive amounts of energy into my practice, developed very strong concentration, and care about the maps obsessively, but that doesn't mean that other beings who are enlightened did or do. Back to describing the cycles. As review sets in, it can seem that one can control these cycles and stages. It may seem, after we have mastered a path somewhat, that we can call insight stages up in order and stay with them as long as we wish, or even call them up out of order. From one point of view, enlightened beings can master and manipulate the stages of insight, though such practices can take on much more of a Samitha feel than an insight feel. From another point of view, perhaps a more thoroughly insight-oriented point of view, even such a notion is erroneous. Stages, cycles, and the empty intentions to manipulate them occur in a casual fashion, and if there is a sense that there is an independent self that is controlling them, then there is obviously more work to do. Now there's a high standard and worthy standard indeed. These cycles, as with everything else, simply belong to the nature of things. Beyond the first path, what's next? Obviously, it can be easy for a meditator to think that they have completed a progress of insight and gotten stream entry when in fact they haven't. 
it is also possible for a meditator to have actually completed a progress of insight and yet think otherwise, but this is much less common. Sometimes a practitioner will be correct in thinking that they have, but their teachers will remain unconvinced. Sometimes a teacher may think that the student has and yet be wrong. Regardless, just keep practicing and see what happens. This is the most fundamental principle of all these stages. A particularly useful traditional guideline is to wait a year and a day before completely making up your mind. This is slippery stuff sometimes, and many states and stages can easily fool a student or teacher into thinking that they are something they are not. When a meditator successfully completes a progress of insight, they have permanently debunked certain illusions to some degree, but many remain. These tend to include a new fascination with the understanding that has arisen from that path. However, if one's realization doesn't stand to the test of time, or if there is not some sort of fundamental and unalterable reduction in suffering, write it off and keep going. Even if one does complete a progress of insight, it is easy to imagine that more has been debunked than actually has. So continue to practice training in morality throughout your life as before to avoid being bitten by those unskillful potentials that remain but are hidden. Strangely, the temptations to screw up can become more subtle and seductive as practice deepens. These tend to be at their worst around the next arising and passing away or during the next reobservation. An extended series of progresses of insight tend to proceed as follows. They may be called paths in the Theravada and Bahumis in the Tibetan, though there are some problems that arise in trying to resolve the inconsistencies in these two models that will be touched on a bit later. Thus, a more general treatment follows, and the description of the stages here are not taken directly from any particular tradition. From one point of view, all of this is not necessary information, as continued practice just as before will continue to move things along quite naturally. On the other hand, if one has expectations about what might come next that are not in accord with reality or interfere with practice, then this information might be helpful. The meditation masters of this stage of awakening by continued practice as before. They can quickly learn to rise through all of the stages, starting from the rising and passing away, through the dark night, up to equanimity and fruition in a single setting, or even during some of the activities of daily life. Merely sitting down on a cushion, or being awake for that matter, will involve naturally moving through these cycles, though the speed and clarity of these can vary widely depending on the practitioner and circumstances. They may even find it interesting to purposefully hang out in some of the stages of the dark night, just to learn more about them and from them as they have some very important lessons to teach, and are very interesting territory. However, they may also come to realize that this is really just a new beginning in some ways, sort of like graduating from high school, but then becoming a lowly freshman in college. The period after completing a progress of insight, and after gaining some strong sense of mastery of its stages, is also a great time to work on one's concentration practice abilities. The reason for waiting is that concentration practices and insight practices tend to have a certain inertia to them. If you have recently been trying to get into really stable samitha states, this can make it harder to see things flicker for a while. If you have recently been training hard to see things flicker, it can be hard to get into really stable samitha jhanas. Thus, what you don't want to do is to gunk up the natural mastery phase of your practice until you are comfortable enough in these stages to get stuck in one and not have it be a big deal. This usually takes at least a few weeks, but this is a very crude guideline, and everyone is different regarding issues of timing. Judge for yourself how well you handle the stages such as reobservation, and decide if you would be all right if you got stuck in it for a few hours. The time after gaining some mastery of these stages is also a great time to work on one's stuff. Actually doing concentration practices and working on one's stuff go very well together, as concentration states tend to cause our stuff to come bubbling to the surface where we can work with it. 
the time during a mastery phase is also a great time to make sure that one's daily life is functioning well particularly if one made a mess of it while trying to get enlightened or more enlightened mastery of these stages tends to peak at some point and the sense can arise that one has really got it fruitions tend to occur fairly quickly clearly and easily given time and practice the meditator may begin to become somewhat bored with our current level of attainment and with their ability to attain these stages and fruition. Their practice can begin to seem sloppy, and the quiet bliss wave after fruition can diminish somewhat unless they do not attain it for some long period of time, which would probably require resolutions to that effect. The understanding that there is more suffering to uproot grows they begin to see more levels of reality that are clearly not well understood or illuminated by their current understanding, hints of which probably showed themselves very soon after their attainment of that path. Subtle thoughts and mental patterns may be noticed at the edge of one's perceptual threshold. Attention begins to incline towards the next level of reality that must be understood and away from familiar territory. More fresh insights begin to show up. The meditator begins to investigate reality with more effort and clarity as before, and begin a new progress of insight from the beginning, something like access concentration, and then mind and body and the rest. This might play out as follows. Fairly soon after the sense of strong mastery, one will simply be meditating along, perhaps a fruition will occur, and then suddenly the mind drops into this new state, rather than a new review cycle beginning again. It is stable, interesting, and somewhat Jahana-like. It is sort of like re-inhabiting one's life or reconnecting with the sense of the observer. It is also likely the next mind and body. This could also happen when one was just going about one's day. The postural obsession, odd movements, strange tensions and pains, emotional volatility, vibratory stuff that seems new a fresh and clearer sense of what is dualistic perspectives remain and all of the other early progress of insight stuff may arise in its time naturally and perhaps sooner than one might wish the phrase leading onward is often used to describe the wisdom that arises from dharma practice strangely it is a phrase and a fact that i have cursed just as often as blessed and entering new insight territory at inopportune time or before one feels ready can reveal why insight cycles can sometimes be very traumatic and it is often advisable to take a break to recover one's sense of humor and appreciation of life before plunging on however at this point the dharma waits for no one and may plunge on regardless of your wishes note well those of you between stages there initially is still the ability to attain easily in any of the previous stages starting at the level of the current arising and passing away, so things can get quite murky if you are trying to figure out what stage you are in, or attain specific new stages. It can be as if the early stages of the new progress of insight, one through three, are opening up to us, whereas for a while things always started out at the level of the arising and passing away. Fixating on thoughts about what stage you are in is guaranteed to cause some degree of suffering that is worthy of investigation, especially in the in-between stages, though a gentle awareness of the maps can still be slightly useful. There can be a sort of a fork in the path for a while, with the meditator seemingly able to choose whether to review previous stages or press on. It can seem as though the background is solidifying, and the mind is growing noisier as well as less predictable and skillful. More of our stuff is suddenly bubbling up to the surface. We notice subtler thoughts and mental images, many of which we may wish we hadn't. We may feel less enlightened, as if our realization were fading. Clear and consistent insight practice, such as understanding the three characteristics of all types of sensations, which includes thoughts of maps and goals, is the only thing that finally helps, just as before. After the meditator crosses the next arising and passing away event, which may happen relatively quickly if they practice well and often, they will tend to have a very hard time reattaining fruition for a while. One may meditate along and then get stuck in a stage that seems to lead nowhere 
and is sort of like low equanimity in that there are clear vibrations that are not varying with the breath or any other movement and yet the background is too dense noisy and poorly perceived for clear and complete formations to show themselves finding the proverbial fork in the road to familiar territory can now be quite tricky and even if they do find the way back the old territory is unlikely to be particularly appealing old fruitions may arise but they may do so in a way that is less reliable or certain suddenly the meditator is on the right again and will soon have to face the fullness of the next dark night with all of its implications it may even be more challenging than before but could just as easily be less so a friend of mine sailed through one dark night in about six minutes and the next one took him many years there's no predicting these issues of timing it can happen that many times they will try to meditate to equanimity but fall back when they get to re-observation they may thus try to reattain previous stages as they may feel in over their heads they may get on to the next stage of desire for deliverance wish very strongly to go beyond all of this and do so by reattaining to a fruition of the current path instead of attaining the next one however even if they are able to retreat to the old territory they will still be haunted to some degree by the dark night in their life and will have to learn to navigate skillfully in this territory one way or another sometimes remastering the current path is helpful for building a sufficient foundation from which to proceed well into the new territory eventually there is no way to go back and one is simply left facing the new territory without an obvious skillful escape route there can arise an odd phenomena that has been referred to by one of my teachers as twelfth path though this phrase is not in common usage it is however a common phenomena in those who have attained at least stream entry and is probably the most important concept in this book for those working on the higher paths particularly beyond the second path twelfth path is making a joke about the fact that there are at most four stages of enlightenment in the theravada map and five or ten in the tibetan maps however it can easily be seen that more than ten brand new and full-blown cycles of insight have been completed and yet there is still much more to go if one is going to get obsessed with the fractal model that i mentioned earlier it is likely to happen around here unfortunately the fractal model is even more useless now than it was earlier and so i strongly recommend avoiding it like the plague if you think you are in a new progress cycle rather than a review cycle things might proceed as follows it seems certain that a cycle has been completed next there seems to be a clear mastery stage that withstands all of the most rigorous tests then more early progress of insight stuff shows up the cycle begins to go around again perhaps with more backsliding moving forward falling back again remastering the old territory more progress and suffering shows up with its associated struggles and rationalizations then there comes a sense of there being no other option but progress and acceptance and finally the sense that the cycle has completed itself soon enough there is a clear sense of a mastery stage and so on in this way it may seem that some large number of paths or behemoths have been attained twelve in the joke when in fact they have not or have they unfortunately this is a tough question and one that cannot easily be resolved one may think that one is now at a higher stage of realization that is clearly different from before but the magic numbers four or ten simply may not seem to apply to one's journey it can also happen that with increased clarity and progressive deepening of one's practice distinct progress of insight patterns may seem to be repeating within each of the smaller units of the larger pattern of the progress of insight very much in the way of fractals as detailed earlier beware do not get sucked into identifying with these idealized states as actually being where you are new progress cycles and their accompanying vagueness can be very confusing if we are fixated on models but are not aware that the in-between territory is nearly impossible to map successfully in real time 
we may sometimes feel that we have just gone through the larger progress of insight cycle when we may have actually gone through only a small part of it we may begin to think we see first second third and fourth vipassana jhana aspects of each of the four larger vipassana jhanas we may even begin to see patterns similar to those of a full progress of insight within each of the stages of the larger progress of insight or even within parts of each stage a similar observation can arise in concentration practice with the samitha jhanas but this tends not to be nearly as problematic or dramatic i have come to the conclusion that fear anxiety confusion indecision and even certainty about these issues are clear markers of what needs to be investigated such as those things themselves in this way these aspects of suffering have become trusted friends clear signposts and red flags as well as aspects of the goal which is the path in the end the more we realize that those very processes are it those very sensations are it the closer reality is to understanding itself the closer reality is to understanding itself the less fundamental suffering there is i have also come to the conclusion that the best reason to take these detailed maps to this extreme is that eventually they become way too ridiculous and cumbersome thus eventually they can be laughed at and yet make their few useful points also while leaving us with no option but to be with reality one aspect of which is the sensations that make up thoughts about maps we can learn to laugh at ourselves and our deep-seated but futile desire to simplify fresh patterns of sensations and solidify them into a sense of attainment that we have on the darker side when we are unable to do this unable to laugh at our deluded attempts to fix or freeze a sense of what some illusory we has done or attained the phenomena of the twelfth path and the complexity of the territory between paths can cause considerable doubt pain frustration and cynicism the flip side of which is grandiosity the more afraid we are of not making progress the worse these sorts of feelings can become the more we compare our practice to the misunderstood sensations that make up the sense of others the more needless suffering arises these sensation patterns must be investigated clearly and seen as they really are as always when this all ends is a subject of considerable controversy though like an idiot i'm going to take on the topic of full enlightenment shortly anyway it should be noted that a long-term view is very helpful sometimes particularly if it helps one just be with what is happening today it will often not be clear which event was actually the new arising and passing event or which event was really a new path until one has the benefit of a few more months or years of practice one may experience many strange events state shifts insight and profound openings all of which can be very compelling for some period of time however there tend to be just a few of these memories that on careful reflection stand out in the mind as being really significant and by which one can clearly mark permanent shifts in one's fundamental relationship to the experiences of life and the world in the next chapter i will lay out a number of models of awakening that involve various numbers of shifts in understanding one may be tempted as i foolishly have been to count the landmark events in one's practice and try to correlate them with these models based purely on the number of them that seem to have occurred this is a setup for trouble so please learn from those who have learned the hard way and do not try it as tempting as counting paths can be a vastly superior form of inquiry and investigation is to examine carefully anything that seems to involve a sense of split of a this and a that particularly at the rate of one to ten times per second or even faster if you can pull it off what sensations seem to be the watcher and what sensations seem to be watched try to see the true nature of these sensations one by one as they occur it must be said that after three or four of what seem like complete insight cycles or paths it can take quite a while to get a clear sense of what subtle dualities remain you may find yourself walking around for days to months thinking dang i've really got it now i'm just seeing it no matter what happens cool i might have cracked the whole thing dude 
give things time and be aware of assuming that you have attained to more than you have it is a very common and embarrassing problem but those who know this territory will understand however those who do not know this territory may not be so forgiving so be aware of claiming a specific level of realization particularly final realization however you define it until you have carefully checked things out for a very long time i would advise thinking along the lines of well my working hypothesis is that it seems that i have achieved whatever but i will keep an open mind and be cautious in what i say use the descriptions of realization that follow to give yourself a general sense of the territory and what tends to need work and investigation avoid wherever possible the traps mentioned above but when you realize you have fallen into them which is ever so human and common then accept this learn from it and laugh should you realize that you have failed to heed this advice that you have bought into some limited definition of yourself as a realized being of some defined rank or level despite the warnings you can try to deny it for a while that's okay you can imagine that you are very sure you know where you are as that sort of artificial solidification of reality is common enough you can get pissed off at yourself that's normal you can beat yourself up if you think it will help though it rarely does you can get better though such responses tend to wear out their welcome you can pump yourself up dwelling on your imagined or real successes though this tends to ring hollow soon enough you can try to pretend you don't care what stage or level you have achieved though eventually this gives itself away however when you feel you are done with these things accept learn and laugh repeat as necessary and then get back to investigating those sensations section sixteen models of the stages of enlightenment before i discuss the various models i should begin by saying that this is almost certainly the most easily misconstrued chapter in this book further if you are a big fan of standard buddhist dogma i strongly recommend that you stop reading this chapter now and skip to the conclusion of this book seriously i am about to get quite irreverent again but in that irreverence are bits of wisdom that are hard to find so explicitly stated elsewhere so dismiss this chapter at your peril the temptation when thinking about enlightenment is to come up with something defined that you can imagine such as a state or quality of being and then fixate on that ideal rather than doing the practices that can lead to freedom it is absolutely guaranteed that anything you can imagine or define as being enlightenment is a limited and incorrect view but these views are extremely tempting just the same and generally continue to be very seductive even through the middle stages of enlightenment every possible description of the potential effects of realization is likely to feed into this unfortunate tendency thus my distinct preference when practicing is to assume that enlightenment is completely impractical produces no definable changes and has nothing whatsoever to do with the scopes of the other trainings this means that i take it as a working hypothesis that it will not make me a better person in any way create any beneficial mental qualities produce any states of happiness or peace and provide no additional clarity into any of the issues surrounding how to live my ordinary life i have experimented with adopting other views and found that they nearly always get in the way of my insight practices a view so easily becomes sacred and thus the temptation is not to investigate the sensations that make up thoughts about that view but rather to imitate the ideal expressed in the content of that view this can seem like practice in fundamental insight but it is not i realize that i am not doing a good job of advertising enlightenment here particularly following my description of the dark night good point my thesis is that those who must find it will regardless of how it is advertised as to the rest well what can be said am i doing a disservice by not selling it like nearly everyone else does i don't think so if you want grand advertisements for enlightenment 
there is a great stinking mountain of it there for you to partake of so i hardly think that my bringing it down to earth is going to cause some harmful deficiency of glitz in the great spiritual marketplace bill hamilton had a lot of great one-liners but my favorite concerned insight practices and their fruits of which he said highly recommended can't tell you why that is probably the safest and most accurate advertisement for enlightenment that i have ever heard there was a famous old dead enlightened guy whose name ironically eludes me at the moment who was known to have said i've gained absolutely nothing through complete and unexcelled enlightenment a friend of mine thinks it was the buddha and it may have been regardless it is traditional to advertise enlightenment in the negative in the buddhist tradition and many others either stating that it is not or stating what is lost at each stage but it is so very tempting to imagine that freedom from suffering will naturally translate into a permanent state of mental happiness or peace and this can tempt one to try to mimic that idolized state that would be a concentration practice having said all of that the fact is that the models of the stages of enlightenment are out there and available even when they are not explicitly mentioned they have an obvious influence on how people describe realization thus i have decided to try to work with them so that they might be used in ways that are helpful rather than harmful this is more difficult than it may initially sound there are days i wish the words for awakening didn't exist the models had never existed and that the whole process was largely unknown to the ordinary person so that it would be less mythologized and aggrandized thus making conversations about it much more normal and less reaction producing i wish we could start over strip away all of the strange cultural and mythical trappings create simple clear terms and move on with things there are other days when i think that at least people know it might be possible even if most of what has been said about it is pretty fantasy based my greatest dream is that the current generation of enlightened teachers will go far out of their way to correct the descriptive errors and false promises of the past and lay the groundwork for perpetuation of these forms despite the economic and social pressures to do otherwise one of the issues holding this back is that unfortunately only a few have gone far enough to see how the vast majority of the golden dreams of enlightenment do not hold up to reality testing another is that putting oneself on an artificial pedestal can be rewarding in many ways one way or another the number of voices trying to bring things back in line with what can actually be done is small in comparison to the forces that want to make it into something grand and thus largely unattainable before i get too far into the details i should explain that the most essential principle which i wish to drive home is that this is it meaning that this moment contains the truth any model that tries to drive a wedge between the specifics of what is happening in your world right now and what awakening entails needs to be considered with great skepticism with the simple exception of the fact of poorly perceiving the sensations occurring now and habitually coming up with the illusion of a separate continuous individual nearly all of the rest of the dreams are problematic to some degree this basic principle is essential to practice as it focuses things on here and now and also happens to be true back to the complexities the mental models we use when on the spiritual path can have a profound effect on our journey and its outcome most spiritual practitioners have never really taken a hard-hitting look at their deepest beliefs about what enlightenment means or what they imagine will be different when they get enlightened many probably have subconscious ideals that may have come from sources as diverse as cartoons tv shows kung fu comes to mind movies legends sixties gurus popular music popular magazines and other aspects of popular culture in general more formal and traditional sources include the ancient texts and traditions of buddhism hinduism taoism sufism kabbalah however you spell it christianity western mystical traditions alchemy theosophy golden dawn related traditions etc the ancient greek mystery schools including the fragmentary writing of those like heraclitus 
and the non-aligned or ambiguously aligned teachers such as Kabir, Khalil, Gibran, J. Krishnamurti, and many others. Modern fusion traditions, such as the various new versions of Buddhism and other traditions that are present in the West, also have a wide range of explicit and implied ideals about awakening. Plenty of people also seem to take their inborn higher ideals for themselves or others that have arisen from sources hard to define, and made these part of their working if unusually poorly defined models of enlightenment. There is also a strong tradition in the West of believing that enlightenment involves perfecting ourselves in some psychological sense, though this is also prominent in certain Eastern and traditional models as well, in slightly different forms. Just about all of these sources contain some aspects that may at times be useful, and other aspects that at times may be useless, or even send people in the wrong direction. The number of contradictions that can be found, even within each specific tradition on the subject, is much larger than I think most people imagine. For instance, those who attempt a systematic review of the dogmas of enlightenment within the Pali Canon will find themselves tangled in a mass of widely divergent doctrines myths, stories, and ideals, and this is only one tradition. Thus, to take on the subject of models of the stages of enlightenment is a daunting task, but by breaking it down into simplified categories, some discussion of this wide mass of dogma and half-truth is possible. I will use both simple, broadly applicable models, and also discuss specific models that come from some of the traditions and try to relate these to reality. In the end, Relating them to reality is essentially the practice, and that falls to you. I consider this attempt to be just one addition to an old tradition that attempts to reform the dogma and bring it back in line with verifiable truths, albeit one that is more specific and comprehensive than any that I have found. Each new culture, place, time, and situation seems to need to do this again and again as the forces within us and society that work to promote models that are out of touch with the truth of things are powerful and perennial, with money, power, fame, ideals of endless bliss and pleasure, the enticing power of the ideals of self-perception and the pernicious inertia of tradition being chief among them. In that same vein, this chapter is very much a situation in which I claim a very high level of realization, Right as if what I have achieved is sufficient authority to write a chapter such as this one, and then present it as if this is a definitive text on the subject, sufficient to contradict significant portions of 2,500 years of traditions and teachings, and writings of countless previous and current commentators. While it is hard from my current vantage point to not believe this to be true, anyone with sense will read this chapter with appropriate skepticism, and this, as I see it, is one of the strengths of properly applied Buddhism and rational thought in general. The Buddha was forever asking people not to take his word at face value, but instead to do the experiment and see if they could come to the same conclusions. I recommend the same. If you are able to achieve something beyond what I state is possible, more power to you, and please let me know how you did it. I would feel real regret if I thought that this work had hindered anyone from achieving their full human potential, and am always looking for practices and concepts that are useful. Here is a list of the basic categories of models that I use, though most traditions contain a mix of most or all of these. There are probably other aspects of the dreams of enlightenment that I have failed to address, but this list should cover most of the basic ones. I look at each of these as representing some axis of development, and basically all of them are good axes to work on regardless of what they have to do with enlightenment. That said, from what I have already said, it will not be hard to pick out my favorites. 1. Non-duality models. Those models having to do with eliminating or seeing through the sense that there is a fundamentally separate or continuous center point, agent, watcher, doer, perceiver subject, observer, or similar entity. 2. Fundamental perceptual models. Those that have to do with directly perceiving fundamental aspects of things as they are, including perceiving emptiness, luminosity, impermanence, 
suffering, and other essential aspects of sensations regardless of what those sensations are. 3. Specific Perceptual Models Those that involve being able to perceive more and more, or all, of the specific sensations that make up experience with greater and greater clarity at most or all times, and usually involve perfected, continuous, panoramic mindfulness or concentration at extremely high speed. 4. Emotional models are those that have to do with perfecting or limiting the emotional range, usually involving eliminating things like desire, greed, hatred, confusion, delusion, and the like. 5. The action models are those that have to do with perfecting or limiting the things we can and can't do in the ordinary sense, usually relating to always following some specific code of morality, or performing altruistic actions, or that everything we say or do will be exactly the right thing to have done in that situation. 6. Power Models Those that have to do with gaining inabilities, either ordinary or extraordinary, such as psychic powers. 7. Energetic Models are those that have to do with all the energy, such as chi, ki, piranha, etc., flowing through all the energy channels in the proper way, all the chakras spinning in the proper direction, perfecting our aura, etc. 8. Specific Knowledge Models Those that have to do with gaining conceptual knowledge of facts and details about the specifics of reality, as contrasted with the models that deal with perceiving fundamental aspects of reality. 9. The psychological models are those that have to do with becoming psychologically perfected or eliminating psychological issues and problems, like having no stuff to deal with, no neurosis, no mental illness, perfect personalities, etc. Number 10. The Thought Models They are those that have to do with either limiting what thoughts can be thought, enhancing what thoughts can be thought, or involve stopping the process of thinking entirely. 11. God Models These are those that involve perceiving or becoming one with God or even becoming a God yourself. 12. Physical Models Those that involve having or acquiring a perfected, hyper-healthy or excellent physical body, such as having long earlobes, beautiful eyes, a yoga butt, or super-fast fists of steel. 13. Radiance models are those that involve having a presence that is remarkable in some way, such as being charismatic or radiating love, wisdom, or even light. 14. The karma models are those that involve being free of the laws of reality or causes that make bad things happen to people, and thus living in a blessed, protected, lucky, or disaster and illness-free life. 15. Perpetual bliss models are those models that say that enlightenment involves a continuous state of happiness, bliss, or joy, the corollary of this being a state that is perpetually free from suffering. Related to this are the models that involve a perpetual state of jahanic or meditative absorption. 16. The immortality models are those that involve living forever, usually in an amazing place, like heaven, nirvana, pure land, etc., or in an enhanced state of ability, angels, bodhisattvas, sorcerers, etc. 17. Transcendent models are those models that state that one will be free from or somehow above the travails of the world while yet being in the world, and thus live in a state of transcendence. 18. Extinction models Those that involve getting off the wheel of suffering, the round of rebirths, etc., and thus never being reborn again or even ceasing to be at the moment of enlightenment, that is, the great poof on the cushion, not to be confused with the more mundane atmospheric consequences of a legume-based diet, as anyone who has been on a vegetarian meditation retreat knows all too well. 19. Love Models These involve us loving everyone and or everyone loving us. 20. Unitive Models that you will become one with everything in some sense. 21. Social models say that you will somehow be accepted for what you may have attained, that you have attained something when people think you have, and variants on these themes. 
like me you have probably run into most or all of these ideals of awakening in your spiritual quest and probably within yourself at some point in time either consciously or unconsciously given all of these high ideals it is not surprising that we find the task of awakening daunting if not preposterous imagine yourself as the universally accepted radiant immortal angel bodhisattva bright-eyed yoga but having all loving one with the universe endlessly mindful perfectly healthy emotionally perfected psychologically pure endlessly altruistic non-thinking desire-free psychic superhero star child of light and then notice how this image may be in some contrast with your current life if you're anything like me you will notice quite a bit of discrepancy. I will take on each model, relate them to a few of the traditions, and try to make sense of where these ideals come from. I will also address which ones are realistic and which are just a bunch of beautiful dreams that can either help you identify areas to work on or really screw up your spiritual quest if you are not careful. You will note that none of these models come from any formal tradition. In order to relate them to the traditions, here is a list of some models from Buddhism. 1. The four-path model from the Theravada, which involves becoming a stream-enterer, second path, third path, and then an arahat, however you spell it. 2. The five-path model from the Tibetans. 3. The ten bodhisattva, Bhumis, from the Tibetans. 4. The ideal Buddhahood from all the Buddhist traditions. 5. The sudden and gradual awakening schools of Zen. There are other models from other traditions, such as John of the Cross, Letter of Love, and I have already mentioned these in the section on the progress of insight. I'm not going to go into much detail about them here, but when you are familiar with the models I'm going to discuss, you should be able to make some sense of them. The Non Duality Model. The Non Duality Model is without a doubt my favorite of them all. It essentially says that the goal is to stop a process of identification that turns some patterns of sensations into a doer, perceiver, center point, soul, agent or self in some very fundamental perceptual way. By seeing these sensations as they are, the process can gradually be seen through until one day there are no more sensations that trick the mind in this way. My favorite quotation that articulates this model is the one that goes something like, In the seeing just the seen, in hearing just the heard, in thinking just the thought. And thus, I may repeat this quotation a few times, just to make the point of how profound it is. Basically, there is just a field of sensations, as there was before, but now all of these sensations are progressively seen to be as they are, and all the sensations that we generally call me are just a part of this process. This model does not imply anything else, promises nothing related to any other models except in some loose way, the fundamental perception model that I will talk about shortly. The non-duality model is one of the most practical models in that it focuses on simply seeing things as they are right now. I will talk more about this model as we go and have already talked about it often in a less direct way. I present it first to serve as a foil or counterpoint to all of the other models, and it is the only model that can withstand reality testing without qualification or difficulty. All of the other models may contain some degree of truth somewhere in them, either literally or poetically, but this is one you can hang your hat on all the way through. This awareness develops gradually, with some sharp jumps along the way, leading to the endless debates about sudden and gradual schools of awakening, a subject that will hopefully become more clear as we go, but probably deserves some mention here. The Sudden Schools of Awakening There are schools of awakening, particularly some Zen traditions from China and Korea, and some interpretations of Hinduism, though this is not a complete list that say that awakening happens in one big shift, and that's basically it, regardless of exactly how you define it. They deny the claims of the progressive schools, like the Theravada, Tibetans, some other strains of Zen, most schools of Sufism, Kabbalah, other Western traditions, etc., that there is mappable territory before awakening, 
and that there might be lots to do after stream entry, or whatever you want to call it. Possible explanations for these ghouls include 1. There may be a few rare individuals that somehow manage to go straight to full awakening due to whatever interesting way they are wired or practiced, though I've never met anyone who did this. 2. There may be schools founded or influenced by people who got to the first stage of awakening and somehow never realized there could be anything more than that or got trapped in a lie about being fully awakened when they hadn't yet realized there was more to go and never retracted their initial erroneous claim. 3. There are people who just thought that was the dogma somehow and stuck with it regardless of any issues of actually having insight. 4. Other explanations I haven't thought of or run across. Because every single person I have ever known has followed a progressive path, including myself, it is very hard for me to believe the sudden claims except for keeping open the possibility that there may be the exceedingly rare practitioner who occasionally manages to pull this off and thus imagines, based on their limited experience, that this is how it happens in general. In short, if you manage to do this, more power to you, and please let me know. Otherwise, I would bet on the gradual, progressive schools, and if you attain something that you are pretty impressed by, Give it time to see how it holds up when the troubles of the world come knocking at your door over the months and years after that shift of perspective. Fundamental Perception Models These are related to the non-duality model, and also, useful for practice, are the fundamental perception models. I say models because various traditions emphasize different qualities of reality as being essential. For instance, the Theravada uses the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering and no-self, as you already know well by this point. The Mahayana traditions, Tibetans in particular, may emphasize shunyata or emptiness, and the Vajrayana traditions may emphasize luminosity or the space-like meditative equipoise of Dzogchen. They may also talk about Mahaati or express fundamental truths in some other way. These models may directly state or imply that enlightenment involves continuously perceiving these aspects of things in all sensations at a conscious level, so that every waking instant we are flooded with the sense of impermanence or luminosity or whatever as our dominant experience. While attempting to perceive this at all times is excellent practice advice, particularly when on retreat. Were these models true, then realization would seem to involve flooding the consciousness of the individual with a ton of information at all times. While there may be moments or bursts of this sort of perception in enlightened individuals, this is not what finally happens. Instead, with strong awareness of how things are, a process of identification stops. The switch is thrown, as noted above in the non-duality models. By following the practice advice of the fundamental perception models, we may come to stop this process. However, as the Buddha said, do not imagine that you must continue to carry the boat once you have crossed the river. While enlightened individuals can at a whim notice the true aspects of sensations, just as color is clear to a person with good eyesight, assuming they are not colorblind, so these things are clear to an enlightened being to various degrees as they progress along the path. That said, just because one can perceive something doesn't mean that particular aspect is the dominant aspect of consciousness at all times. In short, the fundamental perception models are very useful for practice, but do not quite accurately describe the final result. The Specific Perception Models these models essentially state or imply that an enlightened being will be constantly hyper-aware of every single sensation that arises in their field of perception, including not just the ultimate aspects of the fundamental perception models, but also every single little detail of content of those sensations, achieving at all times the perfected fusion of the completely open and panoramic perspective of high equanimity, with the laser-like precision of the arising and passing away at its height. It implies that rather than stopping a process, enlightenment is about becoming so fantastically alert that you see not only the true nature, but also the specifics of each and every sensation that arises at all times. 
This is not even close to what happens in reality. While enlightened beings will cycle through those stages, when mindfulness is low, each of those stages will present in a low-key way, and only for moments here and there will there be anything like that kind of awareness. Though when enlightened beings are on retreat and are really powering the mindfulness and concentration, they can temporarily achieve something that resembles these high ideals. The specific perception models are another instance where practice instructions get turned into an ideal of what is supposed to happen in exactly the same way as it happens with the fundamental perception models. They become one more example of carrying the boat after we have crossed the river. Again, mindfulness comes and goes. Sleep comes and goes. Though the Tibetan teachings on dream yoga are very intriguing, concentration comes and goes. Various perspectives and perceptual thresholds parade through, and the cycles of the jnanas continue on and on. The ideals in this model, and many models that follow it, are sometimes used as a weapon by those who like to criticize those who rightly or wrongly claim to be enlightened. Examples include, Don't you remember when I said such and such? Did you notice how I cleaned the bathroom? Or how could you have forgotten to pay the power bill? The implication inherent in each of these is that an enlightened being should have perfect awareness of all aspects of their sensate reality as well as perfect memory of all those aspects. This ideal is unfortunately completely bogus. I so wanted to be a sensation-perceiving superstar with a photographic memory and have been sorely disappointed. As basically everyone out there has some aspect of this model in their working definition of what enlightenment must be, these ideals can be a particular problem in relationships, particularly business relationships and romantic ones, for those who are out of the closet about enlightenment. In this basic vein, this brings up another selling point of realistic, down-to-earth, human models of what awakening brings. If you tell people you are enlightened, and also promote very high, idealized, delusional, perfectionist models of awakening, those who actually get to know you well, will realize how full of shit you are, particularly people such as spouses or partners, business associates, best friends and the like. Further, the more you get stuck trying to be like the person you dream you are supposed to be, rather than who you are, the more you can get isolated in your false and pretentious fantasy land, locked away from the grounding, healing, and helpful reality testing that comes from community and real, intimate human relationships. However, if the specific perceptual models are a problem in this way, you haven't seen anything until you get to the emotional models. The emotional models are so fundamental to the standard ideals of awakening as to be nearly universal in their tyranny. You can't swing a dead cat in the great spiritual marketplace without hitting them. Almost every tradition seems to have gone out of its way to promote them in the most absurd and life-denying terms available though there have been attempts at reform also. I must give thanks for the attempts, however ineffective, bizarre, mythologized, cryptic, and vague, that the Tibetan and Zen traditions have occasionally made in this regard, and mourn their nearly perpetual failure to make these issues clear. At least they tried, whereas the Theravada basically has really not tried in any significant way in 2,500 years, so far as I can tell. If I am wrong, please let me know. These emotional models basically claim that enlightenment involves some sort of emotional perfection, either gradually or suddenly, and usually make these dreams the primary criteria for their models of awakening, often ignoring or sidelining issues relating to clear perception of the true nature of phenomena. Usually these fantasies involve elimination of the negative emotions, particularly greed, hatred, anger, frustration, lust, jealousy, and sadness. At a more fundamental level, they promise the elimination of all forms of attraction and aversion. As I am sure you can already tell, I am no fan of these models of enlightenment. In fact, I consider their creation and perpetuation to be basically evil in the good old you should burn in hell for perpetuating them kind of way. Though as guidelines for trying to be kind and behave well, training in morality, I find them of value. I know both what hints of truth they contain and also what a marketing ploy they are, and will attempt to make both aspects clear. 
This is not easy to do, and the dogma of the emotional models is so deeply ingrained in us all that shaking it can be the work of a lifetime, even in enlightened beings. The practical application of making this distinction is based upon the fact that we will try to realize the model we consciously or unconsciously adopt. It is extremely tempting if we buy into the limited emotional range models to go around imitating an emotionally limited state, repressing or ignoring aspects of our basic human nature. There are some benefits to repressing the manifestations of negative emotions while simultaneously being conscious and accepting of the fact that difficult emotions occur. However, if we repress them and also pretend that they don't exist, this sort of cultivated denial can also produce huge shadow sides and a lot of neurotic behavior. A far more practical approach is to accept that we are human, try to be decent in a normal sort of way, rather than in a grandiose spiritual way, and to assume that reducing and eliminating the illusion of the dualistic split is possible through doing basic insight practices. Reducing the sense of a split can provide more clarity, allowing us to be the human beings that we are, with more balance and less reactivity in the face of that humanity. Section 17. The Theravada Four-Path Model The root problem in standard Buddhism comes to us from the Theravada Four-Path Model. This is the original model presented in the Pali Canon and the oldest model we have to work with. All the subsequent schools, Mahayana of various strains and the Vajrayana, react to it in their way, but are still influenced by it even if they say they are not so you need to know it to understand the debate. Actually, the problems began long before in ancient Hinduism, which had a huge impact on Buddhism, despite what some Buddhists will tell you, and probably before that. But this is as good a place to start as any. I shouldn't blame ancient India for what is really a perennial human wish. Let's face it, we all want emotional perfection, as a large chunk of the pain felt in modern life relates to people's emotions causing trouble. I will claim that not perceiving our emotions clearly is a far greater problem than the emotions themselves. But I am clearly in the minority in this regard. As I stated in the chapter, Harnessing the Energy of the Defilements, there is a lot to be said for aspects of what we usually consider the bad emotions. It is important to realize that empty compassion underlies all our emotions, whether filtered through the illusion of duality or otherwise. The Theravada four-path model is a model involving four stages of awakening, namely first path or stream entry, in Pali, Sotapanna, second path or once-returner, Sakadagami, third path or never-returner, Anagami, and finally, fourth path, holy one, saint, or conqueror, arahat, arhat, arahant, or arhant, pick your favorite spelling. The terms once-returner and never-returner have to do with the issues relating to the dogma, and those who have attained to second path cannot be reborn more than once before attaining arahatship, and certainly not in the lower realms, hell realms, hungry ghost realms, or animal realms, and that those of the third path, if they do not attain to arahatship in this lifetime, will at worst be reborn into a heaven realm where the conditions are optimal for achieving enlightenment. However, the core of the Theravada four-path model is the dogma that enlightenment involves progressively eliminating the ten defilements in the following manner. Stream entry eliminates the first three defilements, skeptical doubt, attachment to rites and rituals, and personality belief. Second path attenuates the fourth and fifth defilements, usually translated as greed and hatred, or more technically as attraction and aversion to everything that is not a jahanic state. The third path is said to eliminate those same fourth and fifth defilements, however translated. Fourth path, that of arahatship, eliminates the remaining five defilements of attachment to form Johannes, the first four Johannes, attachment to the formless realms, or the second four Johannes, restlessness and worry, conceit, 
and something called the last veil of unknowing. It is important to note that Arahats are said to have eliminated conceit, in limited emotional range terms, can appear absolutely arrogant and conceited, as well as restless or worried, etc. That there is no fundamental suffering in them while this is going on is an utterly separate issue. That said, conceit in the conventional sense and the rest of life can cause all sorts of conventional suffering for Arahats, just as it can for everyone else. While I am on the subject of conceit, perhaps I should take on the subject of the word ego in a more comprehensive way than I have done so far. The pop psychology meaning of the word ego is something like arrogance, pride, narcissism, and a failure to take into account the feelings, rights, and or existence of others. This is also the definition that is most commonly behind such mainstream Buddhist statements as that action or statement that I really didn't like had a lot of ego in it. I think that this definition of ego can sometimes be slightly useful for training in morality if we are very kind to ourselves and those around us. But often it seems to me to be a pop spirituality turned into a weapon and a form of denial of someone else's difficulties, feelings, and sufferings. Worse, People often take this definition, mix it in with their own insecurities and unfortunate fear of existing, or asserting themselves in the conventional sense, and then take this neurotic mixture and use it to continue to flog themselves and those around them. Please don't do this. It is misguided and will not help you or anyone. This pop psychology definition of ego also has nothing to do with enlightenment in the formal sense and so don't bring it to mind when you read this chapter, except to dismiss it. Another definition of ego is the formal psychological one put forward by Freud. In this definition, ego is the moderator between the internalized parent or police of the superego and the primal drives of the id, those being largely for reproduction and survival. In this sense, ego is an extremely good thing, and should be cultivated consciously and without restraint. This definition has to do with the more formal psychological concept of ego strength, a strength that is very positive and necessary for the deep and often difficult spiritual growth that we all want for ourselves. One of the explicit requirements for entering intensive psychoanalysis is high ego strength, the ability to face one's reality in dark stuff without completely freaking out. Thus eliminating this form of ego would be a disaster. For reasons completely beyond me, the word ego is also used in a high mystical sense to describe the elimination of the experiential illusion of there being a special reference point, as described in the chapter on the three characteristics, in the section on no self. One who had eliminated this form of ego, which is in this case a useless illusion, might describe their experience in this way. In this full field of experience or manifestation, there seems to be no special or permanent spot that is observing, controlling, separated from, or subject to any other point or aspect of the rest of this casual field of experience or manifestation. This is the experience and realization of the Arahat. Notice that this definition of ego seems to have nothing whatsoever to do with the other definitions of ego. This is exactly the point. So I strongly advocate never using the word ego in the context of describing realization or the goal of the spiritual life, or at least not doing so without extensive explanation of this particularly special and uncommon usage of the term. Those who do otherwise continue to cause an astounding amount of unrealistic, disempowering, and life-denying thinking in mainstream Buddhists. It is my sincere wish that the misuse of the word ego and its associated negative side effects stop immediately and forever. Back to the models. As the Theravada four-path model explicitly states that realization is all about eliminating greed, hatred, restlessness, worry, etc., this is explicitly a limited emotional range model and, as expected, deserves some serious skepticism. In fact, this is a good time to go into what I love and despise about the Theravada. I absolutely love their emphasis on the three characteristics, 
love the astounding power of their techniques and i am grateful beyond words for the maps they provided me for the territory before stream entry however incomplete and idealized i am profoundly grateful at times to the point of tears and i mean that for the monasteries i got to sit in for their preservation of that which is true and useful in buddhism for twenty five hundred years and for the chance to have sat with real enlightened teachers because of their perseverance and work and yet their maps of enlightenment still contain a hefty helping of scary market-driven propaganda and so much garbage that is life-denying dangerously out of touch with what happens and an impediment to practice for millions of people that the enlightenment lineage holders of the modern theravada and their ex-monk western counterparts don't have the balls to stand up and say we are deeply sorry for twenty five hundred years of our predecessors perpetuating this craziness to put food in their bowls and to fool ignorant peasants so that they might be supported in their other useful work we vow to do better is a crying shame they are chained to the texts myths and ancient lies seemingly doomed to indoctrinate and brainwash generation after generation of monks practitioners and devoted followers with their delicious poison what a freakish paradox that the meditative techniques and technologies that i consider among the most powerful and direct ever created should come from a tradition whose models of awakening contain some of the worst bullshit of them all I have sat with numerous arahats who were monks or former monks who just didn't seem to overcome their indoctrination, and so when giving dharma talks would habitually mix in the crap with the gold when it was obvious they knew better. I have at times dreamed that all the teachers from all the lineages would get together in secret, come up with a plan to jointly get themselves out of the trap, and in a big formal ceremony present the truth as a new beginning, like a mass intervention like a family gathering around an alcoholic to try to force them to reform their ways. None of them, on their own, seem to be fully able to take the heat, as each one that steps out of line in a direct fashion tends to get blasted. Though there are exceptions, such as Jack Cornfield's After the Ecstasy, The Laundry. Thus, I think they should all try to do it together, with Zen masters, Lamas, Rinpushes, Talkus, Sayadas, chains and their western counterparts all standing side by side saying enough is enough we are declaring a new era of honest open realistic dharma teaching free from sectarian fighting free from preposterous models of awakening and free from denial of humanity enough of my ranting back to the models i have no major beef with her description of stream entry it does make people realize somewhat that rites and rituals are not the primary reason that they got enlightened, though I know of a number of practitioners that got enlightened with the help of techniques, and that were very ritualistic and continue to include rituals of various sorts in their practice, and why not? Stream entry does counter, in some semi-intellectual way, the sense that there is a permanent, separate self, though exactly how they know this is much more vague and mysterious to them than at the higher stages of awakening, though it beats the pants off any understanding of this that is pre-stream entry. Further, they know that awakening is possible and can be done in this lifetime, assuming they know they are awakened in the first place, which, strangely, not all enlightened beings do. Those persons that encounter this understanding outside of established traditions may fail to recognize what they have understood is called awakening and other names. Regardless, stream entry is known as the opening of the Dharma eye, as contrasted with the wisdom eye of Arahatship. These are simply poetic metaphors for some aspects of clearly perceiving things. My problem with the Theravada four-path model comes as soon as it starts talking about the second path, like the attenuation of greed and hatred or attraction and aversion and by the time it promises eliminating these in their ordinary forms as they say occurs in the third path i think that serious critique of their language and dogma is called for what they are attempting to say is that the sense of the observer center point continuous and separate subject watcher or however you want to describe the sense that there is some self at the center of all this stuff is in fact just a bunch of sensations 
When these begin to be perceived as they are, the sense of how special the center point is begins to loosen its grip on perception, which begins to come wider, more inclusive, and more even in its basic treatment of phenomena. Thus, as there doesn't seem to be so much of this side and that side, attempts to get away from that side when it is bad, to get to that side when it is good, or just tune out to the whole thing when it is boring, diminish at some basic perceptual level, and so the system functions better as it is better that realistically interpreting the information coming into it. This is a very tough thing to talk about, and certainly doesn't sell as well as saying, do these things and you will be free from all negative emotions. Or even worse, we did these things and so are free from all negative emotions, and so you should worship us, give us donations, support our center, buy our books, give over power to us, think of us as very special or amazing, stand in awe of us, sleep with us, allow us to act like raving nutcases, etc. I think you get the picture. Thus, what happens in reality is that segments of the process of making specific categories and patterns of the casual, sensate field into a separate self is reduced and then stops. However, many of the traditions advertise eliminating negative emotions and the sensations of craving or aversion. The two couldn't be more different, and yet they are described as being the same. A Revised Four-Path Model here is my revised version of the four-path model, and this is the primary model I use when describing awakening, talking about my practice, and helping others practice. I think that using the original terminology and revising its definition allows a lot of good material in the polycanon to be used, and thus provides a link to previously established work. However, I realize that using terminology that already has such deep cultural and dogmatic resonance may be a problem. For those who want something new, I will next present a rephrasing of this model that I call the simple model. In the revised four-path model, stream enterers have discovered the complete discontinuity that is called fruition and sometimes called nirvana or nibbana, Sanskrit versus Pali. This is the first of two meanings of nirvana, with the other being fourth path. Stream enterers cycle through the jnanas, know that awakening or some different understanding from the norm is possible, and yet they do not have all that different an experience of most sensations from those who are not yet stream enterers. They may correctly extrapolate a lot of good dharma insights from momentary experiences, particularly high up in high equanimity and the three moments before a fruition. But this is not the same thing as living there all the time. In fact, most stream enterers have a very hard time describing how things have changed in terms of their daily life, except that they cycle and they can understand the Dharma in ways they never could before. Those of the second path have now completed a new insight cycle. They understand the process by which enlightened beings make further progress and equate progress with further cycles of insight, which is partially true. More model-obsessed or intellectual practitioners at the second path may get into very fractal models, consciousness models, enlightened models, various integrative theories, and that sort of thing. Psychological issues tend to be a bit more of a big deal during this phase, and psychological development becomes interesting. By this point, most people, though not certainly not everyone, also have a pretty good understanding of the basics of the Samitha Janus, and these can be very fascinating. What they may be most bothered by is that cycle after cycle of practice, duality remains the predominant experience most of the time. Those of third path have shifted their understanding of what progress is from those of the second path, and have begun to see that it is about perceiving the emptiness, selflessness, impermanence, luminosity, etc., of sensations in daily life, and begin to see that they have the ability to do this. This can be a long, developmental process from the first time they notice this to it becoming a nearly complete experience. Thus, third path tends to be a long path, but it doesn't have to be. At the beginning of the third path, most practitioners think, I'll just complete more cycles of insight like I did before, and this will do the trick. 
they don't tend to understand what it is they have attained all that well yet nor its deeper implications by the mature stage of the third path which can take months to years to show up the practitioner is more and more able to see the emptiness selflessness centerlessness luminosity etc of phenomena in real time so much so that it can be very difficult to notice what artificial perceptual dualities remain as they cycle they will enter new territory possibly causing some uncertainty or instability and with each review phase they tend to really feel that they have done it until they begin to notice the limits of their practice there can be this nagging something in the background that things aren't done and yet figuring out exactly what the problem is can be very slippery it is a bit like being in the stages before stream entry trying to figure out what exactly needs to be done they need to notice something that has nothing to do with the cycles to finally untangle the knot of perception at its core but doing this can be a real trick it is a very strange place as one seems to know the dharma all the way to the end and yet somehow it just isn't quite enough in that vein it is interesting to note that i wrote the vast majority of this book while i was some sort of anagami and on reflection i got just about everything right my emphasis are slightly different now but the basics are all the same all things progress anagamas tend to tire of the cycles to a small or large degree and begin to look to something outside of them or not related to them for the answer to the final question finally the cycles of insight the states of concentration the powers and all the other perks and prerogatives of their stage of awakening or concentration abilities if they develop them hold no appeal and only lead to more unsatisfying cycles i completed around twenty-seven full complete insight cycles with mind-blowing a and p events ass-kicking dark nights equanimity phases and what seemed to be brand new fresh fruitions and review phases between third and fourth path there is nothing special about that number both because it is just a guess and because of the reasons i stated when describing the phenomena of twelfth path the later cycles got faster and faster so that by the end it seemed i was whipping one out every few weeks or even every few days but they still seemed to be leading nowhere it was only when i had gotten so sick of the cycles and realized that they were leading nowhere that i was able to see what has nothing to do with the cycles which also wasn't anything except a strange untangling of the knot of perception of them the cycles for better or worse have continued just the same thus there is not much point in counting cycles or paths as they don't necessarily correlate well with anything past the first two or three and issues of backsliding can really make things complex as i explained earlier finishing up my revised four path model our hats have finally untangled the knot of perception dissolved the sense of the center point actually being the center point no longer fundamentally make a separate self out of the patterns of sensations as they used to even though those same patterns of sensations continue this is a different understanding from those of the third path in some subtle way and makes this path about something that is beyond the paths this is also poetically called opening of the wisdom eye what is interesting is that i could write about this stage quite well when i was an anagami but that is a whole different world from knowing it like arahats know it the wisdom eye may seem to blink initially it may go through cycles of flashing open just after fruition and then slowly fading over a few hours at least on retreat as each round of physical sensations then mental sensations then complex emotional formations then lastly fundamental formations such as inquiry itself move through and become integrated into this new correct and direct perception of reality as it is review cycles may occur many times during each flash but when the eye is open they seem rather irrelevant in comparison to keeping the level of clarity and acceptance high enough to keep the eye open when the eye fades and the knot of perception seems to retie itself the familiar insight cycles may seem like pure drudgery with the focus drifting back to getting lost in the cycles and then gradually shifting again to getting clear enough to get the eye to open again the themes that occupy center stage go through a cycle that is very much like a progress cycle 
Finally, the wisdom eye cycles and insight cycles all converge, and the thing stays open from then on, which is to say that at that point it all seems the same whether or not the eye is open, which it actually was. That being seen, nothing can erode or disturb the centerlessness perspective, and life goes on. There are arahats who have opened the wisdom eye, but had it fade, and those who have opened it and had it stay open is rarely mentioned but worth knowing. For the arahat who has kept the thing open, there is nothing more to be gained on the ultimate front from insight practices, as done is what is to be done. That said, insight practices can still be of great benefit to them for a whole host of reasons. There is a ton they can learn, just like everyone else, about everything else there is to learn. They can grow, develop, change, work, and participate in the strange human drama, just like everyone else. Practicing being mindful and the rest still helps. They also cycle through the stages of insight, as with everyone above stream entry. So doing insight practices can move those cycles along. A Simple Model in earlier versions of this work, I had a model called the Heart Sutra Model. The simple model is the less mysterious, stripped-down version of that earlier model, though in its essence it is the same. While in a sense it is also a rephrasing of the revised four-path model, as it has no numbers and is free from the traditional names, it has some advantages over that terminology. I present this somewhat novel model here because it focuses on real insight directly and treats any emotional benefits of this as side effects. Further, there are often too many cycles of insight before arahatship, making the four-path model troublesome. This phenomenon of too many cycles, which I will sometimes call paths with a lowercase p, between each of the four paths gets worse as one works toward final awakening. As Bill Hamilton put it, and I have learned the hard way, the Arahat Vactal is vast. The simple model does not reinforce fascination with content, nor with life-denying ideals or limited emotional range models in the way that the traditional four-path model often does. It does not tempt one to count paths. It keeps the focus on precise inquiry into the truth and one's experience of it or lack thereof. This model basically says that enlightenment is about direct insight that progressively reveals something different in the relationship to the field of experience and gradually allows things in it to be held in their proper proportion. Thus, it is a non-duality model. The first understanding is that sensations are sensations, thoughts are thoughts, and this forms the basis of further inquiry. When the universal characteristics of these sensations begin to be seen, this represents growth in understanding. When the whole sense field is known directly and completely as it is, this can cause an entrance into fruition through one of the three doors and represents the first stage of awakening. When one appreciates the cycles of the progress of awakening and has completed at least one more new progress cycle, this is the next stage. When one begins to appreciate the emptiness, luminosity, centerlessness, agentlessness, etc., of phenomena in real time, and this becomes the focus of practice rather than fruition, this is the next stage. When the sense of the watcher, observer, subject, controller, doer, etc., is seen completely as it is, and the knot of perception untangles, that simple, fundamental way of perceiving things is the next stage of awakening. When that untangling stays untangled, that is the next stage. As that understanding is integrated into our lives, that is the next phase, though it is more an ongoing process than a stage. The problem is that the traditions seem to want to make this understanding into so much more than it is, such as add ideals of emotional perfection into this. There is some truth in the models dealing with emotions. It has to do with things moving through faster and being seen more clearly. It does not have anything to do with bad emotions not arising. I hate to even go there, as my goal is to give the emotional models the bashing they richly deserve. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Thus, here it goes. As the deep-seated, perceptual sense of a separate, continuous, permanent, observing agent stops being extrapolated from the old patterns of sensations that seem to be those, 
there is this wider inclusive something that can come into the consciousness of the enlightened individual depending on their level of awakening there is also a slowly growing directness of perception that comes as reality is not filtered so exclusively through thought these two can combine to give the emotions of enlightened beings less sticking power so that they may move through more quickly than for those that are not enlightened and also may be seen more quickly and clearly as they arise and vanish there may also be less blind contraction into thoughts and emotions and a wider perspective thus giving the other parts of the brain more of a chance of creating moderated responses to the emotion that said even when seen through there seems to be a biological component to how emotions move through that can only be expedited so much anyone who thinks these highly qualified statements are anything like a vision of emotional perfection or the elimination of all negative emotions is not paying attention that is the last thing i wish to imply I merely wish to say that there is some increased clarity about our basic human experience, and it can help, but that is all. That said, you would be amazed how angry, lustful, or ignorant enlightened beings can be, and they can still do all sorts of stupid things based on these emotions, just like everyone else. The ability to moderate responses to emotions can sometimes give the impression that these emotions have been attenuated, but that is not the same thing and this is my nice transition into the action models the action models tend to involve certain actions that enlightened beings cannot commit or certain actions they must commit both types of models are completely ridiculous and so we come now to the first of the models that simply has no basis in reality the traditional theravada models contain numerous statements about what enlightened beings cannot do or will do that are simply wrong my favorite examples of this insanity include statements that arahats cannot break the precepts including killing lying stealing having sex doing drugs or drinking cannot have erections cannot have jobs cannot be married and cannot say they are arahats they also state that unordained arahats must will join the theravada monistic order within seven days of their realization or they will die needless to say all are simply absurd lies, lies that have unfortunately often been perpetuated by arahats. There is also another more subtle and seductive view, and this is that enlightened beings somehow will act in a way that is better or higher, though it isn't defined what those actions might be or what actions they might avoid. I consider this view very dangerous. While I wish to promote the shift in perception that I call awakening and other names, I don't want to make out that somehow this will save anyone from stupid actions or make them somehow always know how to do the right thing or avoid screwing up. Such views are a setup for massive badness and huge shadow sides, as anyone who has spent enough time in a spiritual community knows all too well. As Zen says, the bigger the front, the bigger the back. The list of highly enlightened individuals who have bitten the proverbial dust by putting themselves up on high screwing up and then being exposed as actually being human is remarkably long and the list of spiritual aspirants who have failed to draw the proper conclusions about reality from the failures of the enlightened is even longer there are many schools of thought on this issue and i will give them formal names here though in reality they don't think of themselves this way halfway up the mountain school essentially believes those who screwed up and caused a scandal were only part way up the mountain only partially enlightened as any one who was really enlightened couldn't possibly have done those terrible things while clearly some were only partially enlightened or perhaps not enlightened at all in the technical sense a number of those who screwed up clearly knew ultimate reality inside and out and so this model misses many important points there is the crazy wisdom school that believes enlightened beings transcend ordinary reality and with it ordinary morality so that they are the natural manifestation of a wisdom that seems crazy to us foolish mortals but is really a higher teaching in disguise while not entirely absurd as there are many cultural aspects and societal rules that can seem a bit childish artificial unnecessary unhelpful or naive in the face of realization 
the crazy wisdom school provides too easy an excuse for plenty of behavior that has been and is just plain bad, irresponsible, stupid, and needlessly destructive. Then there is my school, for which I don't have a catchy name, and it promotes the view that enlightened beings are human, and unfortunately humans, enlightened or otherwise, all screw up sometimes. There is nothing special or profound about this. In short, my school categorically rejects the specific lists and dogmas of the traditional action models in all forms, from the preposterous list of the Theravada to the subtle sense that enlightened beings somehow are guaranteed to act perpetually in enlightened ways, whatever those are. That said, the ability to see things as they are does allow for the possibility of more moderated responses to situations and emotions, as stated earlier. That is a very different sort of concept from coming up with a list of things that an enlightened being never would or could do, and it certainly doesn't mean that they will necessarily act the way we think they will. Further, while this is not an exhaustive list, the behavior of any being is always affected by the following. First, the standard laws of the natural world. Second, the limits of their level of realization. Third, the ingrained habits of the realized individual, including their personality, quirks and stuff. Fourth, the residue of the shadow sides of the techniques and traditions they use to attain their understanding. Don't underestimate these. Fifth, the fact that mindfulness waxes and wanes, at least in air hats and below, and in all realistic definitions of Buddhas. Sixth, the fact that confusion and stupidity can still occur exactly as before. Seventh, the limits of the relative knowledge and experiences of the realized individual. Eighth, the psychological and physiological issues that apply to the brain and body of the realized individual. Ninth, their cultural upbringing and the relative mores created by it. You will notice that this is quite a realistic and long list. Thus the dogmas of the standard action models, while containing a few grains of truth, are simply wildly inaccurate and generally represent some of the worst of the models of enlightenment. A closely related issue is the tensions between the technically enlightened models and the limited possible action models. There are schools of thought that say, one enlightened action and one is a Buddha, one deluded action and one is an ordinary human being. These have their value from a certain behavioral point of view and can serve as a valuable reminder to all that conventional morality tends to be an extremely good idea most of the time. I, for one, think that everyone, regardless of purported realizations or lack thereof, should be held to a high and fairly traditional moral standard, though in some human, just and forgiving way. However, teachings based on some arbitrary ideal called enlightened action can begin to diminish the importance of direct realization of the truth of things and reinforce the mythical garbage of the limited possible action models of realization. There are people who are, technically, unenlightened, meaning that they have never completed even one progress of insight or attained to any direct understanding of emptiness or non-duality, who nonetheless live lives that would be considered unremittingly saintly by even the very highest standards. I have been fortunate enough to have met a few of these people and continue to stand in awe of them. Just so, there are those who are technically very highly enlightened, perhaps even Arahats or Buddhas, who nonetheless can appear exceedingly ordinary, seem to be of distinctly questionable moral virtue, or even sometimes be downright debauched and outrageous. I have met a good number of these also. While the failure of the limited or enlightened action models and limited emotional models is a huge disappointment from one point of view, it also means that there is hope for the rest of us. Our lives are it. Our emotions are it. Our habits are it. Our limitations are it. Our neurosis are it. Our issues are it. And our shadow sides are it. How can we attain understanding if we do not clearly see into reality as it is? How can we see clearly into reality as it is if we spend most of our time thinking that it isn't good enough to even examine clearly? 
the power models on a rather different tangent enlightened beings are often believed to have various kinds of powers typically extraordinary ones and thus we have the power models the converse of this is the belief that people who have extraordinary powers might be or must be enlightened however the relationship between the powers and fundamental insight are slim though not non-existent psychic powers come out of samitha or concentration practices particularly the fourth samitha jahana though they may also arise in the stages of the arising and passing away high equanimity and sometimes in the other stages and states as well some people just seem to have them regardless of their concentration or insight abilities if you didn't read the section on psychic powers in the chapter on samitha jhanas please do so now note that nearly all of the states and stages where the powers arise can be attained by beings who have not yet reached the first stage of awakening and so we can see that there is no clear connection between nearly all of the powers and awakening the short list of powers that are exclusive domain of the enlightened are attaining to fruition attaining nirota samapati a deep state described in the appendix and being able to talk about the dharma from their own direct experience of it there are some other things to be said about how the stages of realization make a few other things available but this is a subtle, complex topic that I may take on some time later. It is true that along the way to awakening, it is hard to avoid chancing into all sorts of experiences that are described in the standard lists of the powers, and it is also much easier to develop the Samitha Jhanas when you are in the review phase of a path than it is if you are not enlightened. However, developing those into powers that can be attained again and again is a completely different matter and still unrelated to enlightenment except on this one front there is something about the direct perception of the interconnection of things that does lend a certain something to utilization and development of the powers thus we see some hint of why there are these models of awakening however as stated above these are associations and nothing more in summary just because someone has powers doesn't mean they are enlightened and just because someone is enlightened doesn't mean they will have any psychic powers that are not directly related to their clear perception of things. Section 18. The Tibetan Ten Bhumi Model This is probably a good time to introduce the Tibetan Ten Bodhisattva Bhumi Model. The word Bhumi means ground, or something like level. It is a model of progressive stages of enlightenment that gets very different emphasis depending on the author. But one of those emphasis has to do with powers and how many duplicates of oneself can manifest physically. I actually like the Bhumi model, as other takes on it have to do with giving up the notion of personal territory and realizing shunyata or emptiness and deeply integrating that into our perception paradigm practice and personality it is a model that addresses many fronts only one of which unfortunately is the powers the details of the den bahumi model can be found in various mahayana texts such as the large sutra on perfect wisdom and the jewel ornament of liberation chagyam trungpa gives a nice description of it in the myth of freedom some texts also list other numbers of bahumis such as seven or thirteen but they all share similar elements i do not consider myself an expert on this model though i do understand the territory it covers it is a very complex model that ascribes a wide range of exceedingly high and complex criteria involving emotions, paradigms, concentration abilities, perceptions, psychic powers, and a whole host of other aspects to those of each stage. Thus, from my point of view, it is fraught with problems and assumes simultaneous, synchronized development on numerous axes, a notion I consider a bit naive and idealized. However, like most of the teachings, it contains some very interesting points made in what I consider very unfortunate ways. Thus, I recommend that you check it out, come grano salis, particularly if you want to understand Tibetan texts or do practices in that tradition. 
Lining the model of the Bahumis up with the four paths also involves some controversy. That the first Bahumi is stream entry is straightforward. Beyond that, things get difficult. At points, I have lined Anagami Hood up with anywhere from the fourth to the seventh Bahumis, and Arahat ship with anywhere from the sixth to the tenth Bahumis. These are not perfect correlations, and if you spend some time reading about the model, you will see why. I recommend that you check out the sources listed above if you are interested in further information about the Behumus. The biggest problem with this model is that it delineates the number of duplicates of oneself that one should be able to manifest as bodhisattvas at each Behumi, and as the Behumis progress, the numbers quickly get so large as to be absurd. Why some whack job included this bizarre ideal of manifold by location in the model I have no idea. But somehow no Tibetan sense has had the balls to throw it out. And so a thousand years later they are still stuck with it. Aside from these problems, the texts that describe the Bahumas make for very interesting reading, particularly in the middle stages of enlightenment. The Tibetan Five-Path Model While I am on the subject of the Tibetan models, I will present the Tibetan Five-Path Model. In this model, the details of which can be found in various places, such as Kenpo Kathar Rinpoche's book Dharma Paths, published by Snow Lion. As that book does such a good job of explaining the dogma and is not expensive, I will give only a brief treatment of that model here. First path covers the territory from just beginning through the arising and passing away, and is called the path of accumulation. In the territory of first path, one accumulates direct insight into the nature of sensations by direct investigation of impermanence and the selfless nature of phenomena, as one does in the first four jnanas. The second path, that of unification, encompasses the territory from arising and passing away through the dark night to high equanimity and the first taste of stream entry. These are perfect correlations also, and thus have been already described. The third path is the path of seeing, and encompasses stream entry, and then begins the fourth path, that of meditation, which encompasses the rest of the ten Bahumis. Third path is described as a plane taking off, and fourth path as it is flying higher and higher. The fifth path is that of Buddhahood. As you can see, the five-path model does not really add anything to the other models but knowing it will help you to understand the correlations between the terminology when you are trying to cross over between the writings and oral teachings of various traditions. Back to the generic models. The energetic models. In nearly the same vein as the power models are the energetic models. They tend to involve ideals that imply that enlightened beings will have all their energy channels clear, their chakras or energy centers all the right shape and color, and all spinning in the correct direction, their aura large, regular, and some nice color such as white, gold, or violet, and in general have perfected their energetic system, regardless of the particular energetic system model being used. The simple fact of multiple models and visions of what a perfected system should look like is already a red flag for anyone paying attention as the various traditions can't even agree on how many chakras there are, much less the rest of the details. I have noticed that these things are very scriptable, meaning that one's concepts of what is supposed to be happening can influence what one perceives in these areas. These models also leave much to be desired, and generally are referring to things that happen in the A&P and the fourth jahana, as are the power models. Kundalini Phenomena where all the energy, prana, lung, or chi, blasts through the central channel, shishumna, are very common in the A and P event. Some traditions associate this event with awakening, though I consider this erroneous and premature, though I can understand why these stages impress people so much. It is during the A and P that some practitioners with a bent or talent for doing so may perceive energy channels, sometimes in outrageous detail, and be able to see chakras and the like. However, anyone who can do this in a sustained fashion will note the following, that in the dark night the channels are a mess in most people, and that in high equanimity the focus shifts to experience itself, not nearly so much what is in that field of experience, 
and thus the channels can be difficult to perceive or a secondary background aspect of what is going on. Further, enlightened beings cycle all the time, their moods and health and other factors change all the time, and so what their channels are doing and how they perceive them will change all the time, leading to nothing resembling the stable, clean, orderly, perfected, predictable energetic state promised by the energetic models. Thus the energetic models are another example of a transient side effect of some people's practice being incorporated into an ideal of awakening. While energetic practices are very interesting and may lead to lots of insights and other nice effects, that is not the same thing as an enlightened being having stable, perfected energetic systems. My friend Kenneth has asked me to add that there is something good that progressively awakening does to the channels and energetic system, and I have to agree. However, defining exactly what positive changes are made is difficult, and none of the models I have seen really do an adequate job or contain enough flexibility to accommodate how dynamic our energetic systems are. Suffice to say, this is one more set of models that is getting at something but contains much that needs revision. Specific Knowledge Models These models basically state or imply that enlightenment will somehow magically provide hidden conceptual information about all sorts of specific things in life, such as the workings of particle physics, how to bring about world peace, who one's disciples should marry, and the like. Some go further and state that enlightenment progressively brings complete omniscience, meaning the ability to know everything about the whole universe simultaneously. While these might seem to some people like reasonable things enlightened beings should somehow know, let's include other things it might be good to know, such as how to create safe, inexpensive lithium-ion batteries for electric cars, how to consistently beat the return of an S&P 500 index fund over the long haul, how to balance the federal deficit while providing everyone with good social support but not raising taxes, how to instantaneously make every blue-collar Republican realize that they are voting against their own self-interest, and how to build a fusion reactor that is safe, inexpensive, produces enough energy for everyone, and has no radioactive disposal issues. I think that some of the old Zen stories are the worst for this. They seem to imply that the enlightened will have very clever, amazing ways of dealing with people in situations that seem beyond ordinary mortals. When you look at these, the concept of specific knowledge gained by merely seeing the true nature of ordinary sensations begins to seem as ridiculous as it really is. The only specific thing I did gain a little insight into was the beauty of differential equations that discuss the oscillation from the imager quantities, or potential, to real quantities, manifestation. But that's about it. Other than a bunch of direct knowledge about what a load of crap most religious and mystical dogma is, and that includes Buddhist dogma, I really didn't get any specific knowledge of anything else. Well, so much for that idea. Psychological Models Here's another thing that didn't happen. Psychological perfection. While the mainstream Western Buddhist world is absolutely drowning in a notion that somehow Buddhist practice will either eliminate all their psychological stuff or cause them to become self-actualized in the good old psychoanalytical sense, nothing could be further from the truth, except perhaps the action models. I think that I learned more about reasonable psychological health from reading the one book on transcendental analysis, Van Joyne's T.A. Today, than I did from over a decade of highly successful Buddhist meditation. That doesn't mean I have achieved perfect psychological health, not by a long shot. Focusing on psychological growth is an epidemic disease in Western insight practice. Many of the major retreat centers that purport to foster insight practice in the U.S. and Europe are actually bastions of the worst pop psychological bullshit retrofitted with a bastardized Buddhist front. You have only to go to a few small group meetings on retreats, as I mentioned in Part 2, to hear that the vast majority of people who are supposed to be doing insight practices are actually just wallowing in their own neurotic crap. Sure, they may be highly intelligent, super sophisticated, 
fantastically well rationalized pseudo buddhist practitioners of the great sacred neurotic crap wallow but they are wallowing just the same as i mentioned before that this sort of behavior is tolerated on meditation retreats at all is mind-boggling but it gets reinforced and rewarded as often as it does is a crying shame that reflects as badly on the teachers as it does the practitioners i've had insight teacher after insight teacher try to focus on what i was feeling and how my relationships were going when all i wanted to do was talk about my attempts at insight practices as i assumed often wrongly that they were insight teachers while the dharma is vast and the teachings of the wisdom traditions contain a lot of material for helping us grow psychologically that doesn't mean that it has anything to do with awakening or insight practice at all and letting people get stuck there does them little service if you ask me which you clearly did as you were reading this book again as i said before working on one's psychological stuff can have its value but I firmly believe that keeping the line between insight practice and psychological work drawn as firmly as possible is essential to doing either well. Further, it is also easy to imagine that the teachers on the front cushion couldn't possibly be as neurotic as we are, and before you know it, we have the breeding ground for massive shadow sides, exploitation, isolation, and scandal just like we had with the models that purport emotional perfection. The jet-set culture of teachers popping in, getting up on the front cushion, spouting their beautiful ideals, and jetting off to somewhere else before anyone can see them as the humans they really are, only goes to reinforce these dangerous notions. It is just so easy to project all kinds of wondrous qualities onto them when the dream is so nicely laid out and the opportunities for reality testing so few. Clearly, that suits most of them just fine or they would go more out of their way to counter these notions. But as they quickly learn, countering those notions just doesn't sell, and getting caught up in that sort of transference feels mighty frickin' nice. Thus, I think that the models that reinforce the notion that psychological perfection or freedom from our psychological stuff will come simply by seeing through the sense of a separate, permanent agent are a serious problem for these major reasons. 1. They simply aren't true. 2. They cause practitioners to get caught up in their stuff rather than focusing on the three characteristics or something equivalent, thus squandering the vast majority of the Western Buddhists' practitioners' scant retreat and practice time. 3. They allow teachers to be able to ride the hot air of these preposterous ideals to dangerous heights. 4. They contribute to the erroneous sense of the gap between this ordinary human existence and awakening by creating unrealistic ideals and goals. Most Buddhist practitioners that I know have something like one of the following belief structures. First, that awakening is impossible, so the best thing to try for is psychological or emotional health or perfection. Second, that awakening is psychological or emotional perfection. So by trying for psychological or emotional perfection, one is doing the practices that lead to awakening. Third, that awakening involves psychological or emotional perfection, so it is clearly impossible, and by sitting they are trying to accomplish something else. But if you ask them what that is, they are usually unable to answer clearly. What is so ironic is that awakening is hard, but clearly not impossible and not nearly as impossible as achieving psychological or emotional perfection. In fact, seeing sensations clearly enough to see that they are all just happening and coming and going is extremely straightforward once you finally realize that is what you are supposed to be doing. Further, when I think back on all the things I have done, including going to medical school, spending a year in India working as a volunteer there, and finishing a medical residency, I must say that the work I went through to get those things was significantly more work than it took to get to stream entry and even arahatship. It is not that getting stream entry was easy, just not as hard as plenty of other things I have done. I attribute my success to a vast array of factors, but two that are relevant here are a tolerance for pain and having a good working model. That model was one that was blissfully free from notion of emotional or psychological perfection. 
When I think about what it would take to achieve freedom from all psychological stuff, the response that comes to this, life is about stuff. Stuff is part of being alive. There is no way out of this while you are still living. There will be confusion, pain, miscommunication, misinterpretation, maladaptive patterns of behavior, unhelpful emotional reactions, weird personality traits, neurosis, and possibly much worse. There will be power plays, twisted psychological games, people with major personality disorders, yeah, which may include you, and craziness. The injuries continue right along with the healing, and eventually the injuries win and we die. This is a fundamental teaching of the Buddha. I wish the whole Western Buddhist world would just get over this notion that these practices are all about getting to our happy place, where nothing can ever hurt us or make us neurotic, and move on to actually mastering real Buddhist practice, rather than chasing some ideal that will never appear. All that said, there is some debate about what factors or progress allows some people to just notice the three characteristics of the sensations that make up their world in the face of their stuff, as opposed to those who just flounder in their stuff. Some would argue that you have to have done enough psychological work and deal with enough of your issues to get to the place where you can move on to the next stage. I must reluctantly admit that there is probably some truth to this. However, I didn't consider myself particularly psychologically advanced when I started insight practices, as I had all kinds of stuff to deal with and still do, and yet somehow, perhaps through good instruction, perhaps through some other factors I have yet to identify, I was able to practice well despite it all, and make the shift from being lost in content to noticing how things actually are. THE THOUGHT MODELS Speaking of screwed-up models, we have the thought models. These are models that tend to focus on something different happening with thoughts in those who are awakened, rather than simply seeing through the thought patterns that create a sense of a center point, or special, permanent, separate self. These idealized models include not thinking certain thoughts, such as enlightened beings being unable to think the thought, I, or I am, not thinking at all, and thus stopping the process of thought, or some other modification to thoughts, such as always thinking good thoughts, whatever those are. I got an email a while ago from a seemingly nice engineer who said basically, I did some Taoist practices, got enlightened, and now I'm incapable of thinking any thoughts or visualizing, yet I seem to function normally. What do you think of this? I put a lot of thought into my response, and so I am including it here in slightly edited form. I told him, one of my dead teachers, Bill Hamilton, used to talk about how people's conceptions of what was supposed to happen would have some influence on subsequent events, with some question about what that influence was. We used to discuss this often, with possibilities including, 1. People with different models of awakening might actually achieve different results. I am no fan of this proposition, but admit the possibility. 2. People with different models might achieve the same thing, but describe it differently. I believe this one more than the first. 3. Some combination of these. 4. People might fail to achieve results, but be scripted to report or believe that they had achieved something in line with their own working model. This is a common occurrence, one that I have observed in myself more times than I can count, and also in the practice of many other fellow Dharma adventurers. Bill would often mention people's ability to self-hypnotize to semi-fixed states of delusion. He had a long run of hanging out in scary cult-like situations with psychopathic teachers and got to observe this firsthand in himself and others. See his books, Saints and Psychopaths, for more on this. 5. People with different models and techniques might have very different experiences of the path along its way. This is clearly true in some aspects, yet the universal aspects of the path continue to impress me with their consistency and reproducibility, regardless of tradition. 6. Other possibilities we haven't considered, in the style of Donald Rumsfeld's famous Unknown Unknowns. The no-thought question is an interesting one. It's commonly used in some traditions as being the goal, these including some strains and descriptions of Hindu Vedanta, 
multiple non-aligned traditions, and others. Zen sometimes toys with the idea on its periphery. As to Taoism, I did a bunch of reading on the old Taoist master some years ago, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert on its current practice or dogma. Buddhism does not generally consider not thinking or not being able to visualize among its goals. It brings us to the points mentioned above. For instance, the awakened Buddha often says things in the old texts like, It occurred to me that I should wander by stages to such and such a place. Or, This spontaneous stanza, never heard before, occurred to me. These obviously are thoughts. Furthermore, if we note the old texts as reference, all of the enlightened disciples of the Buddha and the Buddha himself were described as thinking thoughts. Further, many of the Buddhist disciples could visualize as could the Buddha, and if we look to modern times, you can't be a tantric master without some strong visualization abilities. Further, the notion that one can write an email or do engineering which inherently involves abstraction, mathematics, and other concepts being converted into actuality, or even speak and have it not involve thought, is one that I think is merely a conceptual understanding itself, and thus an arbitrary designation. Further, as intentions fall into the realm of thought, and all physical actions are preceded by intentions by the fixed mechanics of the system, the notion that action can occur without thought falls into the same camp. This also applies to all such things as memory, which you clearly demonstrate, as this inherently must involve thought, essentially by definition, with caveats as above. Given those assumptions, the question I ask is, have you simply stopped calling those processes thought so as to fit an arbitrary and dogmatic model? Perhaps have you forced yourself to stop noticing that mental processes occur as you thought that was supposed to happen? Maybe you have achieved something real, and because of your preconceptions, choose to describe it through that terminological filter, or have achieved something completely different from those that is not on my radar screen for whatever reason, possibilities including my own delusion or lack of experience, just for the sake of completion and reasonable skeptical doubt, which is always a good idea. The terminology that I am used to involves seeing thoughts as they are, thus having them be just a very small and transient part of the natural, causal field of experience. However, it must also be admitted that, since thoughts can only be experienced as aspects of the other five sense doors, then labeling thought as thought is also just an abstraction, and just as arbitrary as is labeling the other five sense doors as such. These are simply convenient designations, or thoughts, for the sake of discussion. When one notices that all things simply arise on their own, including those sensations that may or may not be designated as thoughts, to be empty of a self, as they are and always have been, with no separate or independent observer or controller or doer that is not just a part of the field of experience or manifestation, then one has understood at some level what the Buddha advocated that people understand. Thus the model that I prefer as it is practical, non-esoteric and direct, is that, first, sensations that can be labeled as thoughts occur. Second, thoughts are natural, causal, and essential to nearly every function we perform. Third, thoughts are not self, not other, part of life and empty in the good sense. Fourth, they always have been this way, before and after any spiritual achievement, and when their true nature is seen, they are still as they were. An essential question regarding enlightenment is, does it make things different from how they were, or does it merely reveal a true and accurate perception or perspective on how everything always was? I advocate a moderated version of the latter view, as I believe it is more helpful to practice and more accurate. Thus, in this view, which is just one view, Anything that could happen before, such as thought or visualization, can happen after, with the only thing changing being some untangling of the previously held knot of tangled perception. In terms of my experience, another interesting conceptual designation, and using relative and down-to-earth language, I can make my inner voice as loud as it could be before. It is much more clear than it was before. 
it is perceived as part of the natural field of causality in a way that it was not before and mindfulness comes and goes as before in high jahannic states the inner voice is very subtle but i can still visualize as before sometimes even with more clarity depending on practice conditions in short i have not lost abilities nor have i changed much about the way the system operates that said something is clear that was not clear before and the sense of a special center point seems seen through though the sensate patterns that make it up generally seem still to occur as before and it is only the perception of them that is different end of email as you can see i sometimes write long emails for worthy dharma questions but must admit i only have time to do this because the number of people who ask me questions as of this point is so very small anyway back to the models the god models on a very different tangent we have the god models while buddhism pretends to be an exception to the theological traditions many buddhists essentially worship the buddha as a god just as christians worship jesus as a god further the vast majority of the traditions that promote awakening involve some sort of theological background or underpinning including hindu vedanta's focus on the divine nature of things islamic sufism's focus on the friend or dissolving in allah and christianity's various dilution in god metaphors such as the divine marriage buddhism has the same problem at times with the phrase buddha nature these are interesting models to talk about and basically the question comes down to the distance between god and one's life for those who disapprove of me writing about god in a book on buddhism substitute buddha nature everywhere you see the word god those who believe in a god that is a separate entity are already in trouble those who believe this entity is far off in heaven or largely unavailable are really in trouble however those who believe in a god that is right here right now and present in all things including themselves have a fighting chance and this is as practical a model for awakening as any other if done correctly which it almost never is the problem comes for those who believe in god-free zones that is those places where god is not these tend to be people who believe in a limited abstract god most people who believe in god have not taken the time to consider the question of whether or not they believe in god-free zones or a limited god in fact most people who believe in god in the monotheistic sense would be offended by the notion that their god was somehow limited however if you question them about whether or not their god is in their toilet paper or in a rock or perhaps more specifically is the toilet paper and is the rock is their weird popcorn fetish is the annoying itch in their armpit and actually is everything else even most people who in theory believe in omnipresent unlimited all-powerful god won't go that far this is too bad because if they did they would have a good working model for realizing that this is it and so we are back to my original simple excellent premise and test for good models of awakening here's how this works if you believe you are trying to see god and that you believe that all creation is a manifestation not just created by god but in fact is god then you are back to the basic insight practices seeing the sensate world exactly as it is because there you will find ultimate reality or god if you want to call it that when the center point is seen through by your careful investigation of all these sensations or all aspects of god then all that is left is just all these sensations as before that is all this god thus if one is willing to really believe in an omnipresent god then by truly deeply directly perceiving all sensations to be just part of the causal natural unfolding of what is labeled god all the boundaries between what were self and other can be seen through and the phenomenal world is left doing its thing thus the practitioner realizes they were always part of god in a sense though these designations are merely terminological one way or the other the problem with god models typically is that people don't take them far enough because if they do they can get into something really good though they could get there just as easily without them 
All the other ideals that are involved in becoming God or seeing God are just more odd dreams and possible side effects of spiritual practice. I have a few friends who saw visions while on LSD in which God told them useful stuff, and this is fine, but this is back in the realm of the powers that has nothing to do with awakening and only a very limited amount to do with God in the ultimate sense. THE PHYSICAL MODELS on a completely different track we have the physical models, which tend to involve some kind of physical perfection or stylization. The old Theravada texts go to great lengths to list the thirty-two interesting physical qualities of the Buddha, such as having forty teeth and arms so long that he could touch his knees without bending down. It is interesting how things change, as in our modern context that would make him look more to us like a dentally challenged Cro-Magnum than a spiritual superhero, but I digress. Numerous pulp culture sources make us associate interesting physical qualities or ideals with spirituality, particularly yoga magazines and martial arts movies. There is not much more to say about these models other than they are amusing and completely inaccurate. We may imagine that somehow enlightenment involves some kind of physical health, or think that awakening or insight practice may cure some illness, but I wouldn't bank on anything like this at all. That said, my friends who regularly do practices like yoga and tai chi do tend to look good, and this only makes sense. However, this is not related to ultimate realizations except peripherally in that those practices involve mindfulness and if done well can lead to real insights. The Radiance Models Related to the physical model are the radiance models, which tend to involve imagining that enlightened beings will have some kind of remarkable presence, usually involving radiating love, charisma, wisdom, peace, or even physical light. A friend of mine used to joke about this by saying that people in Western Vipassana at the Insight Meditation Society thought an arahat would be someone like Dipa Ma, a talented practitioner of Vipassana, and Samitha, who died an anagami by her own admission, but with light shining out of their ass. This is a bit of an exaggeration, but it makes the point that these ideals are so ingrained in us from many traditions that it is hard not to imagine that enlightened beings must have something remarkable about them that you could feel or see. Everyone knows that all saints have light coming out of their heads, as did Jesus. You only have to look to medieval paintings to confirm this. The stories of Buddha are full of his marvelous presence. In fact, his very first interaction with a human after his awakening went something like this. The Buddha had gotten up after exploring the depths of his realization and abilities. He decided to find his five companions who had been with him during his period of grave asceticism, and surveying the world with his psychic powers, found they were at Benares. He took off walking down the road between Bodhigaya and Gaya, and the first person the Buddha talked to after his awakening that wasn't a god or a giant snake was a monk, Yupaka. I quote the Buddha as he tells the tale, as rendered in Bhikkhu Nyanamoli and Bhikkhu Bodhis, the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, Sutta 26, as it is so priceless and such a wealth of information about the origin of these models and ideals. Yupaka said, "'Friend, your faculties are clear. The color of your skin is pure and bright. Under whom have you gone forth, friend? Who is your teacher? Whose dharma do you profess?' I, the Buddha, replied to the Hajivaka Yupaka in the stanzas, "'I am one who has transcended all, a knower of all, unsullied among all things, renouncing all, by craving ceasing freed, having known all this for myself.' To whom should I point as a teacher? I have no teacher, and one like me exists nowhere in all the world, with all its gods because I have no person for my counterpart. I am the accomplished one in the world. I am the teacher supreme. I alone am a fully enlightened one, whose fires are quenched and extinguished. I go now to the city of Kasi to set in motion the wheel of Dhamma. In a world that has become blind, I go to beat the drum of the deathless. Yupaka replied, By your claims, friend, you ought to be the universal victor. The victors are those like me, who have won to destruction of taints. I have vanquished all evil states. 
therefore you paca i am a victor the passage is remarkable in that it sets out a large number of criteria and specifics about what awakening means to the buddha and to buddhism in such a short space further what is interesting is the number of times the word i appears in fact buddha means something like awakened one or i am awake thus we see that buddha had no trouble talking about what he had done and who he was nor did he have trouble thinking the thought i we note his remarkable presence and skin and so have the first of buddhist radiance models and physical models we note that he says he is superior to the gods which is a sort of a god model in and of itself except one better he describes being free of all the taints and evil states which is a complex mix of emotional and psychological models he also adds the drum of the deathless and here we have hints of an immortality model or an extinction model and while formerly buddhism would reject both of these associations aspects of both show up often in the texts anyway there is also a transcendence model as he says he is unsullied by all things and also a specific knowledge model as the buddha says he is a knower of all in short he says he has accomplished something remarkable and asserts that he is going to tell others how to do exactly the same thing he did or is he the question of how the buddha's realization relates to what he was trying to teach others is a complex one there are numerous passages where he says he is quite different from and superior to all other enlightened beings and draws a clear line between himself and arahats thus we have to look carefully at what he claims about himself have to do with others and i devote the whole next chapter to this complex issue suffice to say the problem comes in when the ideals the buddha discusses as applying to himself however mythologized we think they are are applied without careful investigation to enlightened beings of theoretical inferior degree then there is the slippery question of the tibetans who purport to produce full buddhas in one lifetime back to the issues of whether or not enlightened beings have a special presence i have seen examples of both though i suspect that in most cases their presence was largely that way before they started doing spiritual practice many people who have asked me questions about practice over the years have hesitantly asked me if there was something remarkable about my presence or how i was able to keep my realizations hidden at work i am both sorry and happy to report i have no problems in this regard at work as far as i can tell I have nothing whatsoever that is unusual about my presence that wasn't there long before i got into all of this other than the confidence and passion which i speak on the dharma in short the physical models and radiance are just nice propaganda and another trap that people fall into both in their own practice and when evaluating the possible level of realization of others the karma models these models involve the promise that somehow realization eliminates exhausts cancels out or moderates the forces of causality that would cause bad things to happen to the realized being karma involves action and its consequences and in its simplest form is essentially the statement that causes lead to effects in a lawful way the subject is imponderable as the forces and factors involved are so vast and complex that no mind can fully comprehend them that said many models and buddhist ideals subtly or overtly present models of awakening that promise some sort of relief or freedom from adversity however if we look to the life of the buddha who by definition is as enlightened as it gets in buddhism lots of bad things happen to him at least according to the texts he had chronic headaches and back pain got illnesses was attacked by bandits people tried to kill him his own order broke into warring factions people harassed him and so forth and so on thus it is clear that even the buddha was not free from the laws of karma and so it would seem naive to assume that we were also however the karma models raise an interesting question that of the timing of the fulfillment of the promises of enlightenment and what this has to do with death the theravada claims that the moment of complete freedom from suffering is at death of an arahat or buddha 
as it is only then that there is no more coming in to further birth and there is the complete cessation of the senses that cause pain and discomfort the tibetans would disagree focusing on the perpetual life or continued series of rebirths of a buddha or bodhisattva throughout time to help awaken other beings these conflicts bring us to other models but in fact are paradoxes created by misperception however the karma models are not entirely junk by seeing each thought state and emotion as it is there is an increased ability simply to watch these arise and vanish on their own thus allowing for the causal force of them not to wash through to the future without some moderation of intelligence and wisdom in this way past causes habits tendencies and the like can be mitigated through clear seeing and the actions we take based on these that create future causes can be done with more awareness clarity and a broader more inclusive perspective this is not the same thing as eliminating all negative karma but it is practical realistic and verifiable and thus represents the grain of truth found in the karma models section nineteen the perpetual bliss models these focus on enlightenment bringing on a state of continuous happiness peace joy or bliss they are commonly found in hinduism though they are in full voice in buddhism and other traditions as well such as christianity's the peace that passes all understanding buddhism often describes nirvana as synonymous with the highest happiness and the end of suffering and this end of suffering is the natural corollary of the perpetual bliss models perpetual bliss models and their corollaries are also pervasive in the world of awakening as to be a central nearly unassailable tenet of most people's core beliefs i am sorry to say they need serious revision the first point is that about impermanence bliss peace happiness as well as their counterparts pain chaos and misery are all transient phenomena subject to conditions arising and passing like the weather as zen says the ten thousand joys and the ten thousand sorrows march through our lives according to the laws of reality that have always been in place this returns us to the great question of realization does realization change things or does realization reveal how things always were i advocate a modified version of the latter view both for practice and for having sane models but the dogma and those selling something often stray into the promises of a radically different and better existence the standard buddhist argument is that by removing the condition namely ignorance or misperception the suffering caused by this condition is also removed the question then is how much suffering is caused by that particular condition and how much is caused by just being alive i assert that most of our suffering is caused by simply being alive but must concede that there is something about changing something in the relationship to the ordinary facts of life and humanity that does help and why i am so reluctant to admit that there is some sort of peace that comes from realization is a question i am still looking into while i strongly believe that there are practical reasons not to sell things in this way i suspect that some residual quirk of my personality is also at play here and you may have already come to that conclusion on the other side of the perpetual bliss models is the notion that somehow one will enter into permanent jahannic state such as the fourth jahana or some sort of nibbanic jahana these versions of the bliss models imply perfect continuous concentration untouched by circumstance or enhanced by some sort of inborn wellspring of jahannic qualities as noted above all the concentration states are temporary not related directly to realization attained both by some who are enlightened and some who are not and thus are a false promise however as so many people get a taste of jahana and are sure this must just get better and more continuous as they progress they end up cultivating these states again and again and get nowhere in insight practice further why would someone who was hanging on to a bliss model want to look into suffering they don't and so the chances of them coming into real insight territory or handling the dark night well are slim 
now it is true there is some sort of relationship between the perspective on things that occur in the first four johannes and the four paths and the panoramic perspective of both the fourth samitha jhana and the panoramic perspective of arahatship share some positive aspects in common but they are not the same thing and even mentioning these patterns and parallels is dangerous as it can cause a lot of misguided effort and assessment of where people are on the path i think that this is a good place to introduce the tibetan concept of the three kayas as it has some useful aspects that help make sense of these things the three kayas contrary to what some tibetan buddhists would tell you arahats have a deep understanding of what is meant by their teaching of the three chaos or bodies of understanding for me the three chaos are very close in meaning and implication to the scopes of the three trainings arahats understand the fullness of the implications of having been born and of there still being a body and mind called the nirmanakaya or manifestation body relating to training in morality all teachings of dependent rising interconnection and interdependence fall into the realm of the nirmanakaya arahats know intimately the fullness of the ordinary realities of the human condition sickness physical and mental health sorrow joy conflict harmony pleasure pain clarity and confusion stupidity and brilliance all of these manifest according to the same natural laws that have always been in effect contrary to popular belief a body was born and it will get sick and die the eight worldly winds of praise and blame fame and ill repute success and failure and gain and loss still blow impersonally as always the laws of biochemistry physics and physiology still hold we have to pay taxes from a cynic's point of view, the near Manakaya is the most disappointing aspect of enlightenment. Did one really imagine that somehow it would be otherwise? Don't believe the hype. Another of the great Bill Hamilton one-liners was, Suffering less, noticing it more. The more we wake up, the more we notice exactly what it means to have been born. The near Manakaya is what is meant by this passage pertaining to the Arahat. The disturbances resulting from the taint of being can no longer be found here. The disturbances related to the taint of attraction can no longer be found here. The disturbances related to the taint of aversion can no longer be found here. And yet there remains the disturbances inherent in these six sense doors that are dependent on a body and conditioned by life. From Sutta 121, the shorter discourse on voidness, in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, notice that this says sixth sense doors arahats still think contrary to occasional myths about stopping thought as noted above while the content of thoughts is still inherently dual the true nature of the way thoughts manifest is absolutely non-dual arahats know both aspects of thought directly a bit like being able to see waves on the ocean and yet also that the whole thing is made of water and intimately connected no wave could ever be fooled into thinking that one wave was watching, controlling, or isolated from another. The Nirmanakaya is also the aspect of understanding that has to do with personality, habits, and issues of character. Don't imagine that just by understanding the full ultimate truth of phenomena that these things will somehow lose their considerable causal inertia. To paraphrase Chi Nuo, a great Korean Chan monk, just because the sun is shining brightly doesn't mean that all the snow will instantly melt. On a related theme, the Nirmanakaya also relates to the facts of the physiological inertia and biological conditioning of the bodily aspects of the emotional life. The mind of a true Arahat is extremely resilient, but the flesh works according to the same laws that were in place before. The spacious mental resilience of an Arahat has some positive consequences for physical life, but it does not completely transform it. Thus, physical sensations associated with hunger, pain, tiredness, sexual arousal, nervousness, fear, and all the rest, are still intimate realities for the living Arahat, and they arise and are not inconsequential, though the points made above in the karma model about seeing things arise and vanish still apply. 
The near Manakaya includes issues of biochemistry and neurochemistry, and all of the issues of mental pathology that may go along with these. The near Manakaya bears out the truth so well articulated by Leo Tzu when he talked about dark and light containing one another and difficulty and ease complementing one another. No level of enlightenment will allow one just to pick one's favorite half of reality or humanity and eradicate the rest. This simply never happens and is not possible. I think that everyone on the spiritual path should occasionally sit down with a piece of paper and list their favorite half of reality that they imagine or wish would be left if they got fully enlightened, and then list all the aspects of reality that they wish or know would vanish forever. They should then list the things that they imagine would show up as a result of full realization that are not here now. The differences between these lists often point directly to what blocks the development of wisdom from a clear acceptance and understanding of reality. Even Arahats and Buddhas have a favorite half of reality as well as dreams about how things could be. So these dreams are not the problem. The difference is that highly realized beings understand directly that both the good and bad halves are of the nature of the ultimate truth, including all thoughts about them, and this makes all the difference. These sensations flicker effortlessly and vanish, getting no more nor less consideration than they are due. The point I'm trying to make here is to include the sensations that make up your world in your practice, and don't retreat into idealized fantasies of what realization will be like, though notice such sensations if and when they occur. Lastly, the near Manakaya relates to our stuff, our issues, our childhood traumas, our dark secrets. I have routinely mentioned that when doing insight practices, one should try to see these things at the moment-to-moment -moment level. However, one must also find a way to deal with our stuff in the traditional ways, or perhaps non-traditional ones. Just do this work when not doing insight practices. While there are connections between these two types of work, they are often in direct conflict. Make time for the macroscopic. When we face and learn about how to live well in the world in terms of emotions, issues, conflicts, tears, joys, people, jobs, and relationships. However, also make time during which you resolutely put all of that behind you. Time when you stay at the level of flickering sensations. Unhealthy fixation on either perspective is guaranteed to cause problems. Arahats also have a further wondrous understanding of all of this that is unique to them and Buddhas, though there may be hints of it at third path, called the Sambhogakaya. They know that the full range of phenomenal reality and even the full range of the emotional life can be deeply appreciated for what it is. They see that the world of concepts, language, symbols, visions, Thoughts and dreams is fundamentally the same as the world of materiality, that they both share the same essential nature from an experiential point of view. The first line of the Gospel of John, In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God, is a nice way to put it. For those who find this phrase too cryptic, I paraphrase it as, From the beginning concepts, words, dreams, visions, and the realm of thought have always been an aspect of ultimate reality. Further, in some strange way, even the worst of the world has a richness of texture that can be deeply enjoyed, and a mysterious and sometimes awe-inspiring glory mixed into it, inherent in it. What they were looking for was permeating all the sensations without exception that had made up their world all along. What staggering irony is this, and what a silent joy it is to discover this at last. This is what is meant by bliss of nirvana. It is more a subtle understanding than the nirmanakaya, and in some largely mysterious way does not contradict it. Even beyond this, they also understand in real time what is meant by the dharmakaya, that somehow none of this is they, and that what they are cannot be fundamentally harmed, disturbed or affected by the world of phenomena in any way. The Dharmakaya seems to simultaneously pervade all of this, not be all of this, and be utterly beyond all of this. It seems to be permanent and yet unfindable, be empty and yet aware. Even this paradoxical language is hopelessly crude, 
and from a certain point of view unnecessary, though an Arahat would know directly what it is pointing to. This is what is meant by going beyond birth and death. Samsara is nirvana. The Arahat is traceless here and now, true self and no self. Interestingly, the Nirmanakaya also relates directly to both true self and no self. There is something beautiful yet tragic in this dark comedy, as a friend of mine put it. Even to say that the Dharmakaya is a very subtle understanding makes no sense, as the understanding of Dharmakaya arises more from what is absent rather than a sense of the presence of something. On the other hand, the presence of everything bears witness to it. All three understandings, the Nirmanakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Dharmakaya, are accessible to the Arahat at any time by the mere inclination towards them, which is to say these perspectives arise dependent on causes in their own time. They are three complementary perspectives on the same thing. It is like being able to see the validity of the perspective of all of the three people in the classic Taoist painting called The Vinegar Tasters, with Confucius and his laws for living in the world relating to the near Manakaya, Lao Tzu and his deep appreciation of life relating to the Sambhogakaya, and the Buddha and his emphasis on Nirvana, and going beyond suffering, birth and death relating to the Dharmakaya. Most people think of this painting as a Taoist slam on the other two traditions, but I think that the deeper meaning is much more useful. The teachings of the three ultimate dharmas, of materiality, mentality, and nibbana that I articulated earlier is closely related to the Tibetan concepts of the three chaos, or aspects of the fully enlightened condition. The Nirmanakaya relates to form. The Sambhogakaya relates to the enjoyable, quiet, and spaciousness peace of the fully enlightened mind that unifies the mental and physical into the same field of experience and the Dharmakaya relates to Nibbana. Were only the Nirmanakaya true, we could say that unitive experiences are the answer, and that we are the whole field of experience. Were only the Dharmakaya true, we could say that transcendent experiences are the answer, that we create and know the whole field of experience, that we do not exist, and that we are the deathless or God. Neither of these frameworks can clearly explain things on their own, and so as mentioned in the chapter on No Self versus True Self, none of these descriptions really holds up to reality testing on its own. Presenting the three chaos also allows me to continue to hammer relentlessly on the point about people wanting to find some spiritual reality other than this one. The huge temptation when walking the spiritual path is to try desperately to find a way to get the simple ease of the Sambhogakaya and the indestructible, transcendent, and deathless luminosity of the Dharmakaya, while secretly hoping that the down-to-earth, mundane, intimate, visceral, vulnerable, and often embarrassing Nirmanakaya will just sort of crawl away and die, or at least radically reform itself. The Nirmanakaya is often treated as though it were the bastard stepchild of the fully enlightened condition, but you can't have one without the others. Intimacy with reality is bought at the price of attaining transcendence beyond reality. Transcendence is bought at the price of attaining intimacy with reality. These inescapable facts should not be forgotten. The all-too-common temptation of those who advertise and sell spirituality is to sing the praises of the Sambhogakaya and Dharmakaya while trying to gloss over the profound yet down-to-earth implications of the Nirmanakaya. Buyer beware! If the enlightened beings didn't feel the fullness of their humanity and the ordinary world, compassion for themselves and others would be completely impossible. From a Tibetan point of view, it is because enlightened beings progressively lose their artificial defenses against the Nirmanakaya that they have no choice but to be bodhisattvas, which brings us nicely to our next model, the immortality models. The immortality models are significantly more prevalent in Tibetan Buddhism than the other strains, though they also appear in Pure Land Buddhism and are found elsewhere. While all strains of Buddhism on the one hand categorically deny immortality as the goal based upon the standard tenets of Buddhist logic, 
Plenty then turn around and sell immortality like used car salesmen. So many Buddhists want to be up in the heaven called Nirvana as empty yet separate beings who don't exist and yet live forever as Bodhisattvas saving the world. While there are lots of good points in the Bodhisattva vows, this is yet another case of bait and switch, where the results will be a bit more down to earth than most people are bargaining for. However, many Buddhists are also brainwashed into the ideal of becoming amazing super beings that they readily give up the notion that they could really understand anything in this lifetime in exchange for the dream that some zillion lifetimes down the road they may get to be spiritual superstars. However, as their mentality can be essentially like people who have bought into some weird cult, I don't recommend trying to convince them otherwise, as it generally just pisses them off. Just do your practice and take care of your own understanding, and then see what you can do from there. Now, as before, there is some weird truth to the immortality models on two fronts. First, from a technical point of view, what is traditionally called the Dharmakaya, deathless nirvana, tau, void, Buddha nature, etc., is indestructible, timeless, etc. But this is because it is not anything specific. This has already been discussed and simply stated. From this point of view, the notion of death or impermanence simply does not apply. The flip side of this, that of the ordinary transient world, nirmanakaya, etc., is that causality rings on indefinitely. This is an interesting way to look at things, and a very practical, insight-oriented way. From the point of view of time, cause and effect, things ripple out onto the universe like droplets cause ripples in water. This process, that is to say the world and us, has always been empty. If we are anything, it is a pattern of rippling sensations arising from causes and effects, and leading to causes and effects. Thus, we send ripples of whatever and however we are out into the causal future. If we are enlightened, that is one aspect of what ripples out onto the patterns we call time, and these ripples go on without definable end. Teachings of reincarnation are getting at this point in their somewhat problematic way. Thus we see that there is something to the immortality models, but they are not very helpful for doing insight practices, except to help one appreciate causality. I think they are much more useful in training in morality, despite their obvious paradigmatic problems. One great traditional analogy goes as follows. If you lit a candle, then lit another candle with that candle, and then blew out the first one, what is transmitted? This is causality without a permanent entity, resonance without continuity, an artificial but useful recognition of a pattern, and nothing more. THE TRANSCENDENCE MODELS Related to the immortality and bliss models, we have the transcendence models. These essentially promise that you will have the best of both worlds. You will get to be in the world while not of the world. Be able to enjoy all pleasant things while being immune to pain and difficulty, and thus live in a protected state of partial, selective transcendence. A lot of people try to emulate such a state in their practice. When presented with suffering, they either look away from it or try to make their attention so wide or vague that they don't notice it, and when pleasant things arise, they try to hang on to those experiences and expand them. While such a perfectly natural thing to do, this is the exact reverse of insight practice, and yet they may deeply feel that this is practicing for the transcendence they have been promised. As stated earlier, the unpredictable and obvious truth is that transcendence is bought at the price of a very deep, direct intimacy with life, all of life, both good and bad. Similarly, this deep intimacy with life is bought at the price of transcendence. While everyone nearly automatically looks to the good side of both, few consider that realization brings a deep, direct experience of all that is painful, and also the reluctant understanding of how empty and ephemeral pleasure is. One must be careful here, and I don't advocate buying into either extreme. Our ordinary lives have all this already, so don't look for something that is different from what is going on. Instead, look into your life as it is, and see the three characteristics of it directly, instant by instant. 
This is the gateway to the answer to the strange paradox that this is all pointing to. The Extinction Models On the flip side of the immortality models, and somewhat contrary to the transcendence models, we have the extinction models. These are essentially a promise that insight practices will either have you never reborn again or will make you non-existent somehow in some ordinary sense. The first basic flaw in these models is that they presume an entity to which things can occur, from which an insight point of view is already a problem. Insight practices at their best presume emptiness as always having been the case, and so to posit that there is something that was reborn flies directly against their root premises. Thus the notion that there is someone who either will not be reborn again or will somehow cease to be, assuming they were being before, is absurd and doesn't belong in the language of ultimate wisdom. However, page after page, Buddhism promises that there will be no more coming into any state of being, no more rebirth, no more self and that somehow this will get someone off the wheel of suffering. Here we get into as gray an area as it gets in spiritual language, between the weird promises of immortality models and the weird promises of the extinction models, we can get really into paradigmatic trouble. Somehow we are sure that one of these must be right, or maybe both are, or perhaps neither are, or some other combination we currently can't conceive of must be the correct one. However, all of these models are based upon a fundamental flaw, the misperception of sensations, and the conclusion based on this misperception that there was some separate, permanent us that all these dualistic concepts can apply to. There is not, nor has there ever been, though sensations occur anyway. It is a convenient, practical, working assumption, a convention, a way of speaking, but nothing more. Thus, all of these curious notions simply do not apply. Simply practicing and perceiving sensations clearly reveals the way out of these paradoxes. THE LOVE MODELS On a completely different note, there are the love models. These are hard to relate to any previous category except perhaps the emotional models, but they essentially involve some combination of us loving everyone, feeling love all the time, becoming love itself, or being loved by everyone. The first two are commonly found in various references, such as Sri Nisargadatta Maharaja's famous quotation, Wisdom tells me I am nothing. Love tells me I am everything. Between these two my life flows. This is not necessarily a bad quotation as quotations go, because it tries to encompass the apparent paradoxes of spiritual understanding. It is basically a restatement of the Tibetan concept of balancing emptiness and compassion, and I like it for this reason. However, lots of people think that enlightened beings will be radiating love all the time, walking around saying loving things, feeling profound love for all things at all times, and the like. Unfortunately, these things couldn't be further from the truth. While it does get sometimes easier to take the wider world of beings into consideration as the center point is seen through, this is very different from walking around in a state of continuous love. More sinister, deep, rarely articulated and yet compelling is the notion that somehow we will get enlightened, and then people will not just like us, they will love us. Wow, doesn't that one fail reality testing? Take the history of any of your favorite spiritual superheroes, the Buddha, Jesus Christ, St. John of the Cross, Rumi, etc., and notice the reactions people had to them. The notion that somehow you will be embraced, accepted, appreciated, respected, adored, cared for, or even liked by anyone just because of realization is, tragically, just another beautiful, disillusional dream. In short, think twice before quitting your day job or walking down the middle of the street in your guru outfit proclaiming your realization for all to love. Now it is true that you can borrow a lot of pre-programmed respect from some people just by ordaining, which viewed another way means that ordination might get you the respect that your realization should, in some idealized universe, provide for you. However, this will be to a strangely select audience 
and the games you have to participate in to be a part of that group are significant. You can also get a lot of respect by getting on some senior teacher list. But there are subtle forces that then come to bear that will have you denying a lot of your own humanity when in public, thus leading to the shadow sides I mentioned above. These points also hint at the social models that will follow in a bit. THE UNITY MODELS Related to the love models are the unity models, those that promise a palpable sense of your connection to everything else. This is another one of those models that contains some sort of truth, but is in fact one far extreme side of the unity extinction paradox. What we generally imagine is that we will stay an agent, a separate conscious, in control being, and yet will be part of everything in some mysterious way such as either feeling everything else at all times, or even more ludicrous, being in control of everything else at all times. I have already spent a lot of time on this model in the section No Self versus True Self, and in previous models, so we'll move on with the simple statement that those who believe in unitive models are missing something fundamental. In the same vein as the love models are the social models, these tend to involve all sorts of social implications or issues around enlightenment. For instance, we may imagine that enlightenment will automatically have certain desirable social implications, such as being accepted in a particular social role, such as that of a teacher, guide, mentor, spiritual friend, guru, leader, avatar, etc. This usually involves some poorly defined group of people accepting us. While spiritual attainments and unrelated qualities can sometimes inspire people to view us in these ways, there are absolutely no guarantees. As I have pointed out before, plenty of people with wisdom have been ridiculed, ostracized, persecuted, attacked, jailed, and murdered when they spoke from that place. In short, any social implication of one's realization, assuming one is correct in claiming or believing it, will be at the mercy of ordinary causal reality, just as with everything else, and ordinary causal reality can really suck sometimes. Further, the vast majority of people don't really have any clue what enlightenment is about, don't think that enlightenment really exists today, may not have enlightenment as part of their view of what is possible or even desirable, or may even find the notion that you think you are enlightened to be a threat to their religious beliefs or an indication of your grandiosity, arrogance, delusion, or psychosis. Having lived with these issues for over a decade, I can tell you that these reactions are as likely to be found in the social circles of Buddhism as they are in the social circles of any other meditative or non-meditative religious or non-religious tradition. Other social models involve enlightenment having to do with other people's opinions regarding whether or not we are enlightened, meaning that enlightenment is purely a social convention or collective designation that has nothing to do with reality or the individual's perception of it. In this model, just as we may elect a president, or at least believe we are casting votes for one, so it is with enlightenment. This is actually fairly common in a number of Western Buddhist circles, including some major retreat centers, in which they all bow to the senior teacher list, and yet hold the paradigm that no one really gets enlightened. While it is basically the neurosis of spiritual children, there are actually some real, practical truths hidden in this model. While our direct perception of reality will depend on our practice and insights, any attempts at directly promoting similar insights in others will be greatly helped or hindered by what people think of us, whether or not we are given some title, whether or not a lineage accepts us as a teacher in that lineage, and whether or not the concepts and language we use to describe and sell our realization fit in with the cultural expectations and norms of our social circles. Further, there are those who falsely think they are enlightened, because someone else thinks they are, and plenty of people on senior teacher lists that probably shouldn't be there. One way or another, it is worth examining our deepest beliefs regarding the social implications we imagine will occur when we get enlightened or more enlightened. 
These can have a big impact on our practice, our motivation to practice, and what kind of successes and failures we have in spreading insights around once we have insights ourselves. Unfortunately, most of our beliefs are likely to be somewhat unrealistic, springing from the understandable human need for recognition, role, and social status. Again, the further we find our dreams from our current reality, the more we need to look at what is happening right now, with those dreams and needs being one small part of the transit, causal sensations that are rising and vanishing. Stated in practical terms and by way of example, you could be a foreign medical grad that had trained well in some foreign school, completed a good foreign residency, be perfectly qualified to practice from the point of view of knowledge, experience, and talent, and yet not be allowed to practice in the United States until you had jumped through all the hoops. The same problem can arise when people go outside of a tradition or partially outside it, and yet do very good insight work. They have the knowledge but not the social designation, like the tin man in The Wizard of Oz who lacks a diploma, those who are enlightened, who have not gone through the standard channels, can run into problems. That said, it also gives the freedom to speak out without worrying about those channels liking what you say, and there is much about the standard channels to speak out about. I myself exist in a gray area like this, as do many modern teachers. I have accomplished much using the techniques of the Theravada, a tradition that explicitly says that only monks can know what I know, and usually only recognizes monks as lineage holders. This is a cultural and social problem, and highlights the truth embodied in the social models. I suspect there will be a lot more of this as the Dharma moves into the modern era and more people are successful. We need to come up with solutions to this problem that neither artificially elevate people nor artificially prevent them from sharing what they know that is of benefit to others. The Three Yanas While I am generally a diehard fan of the Theravada, I have a great appreciation for much of the rest of Buddhism and the world's other great mystical traditions. In that spirit, I offer the following. Traditional Tibetan training has been broken down into three yanas or vehicles, the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. These correspond very nicely to the needs of practitioners at various stages of the simple model presented above. The Hinayana is a set of techniques and practices that closely resembles many of the traditional trainings of the Theravada, and these are often confused for this reason. There are some historical relationships between the two that I do not wish to go into. The Hinayana's emphasis is on basic morality, stabilizing the mind, and looking into the three characteristics, such as all the fundamental practices and emphasis that I mentioned in Part 1. It is designed to get a person to the first stage of awakening, the first path which the Tibetans would call third path in the Tibetan five-path mode, or attaining the first Pahumni. Getting to the next stage of the simple model, or third path, involves a deep appreciation of interconnectedness in real time and a willingness to surrender to it. The Mahayana path provides methods for understanding this in abundance, with its strong emphasis on helping others and on the intrinsic emptiness, shunyata, of phenomena. The Bodhisattva vow, a fundamental part of the Mahayana path, not only expresses a deep willingness to surrender to and to understand interconnectedness, but its emphasis on not becoming a full Buddha can help people get away from the temptation of purely future-oriented goals and grandiose visions of perfection that can still be quite a challenge at this stage. To get to the next stage, one must completely understand the intrinsic luminosity of all phenomena without exception. The Vajrayana path, with its emphasis on intrinsic luminosity and tantric techniques that work with the awakened nature of the fullness of the emotional range, fits very well with the needs of one trying to gain the final understanding that emptiness is form. Dzogchen teachings also explicitly emphasize inherent luminosity, and that all things are of the nature of truth. I am still a big fan of the Theravada, obviously, but I have a strong appreciation for the tailored beauty of the three yana system of the Tibetans. It has an uncanny sophistication to it, 
and is part of what happens naturally even if you are following Theravada techniques. I am also a big fan of Zen, particularly its strong emphasis on keeping things down to earth, such as after enlightenment the laundry. If you learn any of these traditions well, you will come to see that they each contain the others. As always, it is not the tradition that's important, but that it works for you. In short, the non-duality models are the only models of awakening that hold up without apology, qualification, or exception. The rest of the models have serious problems, though each may contain some amount of truth in it, however poorly conveyed. Given sufficient experience of the real world, those who believe in literal interpretations of such confused models as the limited emotional range models and limited possible action models will either 1. be forced to come to the conclusion that no living being meets their definitions of enlightenment, 2. be forced into a dark corner of borderline psychotic rationalizations of what actually happens, or 3. be headed for a very rude awakening indeed, to make a bit of a bad pun. There is only one thing worse in my mind than students getting caught up in the dogma of the worst of the models, and that is realized teachers getting caught by them. Just as it is disappointing when those with long retreat resumes but no fundamental insight want to encourage faith in their beautiful tradition by appearing to know more than they actually do, it is doubly disappointing when realized beings get caught in these fallacious models acting as if they worked in the fantasy land way that most people think they do. I know exactly where they are coming from and how tempting this is, but I dream of a day when such things never happen. The Dharma world would be so much better off if teachers were honest about what realization is and ain't, both with their students and also with themselves. Don't think this sort of dishonesty doesn't occur. I have seen some of my very best and most realized teachers fall into this trap, and have also done so myself more times than I can count. Learn from those who have had to learn the hard way and are willing to admit this. Ditching Our Stuff versus Ditching the Split While these two models are stated implicitly above, I thought I would summarize them again to make sure that I have made this important point clear. There are models of awakening that involve getting rid of all of our stuff, like our issues, flaws, quirks, pains, negative emotions, traumas, personalities, cultural baggage, childhood scars, relationship difficulties, insecurities, fears, strange notions, etc. Such models underlie most of the mainstream visions of spiritual attainment. What is funny is that lots of people spend so much time working so hard to get rid of all their stuff, but think that enlightenment, such as ditching the illusion of the dualistic split, is largely unattainable. I have exactly the opposite view, that ditching the split is very attainable, but getting rid of all of our stuff is completely impossible. When I hear about those who wish to attain a type of Buddhahood that is defined not by having any stuff, I usually think to myself that the countless eons they usually claim are necessary to accomplish this are a gross underestimation. The real world is about stuff, and enlightenment is about the real world. What is very nice about ditching the split, aside from the fact that it can be done, is that now we can be friends with our stuff naturally, even if it sucks. We can work with it as well as can be expected and from a place of great clarity and understanding. Stage by stage, ditching the split makes all the slow but necessary healing so much easier, or at least more tolerable. Thus, take the time to work with your stuff, or try not to, as you like. Our stuff is here and being dealt with anyway. However seriously, consider doing the practices that can ditch the split, such as those that ask us to see the true nature of the sensations that make up all of our stuff, and our attempts to deal with it. Try these two scenarios on for size and see which seems to fit with your goals for your life, with your vision of a life well lived. In the first, imagine working with your stuff as best you can for most of your life, never really knowing what is just needless mind noise and mental duress caused by a lack of basic clarity. In your old age, you do the practices that lead to realization. 
the benefits of that level of understanding may then be used for yourself and others during the remaining years of your life. In the second scenario, you take the time early in your spiritual practice to attain realization, following the precise instructions and recommendations of a well-developed insight tradition. You then use that level of increased clarity, acceptance, intimacy with life, and transcendence to work on your stuff and benefit others for the rest of your life. The second approach seems vastly superior to me, but it is still possible that these things are a matter of taste. One way or the other, take responsibility for the choice you make. Section 20 The Nothing to Do and You Are Already There Schools on a somewhat different note, I feel the need to address, which is to say, shoot down with every bit of rhetorical force I have, the notion promoted by some teachers and even traditions that there is nothing to do, nothing to accomplish, no goal to obtain, no enlightenment other than the ordinary state of being, no practice or tradition that is of value, no technique that will help. The other side of this same coin is the point of view that you already are realized, already there, already completely accomplished, and you essentially should just be able to be told this by them to understand it for yourself, which, were it true, would have been very nice of them, except that it is complete bullshit. The nothing-to-do school and the you-are-already-there school are both basically vile extremes on the same basic notion that all effort to attain to mastery is already missing the point, an error of craving and grasping. They both contradict the fundamental premise of this book, namely that there is something amazing to attain and understand, and that there are specific reproducible methods that can help you do that. Here is a detailed analysis of what is wrong with these and related perspectives. Some defenders of these views will claim that they are the most immediate, most complete, highest, and most direct teachings that one could promote, but I will claim that they do not lead to much that is good that cannot be attained by conceptual frameworks that are not nearly so problematic or easily misconstrued. First, these notions encourage people not to practice. The defenders can say what they like, but again and again I see people who subscribe to these sorts of notions resting on their cleverness and grand posteriors and not actually getting it in the same way that my accomplished meditator friends get it. It seems so comforting, this notion that you are already something that you, in fact, are not, or that there is nothing that you could do that would be useful. The notion that people are already something begs the question, what are they? These views tend to imply that they are already something such as perfect, enlightened, realized, awakened, or something even worse, such as awareness, cosmic consciousness, the Atman, an aspect of the divine, etc., all of which cannot actually be found. While Buddhism does sometimes go there, using such terms as Dharmakaya and Buddha nature, these are very slippery, high concepts that were added later and require a ton of explanation and practical experience to keep them from becoming the monsters they nearly always become in less experienced hands. Awakening involves clearly perceiving universal characteristics of phenomena. While one can attempt to rest comfortably in the intellectual notion that these universal characteristics are there anyway, and be comforted by teachings such as easily misconstrued statements like, I have gained nothing by complete and unexcelled enlightenment. The whole, core, essential, root point of all of this is that there is something to be gained by becoming one of the people that can actually directly perceive the true nature of things clearly enough to change fundamentally the way reality is perceived in real time. The straight truth is that the vast majority of people do not start out being able to do anything even close to this and most are lucky to be able to stay with three breaths in sequence before wandering off into their neurotic crap, much less understand anything liberating about those breaths. The notion that everyone already is someone who can perceive reality the way the masters do, without effort in real time, is a fantastic falsehood, lie, untruth, 
and in short one great load of apathy created insanity. If one goes around asking people without very good insight into these things, such as the unenlightened, about basic Dharma points, points that are obvious to those who have learned to pay attention well, one does not find that everyone already is a person who is perceiving things at the level that makes the difference the Dharma promises. Further, even those of lower levels of enlightenment generally have a hard time saying they are really able to perceive the emptiness, luminosity, selflessness, causality, transience, ephemality, etc., of reality in real time at all times without having to really do anything. In short, the notion that this is as easy as just being what you already are is wildly off the mark, as the vast majority of people are woefully underdeveloped on the perceptual front in question. Thus, all reality testing reveals that the two schools are missing a very fundamental point. While the universal characteristics are always manifesting in all things and at all times, there are those who can perceive this well and those who cannot. And meditative training, conceptual frameworks, techniques, teachers, texts, discussions, and the like can all contribute to developing the internal skills and wiring to be able to realize fully what is possible, as thousands of practitioners throughout the ages have noticed. I myself have known before and after, meaning that I know what I was capable of perceiving and understanding before I underwent meditative training and after, and no amount of being fed the concept that I was already as developed as I could be, was already enlightened, was already there, had nothing to do, nothing to develop, was already as clear as I could be, was already perfectly awake, etc., was going to make the difference that practicing for thousands of hours over many years did. It would be like saying, you are already a concert pianist, you just have to realize it, or you are already a nuclear physicist, you just have to realize it, or you already speak every language, you just have to realize it. It would be like saying to a two-year-old, You already understand everything you need to know, so stop learning new things now. Or to a severe paranoid schizophrenic, You already are as sane as anyone and do not need to take your medicines and should just follow the voices that tell you to kill people. Or to a person with heart disease, Just keep smoking and eating fried pork skins and you'll be healthy. Or to an illiterate person with no math skills who keeps having a hard time navigating in the modern world and is constantly ripped off. No need to learn to read to do math, as you are just fine as you are. Or saying to a greedy, corrupt, corporate raiding, white collar criminal, fascist, alcoholic wife beater, Hey, dude, you are like beautiful, perfect flower of the now moment, already enlightened. Insert talk here. You are already doing. And not doing just fine. Like, wow, so keep up the good work, man. Would you let a blind and partially paralyzed untrained stroke victim perform open-heart surgery on your child based on the notion that they are already an accomplished surgeon, but just have to realize it? Would you follow the Dharma teachings of people who feed other people this kind of crap? Those who imagine that everyone somehow in their development already became as clear and perceptive as they could be just by being alive, is missing something very profound. Do they imagine that you can just remind people of these things, and suddenly all wisdom and clarity will suddenly appear? This is mind-bogglingly naive. I have gained so much that is good and lost so much that is bad by learning to practice well, learning to concentrate, learning the theory, learning insight practices, going through the organic process of the stages over decades, reading the stories, reading about the lives of the great practitioners, having Dharma conversations with Dharma friends, debating points, wrestling with difficult concepts and how to apply them to my actual life, teaching, learning, studying, playing with the powers, writing, realizing how things are, and delving deeply into the sensate world that I am astounded that anyone would want to try to reduce to something so grand, wonderful, deep, rich, amazing and profound to such a paltry, ridiculous concept as the notion that all that is already in place in everyone regardless of what they have done or not done. 
all those benefits skills abilities powers states stages experiences insights and fundamental perceptual changes simply were not available until i did the work took the time participated in the process and no amount of anyone telling me it was otherwise would have helped or made it so i know of no examples where the necessary and sufficient causes for the arising of these benefits did not involve some kind of work in short i say to those who persist in promoting the nothing to do school and the you are already there school stop it you are spreading craziness and this craziness that many people will not be able to tell is craziness and that appears to include those who promote these fallacies while i usually do not go so far as to tell people that there is something so deeply wrong with what they think and how they communicate it that they should stop it immediately and forever this particular point is a great example of something i consider abhorrent and worthy of profound revision regardless of any kind intentions the teachings of these schools take a half-truth that seems so very nice and seductive to neurotic practitioners who can barely stand another achievement trip and have such a hard time with self-acceptance and that half-truth is distorted into sugary poison there is no need to tie the three useful concepts of one no self two self-acceptance in the ordinary sense and three the notion that the sensations that lead to understanding if clearly perceived over and over again are manifesting right here right now to such a perversely twisted yet seemingly benign and similar concept as the one they unfortunately promote final points spirituality that ignores or covers up our inevitable dark or undesirable sides is doomed to be bitten and burned by them models of realization that involve high ideals of human perfection have caused so much dejection despair and misguided effort throughout the ages that i have no qualms about doing my very best to try and smash them to pieces on the sharp rocks of reality they are not completely useless and there is some value in keeping the standards to which we aspire high as we will see in the next chapter but most of the time they are taken way too seriously to be helpful at all it is clear that those who adhere most rigidly to the self-perfection models of enlightenment are also very often those who believe enlightenment is the least attainable and feel the most disempowered in their practice and spiritual life not surprisingly those with the highest standards for what realization will entail often have the lowest standards for their own practice and what they hope to actually attain in this lifetime they are the armchair quarterbacks of the spiritual path becoming grandiose about aspiring to high ideals seems to be a common coping mechanism for dealing with a lack of confidence and insight as christopher tidmus one of my best and most honest teachers often says we do not come from a self-perfection lineage there are those who do explicitly come from self-perfection lineages i wish them good luck they'll need it so what is full enlightenment this has been a source of considerable debate confusion and division in buddhism particularly between the three main traditions of the theravada tibetan and zen i'm going to jump into the fray as is my typical style but realize that it is going to be a messy business these debates tend to boil down to arahats versus buddhas a distinction i hope to make clear shortly zen is largely on the side of buddhas though their intriguing vagueness on the subject can sometimes make it somewhat uncertain what they mean by buddha most of the time the zen kids actually seem to mean arahat when they say buddha though i wouldn't go around saying that if you want to be liked in my more cynical moments i think their models end at stream entry on the other hand the most mythological descriptions of arahats in the theravada are often closer to the stylized descriptions of buddhas so the problem is obviously widespread and goes both ways all kinds of absurd tensions and divisions have arisen around this one point between the theravada and the mahayana when at least in terms of the actual dogma there is really no conflict how these ideals relate to non-buddhist traditions is complex and i offer the simple notion that these things all converge rather than diverge at this level 
the theravada clearly acknowledges that an era had as a stage below buddhahood and nauvoo tibetans seem particularly gleeful at this to digress again for just a moment there is an apocryphal and absurd story in circulation that when the teachings on emptiness were first given a large number of arahats dropped dead of heart attacks this tends to cause conceited laughter and smiles in the faces of nauvoo tibetan buddhists which is about as sick a reaction as i can imagine when will this sort of vile and absurd defamation of other valuable traditions end the arahat has attained to complete and utter elimination of the illusions of permanence satisfactoriness and duality separate self and now perceives reality non-dualistically they know the joy of clarity of freedom as well as the fullness of their humanity thus the notion that an arahat is self-realized is an oxymoron perpetuated by regular morons arahatship may correlate with the sixth bhumi or the eighth bhumi in the tibetan model depending on the sources of information there are also reasons to associate it with the tenth bhumi but i digress some tibetan buddhists will tell you that the four paths and the ten bhumis are two divergent tracks of awakening but this is a load of quinine excrement ditching the split is ditching the split and the rest is gravy enlightenment is exactly the same regardless of the tradition one followed to attain it this is non-negotiable and those who say otherwise are merely doing so for recruiting purposes or because they don't know any better or both however it is clearly stated by both traditions that arahats may not have completely integrated their understanding into their life and so may not have eliminated all unskillful residual habits although defining unskillful here is as problematic as defining appropriate there are many stories in the vinaya and in modern times about arahats behaving in strange ways and this goes ten times for buddhas in the mahayana and vajrayana literature today regardless of how you define unskillful eliminating all unskillful residual habits is sometimes seen as such an undertaking that many schools of buddhism hold it to be an absurd and impractical ideal however there is some place for such high standards if they are supplemented with a very big dose of reality patience and a sense of humor buddhists are defined as having mastered all of the concentration states and psychic powers whereas arahats may or may not have it should be noted that even enlightened beings can master almost all of the psychic powers and all of the concentration states buddhas are defined as having understood the teachings and the truth of things to the very end whereas arahats have just fully understood these the distinction here is lost on me further both sides also state clearly that there are bodhisattvas that may one day become buddhas again to stick around means being nothing but empty awareness or dharmakaya in true self terms as this is all that is permanent but not a thing or localized in a specific place etc as before this understanding is clearly present in arahats bodhisattvas of the eighth bahumi and above and buddhas thus this whole bodhisattva thing and all the talk of the buddha manifesting as a bodhisattva is just a skillful true self or dhammakaya teaching as before and not actually in conflict with the theravada except to those who misunderstand what these teachings are really about it is this sort of confusion that starts all sorts of absurd and completely useless conversations about rebirth that take away time from real practice and useful inquiry all talk of buddha nature is actually the same true self teaching as before balanced and strong understanding of both emptiness and compassion is vital for understanding the middle way and for benefiting others and this point is found in all the buddhist traditions of which i am aware remember how in the beginning of part two i stated that the point of all of this is to become a master of the relative and the ultimate when one becomes an arahat which could from one point of view be considered becoming a master of the ultimate then the relative world of phenomena is fully understood to be also the ultimate this then naturally brings in the ideal of buddhahood as the next logical standard to aspire to as suddenly one cannot truly be a master of the ultimate without also being a master of the relative 
Go become an Arahat and see for yourself what conclusion you draw from your experience. There is a story of a Thai Arahat who took Bodhisattva vows. In doing so, he pissed off a lot of die-hard Theravada fans, and many began to think that he must not have actually been an Arahat. Again, this is a fairly sick reaction to a beautiful and noble acknowledgement that we can always learn more about how to make a positive difference in this world. Remember long ago when I mentioned that the first training was also the last training? We must continue to find skillful ways to live in the world after realizations, just like everyone else. On the other hand, the attainment of arahatship is the final understanding that the whole process is simply happening by itself, so whatever progress occurs towards Buddhahood and living well in the world, however defined, is from that point on completely natural and inevitable. On reading the old texts, it becomes very clear that not only do arahats have a lot left to learn about living in the ordinary world, but so did the Buddha. He was constantly learning more and more about teaching, dealing with people, and running a big organization. In short, don't imagine that you will ever be saved from having to learn how to live well in the world. It is an endless undertaking. In the end, it must reluctantly be conceded that final and full enlightenment involves the death of a highly enlightened being, something called paranirvana, or nirvana without remainder. I don't mean to be needlessly morbid, but while there is still a body and a mind, there is still suffering, as our old friend Sid the Buddha defined it, and thus it is not until a highly enlightened being dies that the whole process is completed. This is not meant in any way to promote the suicide of highly enlightened beings, but simply to acknowledge the implications of being born and to be doctrinally correct. However, this again falls prey to the interconnectedness versus complete transcendence debates just as the Arahat versus Buddha debates do. So from a certain point of view, the question of what is full enlightenment cannot be answered without all beings getting enlightened and then dying. This is obviously unlikely to occur any time soon. However, from another point of view, all beings are already enlightened but have yet to realize it and thus the debate is meaningless. Thus, you now have some understanding of why these ridiculous debates have been around for so long, and why I obviously am not going to resolve them here. As with all logical systems that involve false assumptions of duality, which they all do, any argument taken far enough either goes in circles, contradicts itself, or both. Put your time into clear practice, and not into thinking about these things too much. INTEGRATION A friend of mine read through an earlier version of this work and commented that there was very little in this book on integration, the process by which one's life comes to be a natural reflection of one's insights. I replied that I could write something about integration when I knew something about it, which he thought was funny, particularly knowing me. However, over the years I have learned a few things about the endlessly complex, mysterious, and yet strangely ordinary topic of integration, and about living in the world during and in the wake of insights. There are many sources such as Path with Heart and After the Ecstasy, The Laundry, both by Jack Cornfield, that do a much better treatment of the issue than what follows, but hopefully some of these simple points will be of use. The first point is one that I have made implicitly above, but will make explicit here. Go ahead and get some deep insight to integrate in the first place. I have lots of friends on the spiritual path that seem to be doing work that I associate with integration when they don't yet have any fundamental insight to integrate. This seems to be a very strange way to go if you ask me. They seem to be working on their stuff without the clarity and perspective that comes from realizations into the truth of things. Go get enlightened. Become a stream-enterer at the very least and preferably become an arahat. Without these realizations, it is very hard to determine what needs work and what is just excessive delusion and mind noise created by the illusion of duality that still remains. Thus, when on retreat or doing formal practice, think carefully about what you want to achieve. Do you want to work on your stuff or work on fundamental insights? Realize that it might not be easy to do either, and so might be very hard to do both simultaneously. 
if you want to gain deep insights then work on your stuff from that foundation of basic clarity or do you want to work on your stuff until 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 when until you don't have any stuff good luck that brings me to the second point which is to pick your battles we can't do everything we can't have it all we simply don't have the time or energy spiritual technology will not change these simple facts of life we can only be working on so many things at once and still do any of them well we need breaks downtime and balance however if we are wise and discerning we can craft a set of priorities for ourselves that honors our unique spiritual needs relationship needs career needs recreational needs and family needs as well as the needs of others we can do this in a way that is realistic and allows us to keep making good use of our life without burning out or stagnating. No one can ever tell you exactly how to do this. You have your own needs and life situation. Work with it as best you can. The third point about integration and living in the world that I have had to learn the hard way is a concept that I recently heard articulated very well by my friend Tom in the phrase, Right plane, right time which was his way of saying, use the correct conceptual and paradigmatic framework for the correct situation. Like the simple lists of Part 1, this phrase could be the basis of an entire book. See the difficult but excellent Spectrum of Consciousness by Ken Welber, which spends a lot of time explaining how to keep our paradigm straight and not mix them up. From the point of view of integration, it basically means that one generally should use a way of approaching a situation or problem that fits with that situation or problem. One should be conscious of the conceptual frameworks that one uses when approaching each aspect of one's life, as some conceptual frameworks or ways of being may not be helpful or appropriate for certain situations. I will illustrate this by way of some examples. When doing insight practices, it is useful to assume a few things. One should assume that no such thing as a body exists, nor does a mind exist, nor are there natural boundaries inherent in sensations. There are sensations that arise and pass quickly, are not able to satisfy due to the illusion of duality, and are empty, meaning that they imply no self or separateness that is in control. It is not all that useful to get overly concerned with what these sensations actually are or why they arose. When doing just about anything else, this way of proceeding may cause gigantic problems. For instance, when driving a car, one must assume that one's car is a separate entity, one that should not collide with other cars on the road. One must assume solidity and that one is in control of one's car. One must pay attention to the edges of specific things and be careful about the details of one's driving environment, one's destination, and the rules of the road. For real-world problems, I have found that real-world solutions are the way to go. Right playing, right time. It must also be said that paying more attention to our sensate world helps both with insight practices and the daily life. Another example to contrast with the paradigm useful in insight practices is in human relationships. Imagine someone saying to you, You are so empty. You are so unsatisfactory. You are so transient. It doesn't work. Imagine going into a bank at which you have recently overdrawn your account and saying, I do not exist as a separate entity. There is no I or mine that can be found. Thus, all this talk of me owing you something is nonsense. We are interdependent luminosity. This just doesn't fly. Right plane, right time. These are ridiculous examples, but if you hang out in spiritual scenes and pay attention to the conceptual frameworks people use, and when they use them, you will find numerous similar errors in judgment. These examples also illustrate the important concept of being careful when talking about one's practice. Choose the correct words or degree of silence for the people around you and the situations in which you find yourself, particularly soon after dramatic occurrences. I can't tell you the number of times I have looked like a completely inconsiderate nutcase when I opened my big flapping piehole to the wrong people soon after some intense insight or rapture had occurred. As a dead French occultist once said, to tell someone something they can't understand is as bad as telling them a lie. 
wise words. Cultivate a network of friends with whom you can share these things, or keep a diary if this is not practical, or both. There is something helpful about being able to talk about unusual things in a safe and appropriate context. It is not uncommon for people who get deeply into practice to encounter two issues. It is difficult to learn to go easily between one way of being and another, from one conceptual framework and another, and that practice and the world seem to be in direct conflict. Given our dualistic illusion, it often seems that we must let things go in some sort of literal sense, such as quitting a job in order to let it go in the insight sense to see the true nature of the sensations that make up the process. This is obviously not true, but such erroneous logic can be very tempting. As to the rest of integration, well, if we have insights to integrate, it just seems to happen. That's about the best I can do. Life happens as before, and so it goes. We grow, we learn, we get sick and we die. To quote the song from a Bogart movie, the fundamental things apply as times go by. Go and read some extensive book on the subject and tell me whether or not it basically said the same thing while using a whole lot more words to do so. Still, such books can be helpful. It is possible. So why am I mentioning all of these states and stages that are thought by many to be largely mythical and unattainable? Because they are absolutely otherwise, that's why. People do attain these states today, though they tend only to talk about them to their teachers and to close friends, who have enough experience in this stuff to understand and not have odd reactions to these disclosures. I assure you that I wouldn't have bothered writing all of this if I didn't think that it was possible for those reading this book to master this stuff. A friend of mine was on a retreat in Burma and attained to Second Path as confirmed by Upandita. He was finally done with his retreat and was taken to the airport by one of the people who helped to run the monastery, who incidentally was a stream enterer. As my friend was leaving, he yelled to him across the terminal, "'Come back for number three, meaning, "'Come back and attain third path.' Note that many ways in which what underlies this statement differs from the paradigm you would likely find in your basic Western Buddhist. First, most Western Buddhists don't really believe that after a few months of good practice, you could get enlightened or even more enlightened. They do not believe it is simply a matter of following simple instructions, moving through the clearly defined insights and tagging a path. In fact, I often tell this story to Western Buddhists, many of whom have been on numerous insight retreats led by teachers trained by the best Burmese masters, and they say things like, What do you mean, third path? It makes me want to scream when they don't even know the basic dogma of enlightenment, much less anything practical about it. Most Western teachers wouldn't have the guts to stand up and say, Yeah, he did it. He got second path. Assuming they would even be in a position to evaluate such a person's practice. Even if they did, it would likely be a huge taboo secret. Here's my point. It can be done. It is done. And there are people who can help you do it. Practice, practice, practice. This is the big difference between those who are merely into giving lip service to Buddhism and those who really get what the old boy was talking about. Go on retreats and actually follow the instructions to the letter all day long. Find people who know how it's done and hang out with them. Keep it simple. Avoid magical thinking and abandoning common sense. The simple fact that you have read this book means that the ball is now in your court. There is more than enough information presented here on straightforward techniques that have a great track record of performing as advertised. As a large and wise chef in a gourmet seafood restaurant once said to me, I have two words for you. Perseverance furthers. More on the mushroom factor. One of the reasons that more people who make progress do not talk about progress could be the fact that, as practice deepens, the exaggerated importance to the meditator of thoughts of my attainment, I am enlightened, etc., gradually falls away and assumes its proper proportion in its proper place in things. However, this does not mean that such language cannot be used. While there may routinely be no good reasons to talk about attainments, or even good reasons not to, 
there is a long and glorious tradition of compassionate meditation masters and enlightened beings who braved the consequences and told the world that it could be done, that they had done it, and they were going to tell all of those who hadn't how they could do it too. The results of this varied from founding major religions to being executed or both, but such are the caprices of reality. It is interesting that Buddhism started out very much as a tradition in which those who were highly attained were often loudly proclaimed to be so by themselves and others, with the specific details of their skills and understandings made clearer. The motivation for this was that such individuals were valuable resources for others, and this should be known for the benefit of all. This wide cultural phenomena of meditation masters being out is abundantly clear in the ancient texts, and occurs to varying degrees in Asian countries today. In the West, the situation is often remarkably different from this early practice. There seem to be two basic styles of code used when advertising Dharma teachers. The first is simply to use a grand title such as Wazu Tuku, Supreme Luminous Dharma King. The second type of code is the style of a resume for a job. Jane Rainbow is the author of three books. She has been teaching meditation for 17 years internationally and is a member of the Buddhist Flower Society. Notice that neither of these bios tell you anything about what they may actually know, which traditions they draw from, their attitude toward scholarship and the standard dogmas, which techniques they are masters of or teach, what they have attained or claim to have attained, what their personality is like, what their strengths and weaknesses as a teacher and person are, who trained them, the lineage or lineages by which they are claimed, their level of ability to their students, though teachers internationally is often an ominous clue. Why is it that they teach? What they expect from their students, particularly as regards to money, vows, and exclusive loyalty. How many students they already have, whether or not they will talk about real practice directly. If you run into trouble with them, is there a governing organization that can address this? What is astounding is how few students will ever ask their teachers about any of the specific practical issues. These are the questions that should initially be considered when seeking a teacher, and yet you almost never see them addressed on a retreat center brochure. Imagine a university where none of the professors would tell you about their research, who funds their work, where they got their degree, what courses they teach, who taught them, what their specialty is, or even why they like being professors. This would be just a bit strange, wouldn't it? This sort of information is typically available for public consumption on the university web page. There is something very balanced and reasonable about this. When I see a presentation at the school I currently attend, someone generally tells you exactly who the person is, what they are working on, highlights of what they have published in the past, and what positions and degrees they currently hold, and why they are qualified to speak on the topic of the day. Perhaps I am particularly naive and idealistic, but I imagine a spiritual world where this would be standard practice as well. I dream that this would simultaneously cut down on otherworldly spiritual ideals, provide faith that it can be done, demystify the process of awakening, and bring the whole thing back down to earth. There is obviously a long way to go before such a dream is likely to be a reality, but hopefully this little book will be one small step towards that. There are cool things our minds can do and perceive, and there are definable techniques that lead to those cool things. Why does it have to be more complex than that? In my more cynical moments I have sometimes thought that Western teachers' bios could be just as easily read. Jane is a Sagittarius from California. Her favorite color is turquoise, and she is a mediocre chef. Or Wazoo is old and of substantial girth. His favorite movie is Animal House. These would give you about as much practical information as most teacher bios do in the West. Obviously, the assumption is that if they have been practicing for so many years, have a fancy name, or if someone let them publish a book or teach internationally, then they must be in some generic way a good teacher of something. 
there may also be the unspoken assumption that there is some unnamed but reliable body of evaluators of teachers somewhere that have checked the person out either of these may or may not be true and some traditions do a much better job of being clear and honest about these things than others do some other reasons that more people don't talk about mastery when it actually happens or clearly advertise themselves are that they don't want to make others jealous or intimidated also talking about the stages of insight practice can sound quite outrageous and bizarre further with clarity comes mystery and sometimes it can seem inappropriate to talk about something that can sometimes be seen so slippery and sometimes even uncertain the late great Akanka once stated that even Arahats could sometimes be unsure about whether or not they are Arahats. Others, including one of my favorite teachers, have said that all Arahats are always sure they are Arahats. This second view is a bit extreme, and it is a limited possible thought model. You know what I think of those. Thus, a major reason for secrecy or codes seems to be self-preservation, though not in the sense of ego-preservation. These are kind motives, but they also perpetuate the atmosphere of secrecy and confusion so present in the modern mystical world. The unfortunate truth is that talking about attainments tend to cause many more unhelpful reactions than helpful ones. It tends to isolate the person who has attained these things, cause people to think of them as way too wonderful or completely nuts, or both, and generally project all sorts of naive and unhelpful things onto them such as a limited emotional range model, or even worse, a limited possible action model. This can create situations that foster the abuse of sex, money, drugs, and power that seems to plague gurus and other spiritual teachers with some regularity. Freud would have had a field day with this. As regards the bizarre and fantastic projections that are commonly associated with teachers, gurus, and all the other potentially enlightened beings, they tend to arise because there is not enough widespread information on how misleading the limited emotional range models are and what preposterous junk the limited possible action models are, not to mention the lack of information on the absurdity of the wide range of other magical attributes that are imagined to arise from simply ceasing to identify with ordinary phenomena. I considered writing a whole chapter called Adults in Fantasy Land, but hopefully the preceding sentence will do the trick. This lack of information on the ordinariness of realized individuals creates a vicious cycle in which those who know don't say, I am enlightened and ordinary, because if they do, then they will be viewed in very strange ways, despite what they say, and because they don't tell, no one but them knows. Thus the strong potential for nonsensical projections and reactions remains. While sometimes the masses are fed manure and kept in the dark, if they are fed nothing at all, then they will often invent manure to feed themselves. No one is happy to learn that perfection in some ordinary sense is impossible, and some will continue to seek the perfect guru, community, or even self for years despite the fact that such things do not exist. I have few qualms about blaming those who currently do know for not doing more to debunk these myths and for not being willing to speak out loudly against the large amount of nonsensical, magical thinking that is out there, though I can just as easily understand why they may not be in any mood to take the heat. As things currently stand, all the attention and confusion that can come from revealing one's wisdom and understanding can often not seem to be worth it, despite how much one may want to help others. This can be particularly true if one does not want to be a guru or member of the Dharma jet set, but just wants to help people learn this stuff without becoming some kind of odd object of obsessive adoration or criticism. It seems that you can only help those with very clear, strong, and noble motivations who are willing to listen and also be intelligent and realistic about their relationship to you as a fellow human being and with whom your personality seems to fit fairly well. Further, you can only help those who will actually practice, engage, and inquire. It turns out to be a very small group most of the time. You could also say that you can only teach those who didn't really need you to teach them in the first place, as they were going to do it anyway. 
it is possible, though not necessarily advisable, to drop all kinds of really glaring and even tacky hints that one has attained to mastery of some aspect of the amazing states and stages of the spiritual path, and yet have no one show even the slightest sign that they have picked up on them. Even more bizarre is how few people, having been directly and unambiguously told that they are around someone who has attained to some deep level of mastery of this stuff by standard methods, will actually ask reasonable questions about how they could do the same. Even more surprising is how few of those who do ask good questions will then use this practical information wisely. As Bill Hamilton put it, I have a treasure of infinite value that nobody wants. He was only barely exaggerating, even as regards many of those who consider themselves meditators and Buddhists. Thus, out of practical self-preservation and a reluctant respect for the fact that most people seem not to want to hear about actual mastery of this stuff, the majority of those who do master concentration and or insight practices tend not to talk about it, or only to a very few. See Saints and Psychopaths by Bill Hamilton for an interesting discussion of some of these issues, particularly the etiquette of enlightenment. All this contributes to the mushroom factor. Lastly, there seems to be a somewhat odd lack of support for up-and-coming potential teachers. One of my friends has commented that it can be much easier to get enlightened than to get lineaged, that is, officially acknowledged that you are a qualified teacher and a reasonable enough person to be allowed to teach, have students referred to you, be a part of the monitoring process that keeps teachers on the up-and-up, and, up, and that sort of thing. Two of my very best, most dedicated, and accessible teachers were not officially sanctioned, despite their high attainments, great teaching ability, and extensive knowledge of spiritual practice. Also, there often seems to be little clear articulation of roles that occupy the middle ground, little well-developed sense of apprenticeship, little sense of intermediate territory between fully lineage teacher and student. The degree of these issues varies by tradition. It is true that there are some good reasons why the senior teaching establishments are slow or reluctant to allow new teachers into the carefully guarded inner circles. There are certain individuals who possess the mastery needed to be a teacher, but are not good choices for other reasons, with mental pathology and odd personality traits being chief among them. There are those whose political skills have been such that they have managed to get sanctioned despite the fact that they were not qualified to teach at the level they claimed they could, with predictable associated problems following suit. However, current senior teachers, many of which are the first generation of Westerns to be so, do not yet seem to be quite as comfortable giving sanction to new teachers as their Asian teachers tended to be giving sanction to them. Perhaps this will correct itself given time as there is a lot of unused talent out there and a lot of unmet demand for authentic teachers. On the other hand, making a living as a teacher can be hard, and who needs more competition for scarce donations or seats on the front platform at overbooked meditation centers? It is also true that numerous meditation traditions that have come to the West have many people teaching in them without the foggiest idea that they are not at all qualified to do so. The old texts state that one should have at least crossed the A&P event to teach, though in the tradition I come from, they consider second path as the standard minimum requirement for any sort of teaching. Basically, chancing into a path is impressive, but being able to tag another one demonstrates reproducible competence. I again blame the mushroom factor for this, as I suspect that if people knew what reasonable standards are for teachers, and that there are actually those who meet these, many would then realize that they simply shouldn't be teaching and bow out gracefully. Beyond this, there are also good reasons to question the very concepts of teacher and student, and the disturbing and often unquestioned rigidity with which they are sometimes applied. One person may have an understanding that they share with someone else, and then turn around and ask them a question about something that the person, who was a student, just moments before, is skilled in. 
I have come to the conclusion that some of the best teaching happens in conversations between friends, and not in the context of very short, formal interviews with lineage teachers who have just flown in for the week. The climate of secrecy surrounding conversations about mastery of these things, restrictive lineage issues, and rarity of engaging in long, deep conversations with harried and overcommitted jet-set Dharma teachers combine to create what I term the Dharma Underground. This refers to those associations of those who are in the know, but not officially sanctioned, who cautiously seek one another out, support one another, and exchange ideas about how to go deeper in ways that have everything to do with friendship and empowerment, and little to do with formal lineage or rigid concepts of teacher and student. Often, such conversations occur in silent retreat centers, or in other ways that involve breaking some of the rules that may be helpful from one perspective, but also defend the semi-arbitrary privileges of the lineage elite while disempowering and marginalizing others with valuable and accurate knowledge and experience to share. Interestingly, when reading the old texts, I often get the feeling that a significantly more egalitarian, balanced, and friendly style was much more the model that occurred in the early Buddhist community, and I often long for its return. It is interesting that, unlike tantric traditions and many others, the Theravada does not have any formal vows of secrecy regarding details of mastery of its practices. Perhaps they would just be needless overkill. Section 21 So who the heck is Daniel M. Ingram? I suppose that if I'm going to rant about how most Dharma teachers do not do a good job of clearly stating what they know, what they teach, etc., then I should try to avoid being a complete hypocrite and thus answer some of those questions here. Here's my Western teacher bio, the way I would have it on a retreat center brochure. Daniel is a double Aquarian from North Carolina who prefers to be called Dharma Dan, Dude, or simply Honored Archmystic Sir. His favorite movie is Raising Arizona. Just kidding. Let's try that again. Daniel is an extroverted Gen X intellectual. He is known for his pronounced enthusiasm, lip-flapping, grandiosity, eccentricity, and calling people on their stuff and shadow sides regardless of whether or not this is helpful or even accurate. He is an Arahat and has a solid mastery of the basic concentration states from the first jahana to Niroda Samapati, including the pure Lan Jahanas. He also has a solid knowledge of Buddhist theory and the texts, and because of these three areas of expertise considers himself a qualified teacher. He was also authorized and encouraged to teach by a lineaged abbot of the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition. When it comes to insight practices, he has standards so high, exacting, and uncompromising that only those who are dedicated practitioners are likely to find them helpful. On the other hand, he is a firm believer that if people simply practice the basic techniques recommended by the Buddha, they can be very successful and awakened meditators. He is one of the rare teachers who will talk about insight directly and answer nearly any question about Dharma practice without using code, covering things up or watering things down. Daniel is a diehard Mahasi Sayadaw fan, though he is very happy whenever he sees people trying to master any of the world's great mystical traditions and thus considers himself a pan-mystical evangelist. He is also a chronic map monger and technique freak because he has had them work very well for him. He does not claim to have any special knowledge of how to live skillfully in the conventional world, but has found that a positive attitude, non-pretentious kindness, and a sense of humor will take you a long way. If you imagine that you want to bust out some hardcore practice but are in fact just looking for a daddy, shrink, social worker, or someone to help you prop up your self-esteem, Daniel is unlikely at this stage in his development to be the best person to help you meet your needs. He considers himself to be one badass Dharma cowboy and prefers similar company, or at least those who aspire to be so. I dare, no, I double dare, any teacher to be that honest when writing their next bio. 
not that they are likely to be given enough space to disclose anything resembling this much honest and practical information. A few more things. I crossed the arising and passing away when I was about fifteen, and did it again about four more times by my recollection over the next ten years, without formal practice, technique, or guidance. I attained to stream entry at the end of the first week of my fourth retreat on January 13, 1996, in Bodh Gaya, India, in the Thai Monastery. I also crossed the arising and passing away of second path on that retreat. I attained second path in daily life while working at the National AIDS Hotline with the CDC in July 1996. I was in the break room just hanging out. I attained the third path towards the end of 1996, also in daily life, after a retreat a few weeks before I crossed the arising and passing away of that cycle. I attained to Narodi Samapati, see the appendix, one month later, but it would take me a more few years to really nail down hard Samitha Jhanas and the formless realms so that I could access them off retreat. I was an anagami for almost seven years, going through cycle after cycle of progressive appreciation of the emptiness of ordinary phenomena, with my total count of what felt like full new paths being about twenty-seven. I wrote most of this book during that time. I also earned a two-year Master's of Science in Public Health in Infectious Disease Epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, and then went on to complete medical school there. Then on April 17, 2003, on a 21-day retreat at the Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center between medical school and my residency, I attained to Arahatship. It happened while I was doing walking meditation on that glorious spring morning. I was sick of the cycles of insight and profoundly inspired by the steady and gentle invitation of the teacher, Sayadaw Upandita, Jr., to simply see through the whole thing as he had done. His calm smile seemed to say, You can do it. Come on. Any day now. Always sit with air hots if you possibly can. That's my advice, anyway. I decided that I would allow no sensation anywhere in the entire wide sense field to go by without it being clearly known as it was during every single second of the day. It was a high standard, but strangely enough can be actually very closely approximated. It was sufficient to do the trick after about a week of doing that some twenty-plus hours per day. I remember attaining to a fruition, and a few seconds later I noticed something about the entrance to it and the reforming of the sense of a perceiver on the back side of it. Then suddenly the knot of perception flipped open. Everything was the same, and yet the perspective on it was completely different. And my vipassana problem, once I had stabilized in that understanding, was solved. I had barely taught in the previous six years, as my own practice has consumed most of the scant free time I had, but a few days after seeing it I told my teacher I was thinking of teaching again. He shot me an uncharacteristically sharp glance, and said in a forceful and commanding voice, Good! I have learned all sorts of useful and interesting things since then, but seen through the center point was the essential thing. Many, many thanks to everyone and everything that made all of this possible, from the people who taught the Buddha to those who carry his knowledge forward today, from the people who cooked in the meditation centers I stayed in, to the usurious credit card companies that loaned me the money to keep going on retreats, and for everything else in this wide world that made it happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In addition to my successes, I feel very comfortable writing about the many ways that one can screw up on the spiritual path, either because I have done so myself, because one or more of my respected Dharma companions had done so, or most often for both reasons. I can't tell you how many stupid things I thought, said, and did along the way while in desperate pursuit of something that was right there all along and I continue to make countless errors when trying to spread the Dharma and live my life. The only stage, state, or attainment I write about from theory, rather than experience, is Buddhahood. There are a few practical uses for such information. It is potentially useful to disclose that I have made countless errors on the spiritual path so that this may counter the notion that I am coming from some useless holier-than-thou position and also try to counter in others the sense that they are the only ones who make numerous errors on the spiritual path. 
I hope it was not necessary. As someone wise once said, the life of a Zen master is one continuous mistake, and that goes equally for the rest of us. I feel that the most important positive result that can come from stating, I know that of which I write, is the chance that this might create the sense that extraordinary things may be understood and attained by otherwise ordinary people, such as and including myself and yourself. I've done this stuff while holding down jobs, having relationships, and pursuing graduate studies. I did it on a few weeks or months of retreat time here and there with a lot of daily practice. My total retreat time from beginning to era hotship was about eight months, with the longest sit being 27 days. The point that I'm trying to make is that these techniques and practices are powerful and effective for those who take the time to follow them. If I can convey the sense that this is true by going on and on about what I have accomplished, then doing so serves a useful function. Another possible positive outcome is the sense that might be created in some people that this is not a dead and theory-based tradition that simply rehashed the semi-mythical glory of long-dead gurus and ancient writings, but a living tradition with validity in our modern times. The last useful point that might come from someone who has quite obviously achieved nothing even close to self-perfection saying, I have strong mastery of the core teachings of the Buddha, is that it might serve to help bring the whole notion of spirituality back down to earth. I am quite willing to look ridiculous and grandiose if there is some chance of it furthering that process, though I realize that it could easily backfire. Consider carefully the differences and similarities between confidence, arrogance, and empowering others to realize that they can do it also. A word to the wise is, don't believe me or anyone else. Take the time to verify these things for yourself from your own direct experience. I could easily be fooling myself, you or both of us, on numerous points and for all sorts of reasons from innocent to evil. There certainly is a well-developed and ancient tradition of doing so. However, my attainments shouldn't matter so much to you, as the only person's understanding that will really help you is your own. My personal experiences with the psychic powers are not yet as fully developed as the more fundamental areas, but I have enough experience to be able to help all but the most advanced practitioner of them. As to scholarship... I feel that reading widely and really considering the meaning of what one reads and how it might actually be applied is a very good idea, and I have myself read around 150 Dharma books, both traditional and modern. While I have been authorized and encouraged to teach by a formal lineage, this is a mere formality and not a sure sign in anyone of real understanding or attainment, much less teaching ability. Luckily, Realizations are not dependent on conditions such as formal acceptance into a lineage. I have chosen a lucrative career path that has little to do with meditation, and this eliminates my financial dependence on the Dharma and the temptation to water things down for mass consumption or popular appeal, as is so commonly done. I have found that if I repeatedly ask those who start talking with me about Dharma practice the questions, what do you really want and why, and what would you be willing to do to get that, I usually come to the conclusion that they are not really interested in the things I am interested in, such as the things mentioned in this book, and thus I can turn the conversation to other topics and avoid wasting our time. Those few who do share some of my interests are my dear companions in what I call the Dharma Underground, and for them I am extremely grateful. But enough about me. Let me tell you about my book. I think that I have made my influences and humble opinions on a wide variety of other subjects very clear throughout this work. To be truthful, sometimes I have picked up this book and thought, Goodness gracious, what a harsh rant! What a heap of reductionist dogma, false certainty, pretentiousness, and my own neurotic stuff. I pity the poor innocent and pathologically nice, mainstream, ritualistic, disempowered Buddhists fortunate enough to have picked this thing up, simply been kicked in their soft and flabby posteriors by it to little good effect. On other days I have picked it up and thought, Wow! 
This is really the book that I wished I had read all those years ago when I decided to really go for it. It would have been so extremely helpful to have so many details about high-level practice laid out this clearly, so many myths dispelled, so much honesty about what the path is and isn't. What a joy it is that there are books that convey such enthusiastic and empowering views on these practices. Maybe there will be a few people out there who just needed a little prodding to realize their full potential as great and powerful meditators. Wouldn't it be great if I can find a way to get this book into their hands? I hope that you had something like both reactions, as I think that both points of view have some validity. Two interesting and practical questions for you are, who are you in direct experiential terms? And who is it that knows? Answer these, and you will come to know all of this directly for yourself. The first and last job of anyone who teaches meditation should be to make herself or himself redundant. This book is the best I have been able to come up with to help accomplish this, as I have tried my best to pack it with everything useful that I know. CONCLUSION AND BEST WISHES I do hope that people will not settle for becoming lost in the dogma of this work, Buddhism, or any other mystical tradition. I hope that they learn actually to do the practices that lead to freedom, and to the deep integration of that freedom into their lives. I hope that they have faith that mastery can be attained. I hope that they will learn to ask good questions that will help them to accomplish this. I hope that the culture of Buddhism and the world in general will become less sectarian instead of more. I hope that practitioners of meditation will use spiritual conceptual frameworks as tools and not worship them as sacred dogma. I hope that the huge amount of magical and fantastic thinking that accompanies spiritual traditions will immediately vanish from this planet forever. I hope that those on the path will learn to talk with each other in ways that are conducive to clear practice. I hope that any controversial points made in this book will produce skillful debate and real inquiry rather than contraction into fear and dogma. I hope that people will work toward actual mastery of the path so that they will no longer need writing such as this one. I hope that people will not spend their lives lost in content but will also delve deeply into the liberating truth of the three characteristics. I hope that the level of expectation about what is possible will be raised in a way that is helpful, and that any jealousy or frustration that results from this will be skillfully channeled into precise practice and the joy that it can be done. May all of this be for the benefit of all beings. Should you realize that you wish to awaken— know that it is within your capabilities to do so. Appendix The cessation of perception and feeling, Nairoda Samapati in Pali, is the highest of the temporary attainments. As is traditional in the commentaries, I have included it last. It is discussed in a number of places, including Sutta 44, the shorter series of questions and answers, the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, in a talk given by a female arahat named Dom Medina, and the path to deliverance by Nayana Taloka, which draws from that fine text. This attainment can neither be said to be a state or not a state, nor can it be said to be purely a concentration attainment or an insight attainment, as it lacks a basis for analysis, meaning that there is no experience that can be analyzed. The word nairoda, meaning cessation, is also sometimes used without the qualifier samapati to refer to fruition, so be careful to keep your terms straight when reading the old texts or speaking with others about these things. I always mean the cessation of perception and feeling when I use the word nairoda, but others may not. It is said that nairoda can only be attained by anagamis and arahats, those of the third and fourth path who have some mastery of the formless realms. However, as Bill Hamilton once said, if you are an agami or arahat, you are bound to run into Nairoda Samapati eventually. There are some reasons to question whether or not those of the lower stages of awakening might be able to attain this, or how the ability to attain this relates to the number of stages of awakening. However, this is not a subject that I am in a mood to pursue in detail as I have learned the hard way that such questions do not help in the end. 
if you manage to attain Nairota, I wouldn't fixate on the idea that you have attained at least third path. That said, a few months of careful work and focused intent, I was able to attain it after completing my third cycle of insight. One attains Nairota by focusing insight practices and concentration practices in a fairly gentle way that is much less focused and precise than one would do if one wanted to attain fruition. I find it easiest to attain when reclining, but the first time I attained it I was sitting. There is nothing that can really be said about this attainment, except for mentioning things about the entrance, exit, and the consequences of the attainment. One rises through the Samitha Jhanas in a very low-key fashion, with some weak awareness of their true nature, the three characteristics, enters the eighth Jhana, neither perception nor yet non-perception, and then emerges from that state. Sometime shortly thereafter, and without warning or very recent premeditation, one may suddenly enter the cessation of perception and feeling. It must be noted that previous interest in attaining this during the preceding days or weeks tends to increase the chances of this attainment showing up. As one gets better at attaining this, one can slip in the inclination, resolution, to attain it after emerging from the eighth jhana, and then forget about it before dropping in. As my dear old meditation friend Kenneth so rightly points out, between the eighth jhana and the Nairota, there are a number of states very worth mentioning, though the standard texts strangely don't for reasons I can't fathom. We have come to call them Pure Land One and Pure Land Two, as this seemed as good a thing to call them as anything, thus making a total of ten Johannes and Nairota. Both have, as their overwhelming quality, the feeling of deep gratitude in the purest and most profound sense with Pure Land 2 being a deepening and strengthening of Pure Land 1, though it is also a bit wider and more diffuse. These are remarkably healing, complete, pervasive, satisfying, and heartfelt states, and the word pure applies quite nicely. Early on I barely noticed them and would jump as fast as I could from the 8th Jahana to Nairota. Now I know better and take the time to enjoy them. They write gratitude, beauty, clarity and contentment onto the mind there is also a state somewhere in that territory that seems basically like pure presence like being a super pervading watcher with the quality of perceiving or awareness of itself being the dominant quality this has a very different quality from the sixth jhana boundless consciousness and in my opinion is far superior more fundamental and could be argued as the highest of the states that involve experience. However, the fact that states are so clear to me continue to show up that there were never described in the old text so far as I can tell brings up another important point. The territory out there past the fourth jhana, and particularly the eighth jhana, is very malleable. Kenneth and I speculated that the limits to the states attainable out there are limited by our imagination and concentration skill only, and I have imagined staging a friendly contest among high-level practitioners to dream up states that are even better than the ones I know so that we can play around with attaining them and seeing if there are any limits to the thing. The large list of all the exotic heaven realms found in the old texts adds credence to this belief. I realize this may seem like a contradiction to earlier statements I have made about being able to master concentration practices absolutely. It is. Back to describing Nairota. The texts rightly say that on the entrance to Nairota, verbal formations cease first, then bodily sensations, then the whole of mental functioning ceases when the attainment is finally entered. This is traditionally explained as correlating to the first jhana, fourth jhana, and then the entrance to Naroda, respectively. However, it may be noticed that in the three moments before cessation of perception sets in, during the complete power failure-like entrance, the verbal formations, bodily formations, and mental formations cease in that order, also in three consecutive and definable moments, with the whole thing taking about a third of a second. Thus, the text may have a double meaning, or were misinterpreted by scholars who had never attained Naroda Samapati. 
I say this because it is still typical for many bodily and verbal formations to arise between the eighth Johanna and the entrance to Naroda, and thus the traditional interpretation does not hold up. The texts also say that this attainment may last seven days or even longer, but I don't personally know of anyone who is admitted to having this happen. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but it would probably require a long and sustained retreat beforehand. The duration of such attainments will be related directly to one's concentration abilities, and these are very dependent upon local practice conditions and the amount that they have recently been exercised. Unlike fruition, one exits this attainment in the reverse of the way one came in, with mental formations arising first, quickly followed by physical and then verbal formations in the characteristic analog way of the entrance and with the same timing. After leaving this attainment, the mind tends to be deeply peaceful and very clear, and one's body tends to be very relaxed. The longer the attainment lasted, the stronger and more durable this effect will be. Thus, I would not recommend attaining this immediately before entering into situations that require high-speed decisions or actions. The texts say that one inclines to solitude or quiet after attaining this state, and in general I agree. I mention this attainment because it is one more of those things that is found today, but has often been relegated to the realm of myth and legend, or has been forgotten entirely. It is not that Naroda is necessary, but it is definitely a good and useful thing to be able to attain. In fact, I have not yet spoken with anyone who had attained it who didn't consider it among the absolute king daddy of meditation attainments other than Arahatship, as the depth of its afterglow never fails to impress and amaze. Hopefully, mentioning it will raise the standard to which people feel they can reasonably aspire, which is basically the whole goal of this book. One more little morsel for you brave adventurers. I have noticed that the easiest time to attain Naroda is usually a few weeks after attaining a path, when the Vipassana Jahana aspect of the progress of insight is becoming clear, and a nice degree of mastery has been attained in that review phrase. However, it has this nice, nasty habit of helping to precipitate a new progress cycle, as the level of clarity gained in its wake is impressive. Thus, one may go from the best highs of a review phase and Naroda's glorious afterglow to the third jnana, A and P, and Dark Knight quickly. In fact, this seems to be a very natural part of the many cycles of Anagamis who also know the Samitha jhanas and formless realms. Best of luck and practice well. Daniel End of Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha An Unusually Hard Dharma Book Written by the Arahat, Daniel M. Ingram, M.D. Narrated by Kirk Ziegler Voiceovers by Kirk.com Copyright 2008, Daniel M. Ingram